Chapter One of The Side of the Angels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The Side of the Angels by Basil King. Chapter One. The difficulty was, in the first place, one of date. Not the date of a month or a year, but of a generation or a century. Had Thorley Masterman found himself in love with Rosie Fay in 1760, or even in 1860, there would have been little to adjust and nothing to gainsay. In 1860 the Fays were still as good as the Thorleys, and almost as good as the Mastermans. Going back as far as 1760, the Fays might have been considered better than the Thorleys, had the village acknowledged standards of comparison, while there were no Mastermans at all. That is, in 1760 the Mastermans still kept their status as yeomen, clergymen and country doctors among the hills of Derbyshire, untroubled as yet by that spirit of unrest for conscience' sake which had urged the Fays and the Thorleys out of the flat farmlands of East Anglia one hundred and thirty years before. During the intervening period the flat farmlands remained only as an equalising symbol. Thorleys, Fays, Willoughbys and Brands worked for one another with the community of interests developed in a beehive, and intermarried. If from the process of intermarriage the Fays were, on the whole, excluded, the discrimination lay in some obscure instinct for affinity, of which no one at the time was able to forecast the significance. But by 1910 there was a difference. The difference apparent when out of the flat farmland's seismic explosion had thrown up a range of mountain peaks. For the expansion of the country which the middle nineteenth century had wrought, the Thorleys, Mastermans, Willoughbys and Brands had been on the alert, with eyes watchful and calculations timed. The Fays, on the other hand, had gone with the round of seed time and harvest, contented and almost somnolent, awakening to find that the ages had been giving them the chances that would never come again. It was across the wreck of those chances, and across some other obstacles besides, that Thorley Masterman, for the first time since childhood, looked into the grey-green eyes of Rosie Fay, and got the thrill of their wide-open, earnest beauty. He was then not far from thirty years of age, having studied at a great American university, in Paris, Berlin and Vienna, and obtained other sorts of knowledge of mankind. He knew Rosie Fay, in this secondary grown-up phase of their acquaintance, as the daughter of his first patient, and he had obtained his first patient through the kindly intervention of Uncle Sim. From February to November, 1910, his shingle had hung in one of the two streets of the village without attracting a patient at all. He had already begun to feel his position at trial, when his half-brother's daily jest turned it into a humiliation. "'Must be a serious matter, Thor,' Claude would say, "'to be responsible for so many valuable lives.' Mr. Leonard Willoughby, his father's partner in the old banking and broking house of Too Good and Masterman, enjoyed the same sort of chaff. "'Looking pale, Thor. Must be working too hard.' "'Never mind, Thor,' Mrs. Willoughby would encourage him. "'When I'm ill, you shall get me. But then I'm never ill.' At such minutes her daughter Lois could only smile sympathetically and talk hurriedly of something else. As he had meant since boyhood to marry Lois Willoughby, when the moment for marriage came, Thor counted this tactfulness in her favour. Nevertheless, he was puzzled. Having disregarded his future possession of money and prepared himself for a useful career with all the thoroughness he could command, nobody seemed to want him. It was not that the village was overprovided with doctors. Everyone admitted that it wasn't. Otherwise he would not have settled in his native place. The village being really a township with a scattered population, except on the Thorley estate, which was practically part of a great New England city, where there were rows of suburban streets. It was quite insufficiently served by Dr. Noonan at one end, and Dr. Hill at the other, for Uncle Sim in the old village could scarcely be said to count. No, the opening was good enough. The trouble lay, apparently, in Thorley Masterman himself. Making all allowances for the fact that a young physician must wait patiently, and win his position by good degrees, he had reason to feel chagrined. 
he grew ashamed to pass the little house in the old village which he had fitted up as an office. He grew ashamed to go out in his runabout. The runabout had been worse than an extravagance, since, on the ground that it would take him to his patients the more quickly, he had felt justified in borrowing its price. The most useful purpose it served now was to bring Mr. Willoughby home from town when unfit to come by himself. Otherwise its owner hated taking it out of the garage, especially if Claude were in sight. Claude had envied him the runabout at first, but soon found a way to work his feeling off. "'Anybody dying, old chap?' he would ask with a curl of his handsome lip. "'Hope you'll get to him in time.' It was while in the runabout, however, in the early part of a November afternoon, that the young doctor met his Uncle Sim. "'Hello, Thor,' the latter called. "'Where are you off to?' was looking for you. Thor brought the machine to a standstill. Uncle Sim threw a long, thin leg over his mare's back and was on the ground. Wah, dear, dear, wah, good old girl. He liked to believe that the tall bay was spirited. Standing beside Thor's runabout, he held the reins loosely in his left hand, while the right arm was thrown caressingly over Delia's neck. The outward and visible sign of his eccentricity was in his difference from everyone else. In a community, one might say a country, in which each man did his utmost to look like every other man, the fact that Simeon Masterman was willing to look like no one but himself was sufficient to prove him, in the language of his neighbours, a little off. It was sometimes said that he suggested Don Quixote. He was so tall, so gaunt, and so eager-eyed, and, except that there was no melancholy in his face, Perhaps he did. "'Got a job for you.' The old man's voice was nasal and harsh, without being disagreeable. Grown sensitive, Thor was on his guard. "'Not one of your gods that are given away with a pound of tea,' he said suspiciously. "'I don't know about that pound of tea, but it's given away. Giving it away because I can't deal with it myself. Call for someone with more ingenuity, so I've told him about you.' Thor laughed. "'Don't wonder you're willing to give it up, Uncle Sim. "'You'll wonder still less when you've seen the patient. "'By the way, it's Fay's wife. "'Remember old Fay, don't you?' "'The young man nodded. He "'Used to be Grandpa Thorley's gardener. "'Has the greenhouses on Father's land north of the pond. "'Some sort of row going on between him and Father now. "'What's she got? "'It's not what she's got, poor woman. "'It's what she hasn't got. "'That's what's the matter with her.' "'I'm afraid it's a variety of symptom I've never heard of.' "'No, but you'll hear of it soon. "'Whoa, Delia, steady, good girl. "'If you can treat it, you'll be the most distinguished specialist in the country. "'Whoa, Delia, I'm giving you the chance to begin.' "'Thor wondered what was at the back of the old fellow's mind. "'There was generally something in what he had to say, if you could think it out. "'Since you've diagnosed the case, Uncle Sim,' he began craftily, "'Can't I give you a tip for the treatment? "'No, I can't, and it wouldn't do any good if I did, "'cause she won't take my medicine.' "'Perhaps I could make her.' "'The old man laughed harshly. "'You? That's good. "'Why, you'd be the first to make game of it yourself.' "'He had his left foot in the stirrup "'and his right leg over Dida's back "'before Thor could formulate another question. "'As, with head thrown back, "'he continued his amused chuckling, "'there was about him, in spite of his sixty years, a something irresponsible and debonair that would have pleased Franz Hals or Simon de Vos. Within ten minutes, Thor was knocking at the door of a small house with a mansard roof, situated in what had once been the apple orchard of a farm. All but a sparse half-dozen of the trees had given place to lines of hothouses, through the glass of which he could see oblongs of vivid green. He was so preoccupied with the fact of paying his first visit to his first patient as scarcely to notice that the girl who opened the door was pretty. He almost ignored her. Uh, "'How do you do, Miss Fay? I'm Dr. Thorley Masterman. I believe your mother would like to see me. May I go to her at once?' He was in the narrow hallway and at the foot of the stairs when she said, "'You can go right up, but perhaps I ought to tell you that she's not... well, she's not very sick.' He looked at her inquiringly, getting the first faint impression of her beauty. Uh, "'What's the matter, then?' "'That's what we don't know.' After a second's hesitation, she added, "'Perhaps it's melancholy.' Another second passed before she said, 
We've had a good deal of trouble. The tone touched him. Her way of holding her head, rather meekly, rather proudly, sufficiently averted to give him the curve of the cheek, touched him too. What kind of trouble? Oh, every kind. But she'll tell you about it herself. It's all she'll talk about. That's why we can't do anything for her. And I don't believe you can. I'd better see. Following her directions given from the foot of the stairs, he entered a barely furnished bedroom of which two sides lead inward to correspond to the mansard grading of the roof. One window looked out on the greenhouses, another towards Thorley's pond. Beside the former, in a high upholstered armchair, sat a tall woman, fully dressed in black, with a patchwork quilt of many colours across her knees. In spite of grey hair slightly dishevelled and wild grey eyes, she was a handsome woman who on a larger scale made him think of the girl downstairs. Uh, "'How do you do, Mrs. Fay?' he began, feeling the burden of the situation to be on himself. "'I'm Dr. Thor—' "'I know who you are,' the woman said ungraciously. "'If you hadn't been a masterman, I shouldn't have sent for you.' He took a small chair, drawing it up beside her. "'I know you've been treated by my Uncle Sim. "'He's a fool. "'Tries to heal a broken heart by feeding it on rainbows.' Thor smiled. "'That's like him. "'And yet rainbows have been known to heal a broken heart before now. "'They won't heal mine. "'What I want is done on the solid earth.' There was a kind of desperate pleading in her face as she added, "'Why can't I have it?' "'That depends on what it is. "'If it's health, it's better than health.' He smiled. "'I've always heard that health is pretty good as things go. "'It's good enough. "'But there's something better, and that's patience. "'If you've got patience, you can do without health.' "'I don't think you're much in need of a doctor, Mrs. Fay,' he laughed. "'I am,' she declared savagely. "'I am, because I ain't got either of them. "'and if I had, I'd give them both for something else.' "'She held him with her wild grey eyes as she said, "'I'd give them both for money. "'Money's better than patience and better than health. "'If I had money, I shouldn't care how sick I was or how unhappy. "'If I had money, my son wouldn't be in jail.' "'Though startled, he knew that, like a confessor, "'he must show no sign of surprise. "'He remembered now that there had been a boy in the Fay family two or three years younger than himself.' "'I didn't know,' he began sympathetically. "'You didn't know, because we're not even talked about. "'If your brother was in jail for stealing money, "'it's the first thing the town would tattle of. "'But you've been back from your travels for a year or more, "'and you ain't even heard that our Matt is doing three years at Colcord. "'But you'd rather people didn't hear it, wouldn't you?' "'I'd rather that they'd care whether I'm alive or dead,' she said fiercely. "'I've lived all my life in this village and my ancestors before me, Faith family has done the same, but we're pushed aside and forgotten. It's as much as ever if someone will tell you that Jasper Fay raises lettuce in the winter and cucumbers in spring and a few flowers all the year round and can't pay his rent. I don't believe you've heard that much, have you? He dodged the subject by asking the usual professional questions and giving some elementary professional advice. I'm afraid, Mrs. Fay, you're taking a discouraged view of life, he went on, by way of doing his duty. She sat still more erect in her armchair, her eyes flashing. "'If you'd seen yourself driven to the wall for more than thirty year, and if when you got to the wall you were crushed against it, and crushed again, wouldn't you take a discouraged view of life? I've lived on bread and water, or pretty near it, ever since I was married, and what's come of it? We're worse off than we ever were. Bay's put everything he could scrape together into this bit of land, and now your father is shilly-shallying again about renewing the lease.' "'Oh, so that's it.' "'That's it, but it's only some of it. "'Look out there. "'All Fay's sweat and blood and all of mine is in those greenhouses and that ground. "'It's everything we've got to live on, and God knows what kind of a living it is. "'Your father has never given us more than a three years' lease, "'and every three years he's raised the rent on us. "'He's had us in his power from the first. "'Oh, he's crafty, getting us to rent the land from him instead of buying it, "'and Fay that soft that he believed him to be his friend. "'He's had us in his power from the first, and he's never spared us. "'No wonder he's rich.' "'and you're coming in for that Thorley money, too. "'I know what your grandfather Thorley's will was. "'Going to get it when you're thirty. "'Must be pretty nigh on that now, ain't you?' "'To humour her, Thor named the date in the following February, "'when he should reach the age fixed by his grandfather "'for entering on the inheritance. "'What did I tell you? "'I remember your grandfather as plain as plain. 
big, hard-faced man he was, something like you. My folks could remember him when he hawked garden trucks to back doors in the city. Nothing but a farmer's son he was, just like the rest of us, and he died rich. Only difference between the Thorleys and the Fays was that the Thorleys held on to their land and the Fays didn't. Neither did my folks, the Grimeses. If we'd been crafty and hadn't sold till the city was creeping down our chimneys, like the Thorleys and the Brands, we should be as rich as them. Cut your father out of his will, good and hard, your grandfather did, and now it's all come to you. Why, there was a time when the Thorleys hired out to my folks, and so did the Willoughbys, and now— She threw the quilt from off her knees and spread her hands outward. Oh, I'm sick of it! I've spent my life watching everyone else go up and me and mine go down, and I'm sick of it! I'm not sick any other way. No, I don't think you are, he said gently. Well, that's bad enough, isn't it? If I had a fever or a cold, you could give me something to take it away. But what can you do for the state of mind I'm in? He answered slowly. I can't do much just yet, though I can do a little. But uh, by and by, perhaps, when I know more exactly what the trouble is. You can't know it better than I can tell you now. It's just this. That's how I have all I can do to keep from stealing down to Thorley's Pond, when no one's looking, and throwing myself in. What do you think of that? I think you won't do it, he smiled, but I wouldn't play with the idea if I were you. Look here, she cried, seizing him by the arm and pulling him out of his chair. Look out of that window. He followed the pointing of her finger to a high bluff covered with oaks, to which the withered brown foliage still clung, though other trees were bare. That's Duck Rock. "'Well, there's a spot there where the water's thirty foot deep. "'What do you think of that?' "'He moved back from the window, but remained standing. "'I think that it doesn't matter to you and me "'whether it's thirty foot deep, or sixty, or a hundred. "'It matters to me. "'In thirty foot of water I'd go down like a stone, "'and then it'd be all over. "'After that, nothing but sleep.' "'Her eyes held him again. "'You don't believe there'll be anything after it but sleep, do you?' "'He dodged that question, too.' "'But uh, you do. "'I was brought up an orthodox congregational, but what's the good? "'All I've ever got out of it was rainbows, and what I've wanted is solid. "'I've wanted to do something, and be something, and have something, "'and not be pushed back and trampled out of sight "'by people who used to hire out to my folks "'and could treat me like dirt today just because they've got the money. "'Why haven't I got it, too? "'I'm fit for it. I had good schooling. "'Louisa Thorley, your own mother, that is, and me, went to school together.' Your father ran away with her, and she died when you were born. We went to school to old Mrs. Brand, aunt to Bessie Brand, that's now Bessie Willoughby, and holds her head so high. Poor as church mice there was in those days. But then everyone was poor. We was all poor together, and happy. And I was some are poor, and some are rich, and there's upper classes and lower classes, and everything's got uneven, and I'm sick of it. To calm her excitement, he talked to her with the inspiration of young earnestness, getting his reward in an attention accorded perhaps for the very reason that the earnestness was young. "'I think I must run off now,' he finished, when he thought her slightly comforted. "'But I'll send you something I want you to take at once. You'll take a tablespoonful and half a glass of water.' The rebellious spirit revived, though less bitterly. "'And it'll do me as much good as a dose of your uncle's rainbows.' "'What I want is what I shall never get, or sleep.' "'Well, you'll get sleep,' he said, smiling and holding out his hand. "'You'll sleep to-night, and I'll come again to-morrow.' He was at the door when she called out. "'Do you know what our Matt got his three years for?' "'It was for stealing money from Massey's grocery store, where he was bookkeeper. "'And do you know what made him steal it? "'It was to help us pay the rent the last time your father raised it. "'I'll bet he's done worse than that twenty times a year.' but he's driving round in automobiles while my poor boy's in Colcord. End of chapter 1and the house was cheerless. He could imagine that to an ambitious woman circumscribed by its dreary deepness, Duck Rock, with its thirty feet of water, might be a welcome change. Continuing his search when he went outside, 
he gazed round what was left of the old orchard. He remembered Fay, a slim fellow with a gentle, dreamy face and starry eyes. He had seen him occasionally during the past eighteen years, though rarely. As a matter of fact, Fay's greenhouses lay on that part of the shore of Thorley's Pond most out of the way of the pedestrian. Only of late had new roads wormed themselves up the steep northern bank of the pond, bringing from the city well-to-do, country-loving souls who desired space and sunshine. It was a satisfaction to Thor's father, Archie Masterman, that only the best type of suburban residence was going up among these sylvan glades, and that the property was justifying his foresight as an investor. The young man could understand that it should be so, for the spot was picturesque. Sheltered from the north by a range of wooded hills, it was like a great green cup held out to the sunshine. The region was favourable, therefore, to the raising of early garden truck. Whenever the frost was out of the ground, oblongs of green things growing in straight lines gave a special freshness to the landscape, while from any of the knolls over which the township clambered, clusters of greenhouses glinted like distant sheets of water. One had to get them in contrast to the sparkling blue eye of Thorley's Pond to perceive that they were not tiny lakes. With so pleasing a view, hemmed in by the haze of the city towards the south, and a hint of the Atlantic south of that, there was every reason why Fay's plot of land should appreciate in value. On these grounds, it became comprehensible to Thor that his father might raise the rent and still not be an instrument of oppression. It was concerning to him to perceive this. It helped to allay certain uncomfortable suspicions that had risen in his mind since coming home, and which were not easy to dispel. He caught sight at last of Rose's dull green frock in the one hot house in which there were flowers. Through the glass roof he could see the red discs of poinsettias and the crimson or white of azaleas coming into bloom. The other two houses sheltered long, level rectangles of tender green, representing lettuce in different stages of the crop. A bow-legged Italian was closing the skylights that had been opened for the milder part of the day. Another Italian replaced the covers on hot beds that might have contained violets. From the high furnace chimney a plume of yellow-brown smoke floated heavily on the windless air. The place looked undermanned and forlorn. On opening the door he was met by the sweet, warm odour of damp earth and green things growing and blossoming. Pausing in her work, the girl looked down the half-length of the greenhouse as a hint for him to advance. He went toward her between feathery banks of grey-green carnations, on which the long, oval, compact buds were loosening their sheaths to display the dawn-pink within. Half covered up by a coarse apron or pinafore, she stood at a high table, like a counter, against a background of poinsettias. "'We don't go in for flowers, really,' she explained to him, after he had given her certain directions concerning her mother. "'It would be better if we didn't try to raise them at all.' Thor, whose ear was sensitive, noticed that her voice was pleasant to listen to, and her speech marked by a simple, unaffected refinement. He lingered because he was interested in her work. He found a kind of fascination in watching her as she took a moist red flower-pot from one end of the table, threw in a handful or two of earth from the heap at the other end, and then a root that looked like a cluster of yellow crescent-shaped onions, then a little more earth, after which she turned to place the flower-pot as one of the row on the floor behind her. There was something rhythmic in her movements. Each detail took the same amount of action and time. She might have been working to music. Her left hand made precisely the same gesture with each flower-pot she took from the line in which they lay telescoped together. Her right hand described the same graceful curve with every impatient, petulant handful of earth. "'Why do you raise them, then?' he asked, for the sake of saying something. She answered wearily, "'Oh, it's father. He can't make up his mind what to do. Or rather, he makes up his mind both ways at once.' Because some people make a good thing out of raising flowers, he thinks he'll do that. And because others do a big business in garden stuff, he thinks he'll do that. And so he falls between two stools. I see. It's no use being a market gardener, she went on, disdainfully tossing the earth into another pot, unless you're a big market gardener. And it's no use being a florist unless you're a big florist. Everything has to be big nowadays to make it pay. And the trouble with father is he does so many things small. He sees big, 
she analysed, continuing her work, so big that he goes all to pieces when he tries to carry his ideas out. And you think that if he concentrated his forces on raising garden stuff... She explained further. People had to have lettuce and radishes and carrots and cucumbers, whatever happened, whereas flowers were a luxury. Whenever money was scarce, they didn't buy them. If it were not for weddings and funerals and Christmas and Easter, they wouldn't buy them at all. Then, too, they were expensive to raise, and difficult. You couldn't do it by casting a little seed into the ground. Every azalea was imported from Belgium, every lily bulb from Japan. True, the carnations were grown from slips, but Vienna knew the trouble they gave. Those at which he was looking, and which had the innocent air of a springing and blooming of their own accord, had been through no less than four tedious processes since the slips were taken in the preceding February. First they had been planted in sand for the root to strike, then transferred to flats or shallow wooden boxes, then bedded out in the garden, and lastly brought into the house. If you would only consider the labour involved in all that, to say nothing of the incessant watching and watering and keeping the house at the proper temperature by night and by day, well, he could see for himself. He did see for himself. He said so absently because he was noting the fact that her serious, earnest eyes were of the peculiar shade which, when seen in eyes, is called green. It was still absently that he added, "'And you have to work pretty hard.' She shrugged her shoulders. "'Oh, I don't mind that. Anything to live.' "'What are you doing there?' There was an exasperated note in her voice as she replied, "'Oh, these are the Easter lilies. We have to begin on them now.' "'And do you do them all?' "'I do when there's no one else. Father's men keep leaving.' She flung him a look he would have thought defiant if he hadn't found it frank. "'I don't blame them. Half the time they're not paid.' "'I see. So that you fill in. Do you like it? "'Would you like doing what isn't of any use? What will never be of any use? "'Would you like to be always running as hard as you can, just to fall out of the race?' He tried to smile. "'I shouldn't like it for long.' "'Well, there's that,' she said, as though he had suggested a form of consolation. "'It won't be for long. It can't be. Father won't be able to go on like this.' He decided to take the bull by the horns. "'Is that because my father doesn't want to renew the lease?' She shrugged her shoulders again. "'Oh, no, not particularly. It's that, and everything else.' He felt it the part of tact to make signs of going, uttering a few parting injunctions with regard to the mother as he did so. "'And I wouldn't leave her too much alone,' he advised. "'She could easily slip out without attracting anyone's attention. "'Tell your father I said so. "'I suppose he's not in the house?' "'He's off somewhere trying to engage a night fireman.' "'He ignored this information to emphasise his counsels. "'It's most important that while she's in this state of mind "'someone should be with her, "'and if we knew of anything she'd specially like.' "'She continued to work industriously. "'The thing she'd like best in this world "'won't do her any good when it happens.' "'She threw in a barb with impetuous vehemence. "'It's to have Matt out of jail. "'He'll be out in a course of a few months, "'but he'll be a... "'Jailbird. We must try to help him live that down.' She turned her great greenish eyes on him again, with that look which struck him as both frank and pitiful. "'That's one of the things people in our position can't do. It's the first thing Mother herself will think of when she sees Matt hanging about the house, for he'll never get a job. "'He can help your father. He can be the night farman.' She shrugged her shoulders with the fatalistic movement he was beginning to recognise. "'Father won't need a night fireman by that time.' He could only say, "'All the same, your mother must be watched. She can't be allowed to throw herself from Dark Rock now, can she?' "'I don't say aloud, but if she did, well, what then? She'd be out of it. That would be something. Admitting that it would be something for her, what would it be for your father and you?' She relaxed the energy of her hands. He had time to notice them. It hurt him to see anything so shapely coarsened with hard work. "'Wouldn't it be that much?' she asked, as if reaching a conclusion. "'If she were out of it, it would be a gain all round.' Never having heard a human being speak like this, he was shocked. "'But everything can't be so black. There must be something somewhere.' 
She glanced up at him obliquely. Months afterward he recalled the look. Her tone, when she spoke, seemed to be throwing him a challenge as well as making an admission. Well, there is one thing. He spoke triumphantly. Ah, there is one thing, then. Yes, but it may not happen. Well, lots of things may not happen. We just have to hope they will. That's all we've got to live by. There was a lovely solemnity about her. And even if it did happen, so many people would be opposed to it that I'm not sure it would do any good after all. Oh, but we won't think of the people who would be opposed to it. We should have to, because... The sweet fixity of her gaze gave him an odd thrill. Because you'd be the one. He laughed as he held out his hand to say good-bye. Don't be too sure. In any case, it won't matter about me. She declined to take his hand on the ground that her own was soiled with loam. But she mystified him slightly when she said, It will matter about you. And if the thing ever happens, I want you to remember that I told you so. I can't play fair, but I play as fair as I can. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 3 Thor was deaf to these enigmatic words in the excitement of perceiving that the girl had beauty. The discovery gave him a new sort of pleasure as he turned his runabout toward the town. Beauty had not hitherto been a condition to which he attached great value. If anything, he had held it in some scorn. Now, for the first time in his emotional life, he was stirred by a girl's mere prettiness, a quite unusual prettiness, it had to be admitted, a slightly haggard prettiness, perhaps, a prettiness a little warm by work, a little coarsened by wind and weather, a prettiness too desperate for youth and too tragic for coquetry, but for those very reasons doubtless all the more haunting. He was obliged to remind himself that it was nothing to him, since he had never swerved from the intention to marry Lois Willoughby as soon as he made a start in practice and come into the money he was to get at thirty. But he could see it was the sort of thing by which other men might be affected, and came to a mental standstill there. Driving on to the city, he went straight to his father's office in Commonwealth Row. It was already after four o'clock, and except for two young men sorting cheques and putting away ledgers, the cage-like divisions of the banking department were empty. One of the men was whistling. The other was calling in a loud, gay voice, "'Say, Cheever, what about tonight?' Signs that the enforced decorum of the day was past. Claude was in the outer office reserved for customers. He wore his overcoat, hat and gloves. A stick hung from his left arm by its crooked handle. The ticker was silent, but a portion of the tape fluttered between his gloved fingers. Though his back was toward the door, he recognised his half-brother's step with that mixture of envy and irritation which Thor's presence always stirred in him. He was not without fraternal affection, especially when Thor was away. When he was at home, it was difficult for Claude not to resent the elder's superiority. Claude called it superiority for want of a better word, though he meant no more than a combination of advantages he himself would have enjoyed. He meant Thor's prospective money, his good spirits, his good temper, and good health. Claude had not good health, which excused, in his judgment, his lack of good spirits and good temper. Neither had Claude any money beyond the fifteen hundred dollars a year he earned in his father's office. He was in the habit of saying to himself, and in confidence to his friends, that it was damned hard luck that he should be compelled to live on a pittance like that, when Thor, within a few months, would come into a good thirty thousand a year. It was some consolation that Thor was what his brother called an ugly beast, sallow and lantern-jawed, with a long, narrow head that looked as if it had been sat on. The eyes were not bad, that had to be admitted, they were as friendly as a welcoming light. But the mouth was so big and aggressive that even the moustache Thor was trying to grow couldn't subdue its boldness. As for the nose and chin, they looked, according to Claude's account, as if they had been created soft and subjected to a system of grotesque elongation before hardening. Claude 
could the more safely make a game of his brother's looks, seeing that he himself was notably handsome, with traits as regular as if they had been carved, and a profile so exact that it was frequently exposed in photographers' windows, to the envy of gentlemen gazers. While Thor had once tried to mitigate his features by a beard that had been unsuccessful and had now disappeared, Claude wouldn't disfigure himself by a hair. He was as clean-shaven as a marble Apollo, and not less neatly limbed. "'Gone!' Claude raised his eyes just long enough to utter the world. Thor came to an abrupt stop. "'Club?' "'Suppose so,' he added, without raising his head. "'Wish to God the drunken sort would stay there!' He continued, while still apparently reading the tape in his hand. "'Father wishes it, too.' Thor was not altogether taken by surprise. Ever since his return from Europe, a year earlier, he had wondered how his father's patience could hold out. He took it that there was a reason for it, a reason he had once expressed to Claude. "'Father can't wish it. He can't afford to.' Claude lifted his handsome, rather insolent face. "'Why not?' "'For the simple reason that he's got his money.' "'Much you know about it. Lim Willoughby hasn't enough money left in two good amassments to take him on a trip to Europe.' Thor backed towards the receiving teller's wicket, where he rested the tips of his elbows on the counter. He was visibly perturbed. "'What's become of it, then?' "'Don't ask me. All I know is what I'm telling you.' "'Did father say so himself?' "'Not in so many words, but I know it.' He tossed the tape from him and began to smooth his gloves. "'Father means to ship him.' "'Ship him? He can't do that.' "'Can't. I should like to know why not.' "'Because he can't, that's why. Because he has—' "'Yes, cough it up. Speak if you have something up your sleeve.' Thor reflected as to the wisdom of saying more. "'Well, I have,' he admitted. "'It's something I remember from the time we were kids. You were too young to notice. But I noticed, and I haven't forgotten. Father can't ship Lem Willoughby without being sure he has enough to live on.' He decided to speak out, if for no other reason than that of securing Claude's cooperation. Father persuaded Mr. Willoughby to put Mrs. Willoughby's money into the business when he didn't want to. "'Ah, oh, shucks!' Claude exclaimed contemptuously. "'He did,' Thor insisted. "'It was back in 1892, in Paris, that first time they took us abroad. You were only nine, and I was twelve. I heard them. I was hanging round one evening in that little hotel we stayed at in the Rue de Rivoli. The Hotel du Massin, wasn't it?' The Willoughbys had been living in Paris for five or six years, and father got them to come home. I heard him ask mother to talk it up with Mrs. Willoughby. Mother said she didn't want to, but father got round to her, and she agreed to try. She said, too, that Bessie might be willing, because Len had already begun to take too much, and it would brace him up if he got work to do. Work? Claude sniffed. Him? Father knew he couldn't work, knew he'd tried all sorts of things. First to be an artist, then to write, then to get into the consular service, and the Lord knows what. It wasn't his work that father was after. It was just when the Toogood estate withdrew old Mr. Toogood's money, and father had to have more capital. Well, Len Willoughby didn't have any. No, but his wife had. It came to the same thing. Suppose she must have had between three and four hundred thousand from old man Brand. I remember hearing father say to mother that Lem was making ducks and drakes of it as fast as he could, and that it might as well help the firm of too good a masterman as to go to the deuce. I can still hear father feeding the poor fool with bluff about the great banker he'd make, and how it was the dead loss of a fortune that he hadn't had a seat on the stock exchange years before. Claude sniffed again. You'd better carry your load to father himself. I will if I have to. Before Claude had found a rejoinder, Thor went on, changed the subject abruptly, so as not to be led into being indiscreet. "'Say, Claude, do you remember Fay, the gardener?' Claude was still smoothing his gloves, but he stopped, with the thumb and fingers of his right hand grasping the middle finger of the left. More than ever his features suggested a marble stoniness. "'No.' "'Oh, but you must. You used to be Grandpa Thorley's gardener. Has the greenhouses on father's land, north of the pond?' Claude recovered himself slightly. "'Well, what about him?' "'Been to see his wife, patient of Uncle Sims. Turned her on to me. They're having the deuce of a time.' Claude recovered himself still more. He looked at his brother curiously. 
"'Well, what's it got to do with me?' "'Nothing directly.' "'Well, then, indirectly?' Claude asked defiantly. "'Only this, that it has to do with both of us, since it concerns father.' Claude was by this time master of himself. "'Look here, Thor. Are you getting a bee in your bonnet about father?' Oh, "'Good Lord, no. But father's immersed in business. He can't be expected to know how all the details of his policy work out. He's not young any longer, and he isn't in touch with modern social and economic ideas.' "'Oh, stow the modern social and economic ideas, and let's get to business. "'What's up with this family of... what do you call them?' "'With his feet planted firmly apart, "'Claude swung his stick airily back and forth across the front of his person, "'though he listened with apparent attention. "'You know, Thor, as a matter of fact,' he explained, "'when the latter had finished his account, "'that the kindest thing Father can do for Fay is to let him peter out.' Fay thinks that farther than the least are the obstacles he's up against, when in reality it's the whole thing. Oh, so you do know about it? Claude saw his mistake and righted himself quickly. Yes, now that you, that you speak of it, I, I do it. It comes back to me. I've heard father mention it. And what did father say? Just what I'm telling you. That the lease isn't the chief factor in Fay's troubles. It isn't really a factor at all. Poor old fellow's a dunderhead. That's where it is, in a nutshell. Never could make a living. Never will. Remember him? Vaguely. I haven't seen him for years. Well, when you do see him, you'll understand. Nice old chap has ever lived. Only impractical, dreamy. Gentle as a sheep, and no more capable of running that big, expensive plant than a motherly old ewe. That's where the trouble is. When father's closed down on him and edged him out, quietly, you understand, it'll be the best thing that ever happened to them all. Thor reflected. I see that you know more about it than you thought. You know all about it. Again, Claude caught himself up, shifting his position adroitly. Oh, no, I don't. I'm just what I've heard father say. When you spoke of it at first, the, the name slipped my memory. Thor reverted to the original theme. The son's in jail. Did you know that? But Claude was again on his guard. Oh, so there's a son? A son about your age. Matt, his name is. Surely you must recall him. He used to pick peas with us when Fade let us do it. Claude shook his head silently. And there's a girl. Claude's stick hung limply before him. His face and figure resumed their stony immobility. Oh, is there? Plain? No, pretty. Very pretty. Very unusually pretty. Come to think of it, I wouldn't mind saying. Yes, I will say it. She's the prettiest girl I've ever seen. The eyes of the two brothers met. Bar none. A smile on Claude's lips might have passed for an expression of brotherly chaff. Go it, old chap. Seem smitten. Uh, it isn't that. Nothing of the sort at all. I speak of her only because I'm sorry for her. Brunt of whole things come on her. Well, what do you propose that we should do? I haven't got as far as proposing. I haven't thought the thing out at all. But I think we ought to do something, you and I. We can't do anything without father, and father won't. He simply won't. They'll have to go. Good things, too, that's what I say. Get them all on a basis on which they can manage. They'll find a job with one of the other growers. Yes, but what's to become of the girl? Claude stared with a kind of bravado. How the devil do I know? She'll do the best she can, I suppose. Go into a shop. Lots of girls go into shops. Thor studied his brother with mild curiosity. You're a queer fellow, Claude. A minute ago you couldn't remember Fay's name, and now you've got his whole business at your fingers' ends. But Claude repeated his explanation. Got father's business at my fingers' ends, if that's what you mean. In such big affairs, chap like Fay, only a detail. Couldn't recall him at first, but once I caught on to him. By moving away toward the inner office where Chuva was still at work, Claude intimated that, as far as he was concerned, the conversation was ended. Thor returned to his runabout. "'Say, Claude,' Cheeva called, "'coming to see the champion tonight, ain't you? "'Counting on you!' Claude laid a friendly hand on Cheeva's arm. He liked to be on easy terms with his father's clerks. "'Awfully sorry, Billy, but you must excuse me. "'Fact is, that damn fool brother of mine "'has been putting his finger in my pie. "'Got to do something to get it out, and do it quick. "'Awfully sorry. Shan't be free.'" End of chapter 3
Chapter Four of *The Side of the Angels* by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Four. Beside his favourite window at the club, commanding the movement of the street and the bare trees of the park, Len Willoughby had got together the essentials to a pleasant hour. They consisted of the French and English illustrated papers, two or three excellent Havanas, a bottle of Scotch whisky and a siphon of aerated water. On the table beside him there was also an empty glass that had contained a cocktail. It was the consoling moment of the day. After the strain of a nine o'clock breakfast and the rush to the city before eleven, after the hours of purposeless hanging about the office of too good a masterman where he could see he wasn't wanted, he found it restful to retire into his own corner and sink drowsily into his cups. He did sink into them drowsily, and yet through well-marked phases of excitement. He knew those phases now. He could tell in advance how each stage would pass into another. There was, first, the comfort of the big chair and the friendly covers of L'Illustration and the graphic. He didn't care to talk. He liked to be left alone. When he came from the office, he was generally dispirited. Masterman's queer, contemptuous manner was enough to discourage anyone. He was sure, too, that Claude and Billy Cheever ridiculed his big, fat figure behind his back. But once he sank into the deep, red-leather armchair, he was safe. It was ridiculous that a man of his age should come to recognise the advantages of such a refuge, but he laid it to the charge of a mean and spiteful world. The world did not cease to be mean and spiteful till after he had had his cocktail. It was wonderful the change that took place then, not suddenly, but with a sweet, slow, cheering inner transformation. It was a, a surging, a glowing, a mellowing. It was like the readjustment of the eyes of the soul. It was seeing the world as generous, kindly. It was growing generous and kindly himself, with a happy conviction that more remained to be got out of life than he had ever wrung from it. Still, it was something to be a rich banker. Everyone couldn't be that. Archie Masterman had certainly possessed a quick eye when he singled out Len Willoughby as the man who could put the firm of too good a Masterman on its feet. Three hundred thousand dollars of Bessie's money had gone into the business in 1892, just in time to profit by the panic of 1893. Lord, how they had bought! Gilt-edged stocks for next for nothing! And how they had sold a few years later! Len never knew how much money they made. He supposed Archie didn't either. There were years when the stock exchange had been like a wheat field, yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold for every seed they had sown. He had never attempted to keep a tally on what came in. It was sufficient to know that there was always plenty to take out. Besides, it had been an understanding from the first that Archie was to do the drudgery. Len liked this, because it left him free. Free for summers in Europe, and winters in Egypt, or at Palm Beach. By degrees, reminiscence tended towards somnolence. And yet it couldn't be said that Len slept. He kept sufficiently awake to put out his hand from time to time and seize the tumbler. He could even brew himself another glass. If a brother clubman strolled near enough to say, "'Hello, Len,' or "'Hello, Willoughby,' he could respond with a dull, "'Hello, Tom,' or "'Hello, Jones,' but he spoke as out of a depth. He spoke with some of that weariness of being called back to life, which Rembrandt depicts on the face of Lazarus rising from the tomb. It was delicious to sink away from the prosaic and the balsam, to be so fully awake that he could follow the movement in the street and the hopping of the sparrows in the trees, and yet be, as it were, removed, enchanted, seeing and hearing and thinking and even drinking through the medium of a soothing, slumberous spell. It could hardly ever be said that he went beyond this point. Though there were occasions on which he miscalculated his efforts, they could generally be explained as accidental. Above all, they didn't rise from an appetite for drink. The phrase was one he was fond of. He often used it in condemning a vice of which he disapproved. He used it on this particular afternoon, when Thor Masterman, who had come to drive him homeward in his runabout, was sitting in the opposite armchair, waiting to make the start. "'There's one thing about me, Thor. "'Never had an appetite for drink. "'Not to say drink, thing I despise. 
The father's all wrong about me. Don't know what's got into him. Thinks I take too much. Rot. That's what it is. Bally rot. You know that, Thor, don't you? Appetite for drink, something I despise. Thor considered the moment one to be made use of. Has father been saying anything about it? No, but he looks it. Suppose I don't know what he means. Sees double your father does. Anybody think from the way he treats me that I was a disgrace to the firm. I'd like to know what that firm would be without me. Thor tried to frame his next question discreetly. I hope there's no suggestion of the firm's doing without you, Mr. Willoughby. To this Len gave but an indirect reply. There'll be one soon, if your father doesn't mind himself. I'll retire and take my money out. Where'll he be then? Thor felt his way. You've taken out a good deal already, haven't you? Not any more than belong to me. You can bet your boots on that. No, not any more than belong to you, of course. I was only thinking that, with the splendid house you've built, and its upkeep, and your general expenses, which are pretty heavy, aren't they? Not any more than belong to me, Thor. You can bet your boots on that. The repetition was made drowsily. The big head of bushy white hair, with its correlative of bushy white beard, swayed with a slow movement that ended in a jerk. It was obvious that the warnings and admonitions to which Thor had been leading up were not for that day. They were useless, even when, a half-hour later, the movement of the runabout and the keen air of the highlands as they approached the village roused the big creature to a maudlin cursing of his luck. On nearing the house, the delicate part of the task which of late Thor had taken almost daily on himself became imminent. It was to get his charge into the house, up to his room, and stretched on a couch, without having been seen by Lois. Thor had once caught her carrying out this duty unaided. She had evidently called for her father in her mother's limousine, and as Thor passed down the village street, she was helping the staggering, ungainly figure toward the door. The next day, Thor took his runabout from the garage and went on the errand himself. He was also more ingenious than she in finding a way by which the sorry object could be smuggled indoors. The carriage entrance of the house was too near the street. That it should be so was a trial to Mrs. Willoughby, who would have preferred a house standing in grounds, but there never had been any help for it. When money came in, it had been Len's desire to buy back a portion of the old Willoughby farm and build a mansion on what might reasonably be called his ancestral estate. Of this property there was nothing in the market but a snip along County Street, and though he was satisfied with the sight as enabling him to display his prosperity to everyone who passed up and down, his wife regretted the absence of a dignified approach. By avoiding County Street when he came out from town, and following a road that scrambled over the low hillside till it made a juncture with Willoughby's Lane, by descending that ancient cow-path and bringing Len to the privacy of his side-door, Thor endeavoured to keep his father's partner from becoming an object of public scandal. He took this trouble not because he bothered about public scandal in itself, but in order to protect Lois Willoughby. So far his methods had been successful. They failed today only because Lois herself was at the side door. With a pair of garden shears in her gloved hands, she was trimming the leafless vine that grew over the pillars of the portico. Thor could see, as she turned round, that she braced herself to meet the moment's humiliation, speaking on the instant he drew up at the steps. "'So good of you to bring Papa out from town. I'm sure he enjoyed the drive.' Her hand was on the lever that opened the door of the machine. "'Poor Papa, you look done up. I dare say you're not well. Be careful now,' she continued, as he lumbered heavily to his feet. "'That's a long step there. Take my hand. I know you must be as tired as can be.' Dog tired, the father complained as he lowered himself cautiously. Dog's life, that's what I lead. No thanks for it either. Dab! The imprecation was necessary because he missed his footing and came down with a jerk. Can't you see I'm getting out? he groaned peevishly. Staying right in my way. Better leave him to me, Thor whispered. I know just what to do with him. One of the advantages of being a doctor. Willoughby had mind enough to clutch at this suggestion. "'Doctor's what I want, hang it all. Sick of the dog. Don't know what'll happen to me some day. Headaches fit to split. Never had appetite for drink. That's one good thing about me.' 
Lois was still standing near the portico when Thor had assisted his charge to his room, stretched him on a couch, covered him with a rug, left him in a heavy sleep, and crept down the stairs again. It did not escape his eye, quickened by the minutes he had spent with Rosie Fay, that Lois lacked colour. For the first time in his life he acutely observed the difference between a plain woman and a pretty one. "'Oh, Thor,' she began as soon as he came out, "'I don't know how to thank you for your kindness to Papa. "'How is it to go on? Where is it to end? "'Oh, Thor, you're a doctor. Tell me what you think. "'Is there anything I can do?' His kind, searching eyes, as he stood with one hand on the steering wheel, rested on her silently. After all, she was twenty-seven, and must take her portion of life's responsibilities. Besides, whatever she might have to bear, he meant to share with her. She should not be obliged, like Rosie Fay, for instance, to carry her load alone. And yet she didn't look as if she would shirk her part. With that tall, erect figure, delicate in outline but strong with the freedom of an open-air life, that proud head which was nevertheless carried meekly, and that straightforward gaze, she gave the impression of being ready to meet anything. The face might be irregular, lacking in many of the tender prettinesses as natural to other girls, even at twenty-seven, as flowers to a field, but no one could deny its force of character. "'I'll tell you something you could do,' he said at last. "'You could see, or try to see, that he doesn't spend too much.' A slight pause marked his hesitation before adding, "'that, that, that no one spends too much.' "'You mean Mamma and me?' He smiled faintly. "'I mean whoever does the spending. "'But your father most of all, "'because I'm afraid he's rather reckless. "'He's spent a good deal "'during the last twelve or fifteen years, hasn't he?' She was very quick. "'More than he had a right to spend?' "'Well, more than my father,' "'he felt it safe to say. "'But he had more than your father to spend, hadn't he?' "'Do you know that for a certainty?' "'I only know it from Papa himself. "'But, oh, Thor, what is it? "'Why are you asking?' "'He ignored these questions to say, "'Couldn't your mother tell us? "'After all, it was her money, wasn't it?' "'She shook her head. "'Oh, Mamma wouldn't know. "'If you're in any doubt about it, "'why don't you ask Mr. Masterman? "'He could tell you better than anyone. "'Besides, Mamma isn't in.' "'He spoke with a touch of scorn. "'I suppose she's in town.' The tone evoked on Lois's part a little smile. They had had battles on the subject before. "'That's just where she is. "'That's just where she always is. "'Oh, no, not always. "'Sometimes she stays at home. "'But she's there pretty often, I admit. "'She has to make calls, partly because I won't, "'when I can help it.' He spoke approvingly. "'You, at any rate, don't fritter away your time like other women.' "'It depends on what other women you mean.' I fritter away my time like some women, even though it isn't like the women who make calls. I play golf, for instance, and tennis. I even ride. All the same, you don't like the silly thing called society any more than I do. There was daylight enough to show him the blaze of bravado in her eyes. Her way of holding her head had a certain daring, the daring of one too frank, perhaps too proud, to shrink at truth. Oh, I don't know. I dare say I should have liked society well enough if society had liked me, but it didn't. As Mamma says, I wasn't a success. To compel him to view her in all her lack of charm, she added, with a persistent smile, You know that, don't you? He did know it, though he could hardly say so. He'd heard Claude descant on the subject many a time, in the years when Lois was still putting in a timid appearance at dances. Claude was interested in everything that had to do with girls, from their clothes to their complexions. "'Can't make it out,' he would say at breakfast after a party. "'Dances well, dresses well, doesn't take. Fellows are afraid of her. Everybody is shy of a girl who isn't popular. Has enough devil. Girl ought to have some devil, hang it all. Talks with her myself. Well, I do about three times a year. Have her left on my hands an hour at a time. Fellow can't afford that. Think we have no chivalry?' should come to dance yourself, old chap. You'd be a godsend to the girls on the dump. Thor's dancing days were over before Lois's had begun, but he could imagine what they had been to her. 
He could look back over the four or five years that separated her from the ordeal, and still see her in The Dump, tall, timid, furtively watching the young men with those swimming brown orbs of hers, wondering whether or not she should have a partner, heart sore under her finery, often driving homeward in the weary early hours with tears streaming down her cheeks. He knew as much about it as if he had been with her. He suffered for her retrospectively. He did it to a degree that made his long face sorrowful. The sorrow caused Lois some impatience. "'For mercy's sake, Thor, don't look at me like that. It isn't as bad as you seem to think. I don't mind it.' "'But I do,' he declared with indignation, only to feel that he was slowly colouring. He coloured because the statement brought him within measurable distance of a declaration which he meant to make, but for which he was not ready. She seemed to divine his embarrassment, speaking with forced lightness. "'Please don't waste your sympathy on me. If anyone's to be pitied, it's Mamma. I'm such a disappointment to her. Let's talk of something else. Where have you been today, and what have you been doing?' He was not blind to her tact, counting it to her credit for the future, and asked her abruptly if she knew Fay the gardener. "'Fay the gardener?' she echoed. "'I know who he is.' She went more directly to the point in saying, "'I know his daughter.' "'Well, she's having a hard time.' "'Is she? I th think she might.' His face grew keener. "'Why do you say that?' "'Oh, I don't know. She's that sort. At least I should judge she was that sort from the little I've seen of her.' "'How much have you seen of her?' "'Almost nothing. But as little as it was, it impressed itself on my mind. I went to see her once at Mr. Whitney's suggestion.' "'Whitney? He's the rector at St. John's, isn't he? What had he to do with her? She doesn't belong to his church?' Lois explained. "'It was when we established the branch of the Girls' Friendly Society at St. John's. Mr. Whitney thought she might care to join it.' "'And did she?' "'No, quite the other way. When I went to ask her, she resented it. She had an idea I was patronising her. That's a difficulty in approaching girls like that.' He looked at her with a challenging expression. "'Girls like what?' "'I suppose I mean girls who haven't much money, or who've got to work.' He still challenged her, his head thrown back. "'They probably don't consider themselves inferior to you for that reason. It wouldn't be American if they did.' "'And it wouldn't be American if I did, and I don't. They only make me feel so because they feel it so strongly themselves. That's what's not American.' and it isn't on my part, but on theirs. They force their sentiment back on me. They make me patronising whether I will or no. And were you patronising when you went to see Miss Fay? To conceal the slightly irritated attentiveness with which he waited for her reply, he began to light his motor lamps. Condescension toward Rosy Fay suddenly struck him as offensive, no matter from whom it came. I'm sure I don't know she replied indifferently. There was something about her that disconcerted me. She's as good as we are, he declared, snapping the little door of one of the lanterns. I don't deny that. A generation or two ago we were all farming people together. The Willoughbys and the Brands and the Thorleys and the Fays were on an equal footing. They worked for one another and intermarried. The progress of the country has taken some of us and hurled us up, wanted to seize others of us and smashed us down but we should try to get over that when it comes to human intercourse. That's what I was doing when I asked her to join our friendly society. <laughs> the deuce you were! I know your friendly societies. Keep those who are down, down. Help the humble to be humbler by making them obsequious. You know nothing at all about it, she declared with spirit. In trying to make things better, you're content to spin theories, while we put something into practice.' He snapped the door of the second lamp with a little bang. Put something into practice, with the result that people resent it. With the result that Rosie Fay resented it. But she's not a fair example. She's proud and rebellious and intense. I never saw anyone just like her. You probably never saw anyone who had to be like her, because they've had their luck. Look here, Lewis, he said with sudden earnestness. I want you to be a friend to that girl. She opened her eyes in mild surprise at his intensity. 
"'There's nothing I should like better, if I knew how. "'But you do know how. It's easy enough. "'Treat her as you would a girl in your own class. "'Elsie Darling, for instance.' "'It's not so simple as that. "'When Elsie Darling came back after five or six years abroad, "'Mamma and I drove into town and called on her. "'She wasn't in, and we left our cards. "'Later we invited her to lunch or more to dinner. "'I should be perfectly willing to go through the same formalities with Miss Fay. Only she think it queer. It would be queer. It would be queer because she hasn't got, what shall I say, she hasn't got the social machinery for that kind of ceremoniousness. The machinery means the method of approach, and with people who have to live as she does, it's the method of approach that presents the difficulty. It's not as easy as it looks. Very well, then, let us admit that it is hard. The harder it is, the more it's the job for you. There was an illuminating quality in her smile that's toned for lack of beauty. Oh, if you put it that way, I do put it that way, he declared, with an earnestness toned down by what was almost wistfulness. There are so many things in which I want help, Lois, and you're the one to help me. She held out her hand with characteristic frankness. I'll do anything I can, Thor. Just tell me what you want me to do when you want me to do it, and I'll try. "'Oh, there'll be a lot of things in which we shall have to pull together,' he said, as he held her hand. "'I want you to remember, if any trouble ever comes, that—' "'He hesitated for a word that wouldn't say too much for the moment. "'That I'll be there.' "'Thank you, Thor. That's a great comfort.' "'She withdrew her hand quietly. "'Quietly, too, she assured him, as she moved towards the steps, "'that she would not fail to force herself again on Rosy Fay.' "'And about that other matter, the one you spoke of first. "'You'll tell me more by and by, won't you?' "'After her capacity for ringing true, "'his conscientiousness prompted him to let her see "'that she could feel quite sure of him. "'I'll tell you anything I can find out. "'And one of these days, Lois, I must... "'I must... say a lot more.' "'She mounted a step or two without turning away from him. "'Oh, well,' she said lightly, as though dismissing a topic of no importance. There'll be plenty of time. But her smile was a happy one, so happy that he who smiled rarely smiled back at her from the runabout. He could scarcely be expected to know as yet that his pleasure was not in any happiness of hers, but in the help she might bring to a little creature whose image had haunted him all the afternoon, a little creature whose desperate flower-like face looked up at him from a background of poinsettias. End of chapter 4。Chapter 5 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Simon Evers。Chapter 5 。On coming to the table that evening, Claude begged his mother to excuse him for not having dressed for dinner on the ground that he had an engagement with Billy Cheever. Mrs. Masterman pardoned him with a gracious inclination of the head that made her diamond earrings sparkle. No man in the room could be unaware that she disapproved of Claude's informality. Not only did it shock her personal delicacy to dine with men who concealed their shirt bosoms under the waistcoats they had worn all day, but it contravened the aims by which during her entire married life she did endeavour to elevate the society around her. She herself was one to whom the refinements were as native as foliage to a tree. "'It's all right, Claudie dear, but you do know that I like you to dress for the evening, don't you?' Without waiting for the young son to speak, she continued graciously to the elder, "'And you, Tor, what have you been doing with yourself to-day?' Her polite inclusion of her stepson was meant to start her men, as she called them, in the kind of conversation in which men were most at ease, that which concerned themselves. Thor replied, while consuming his soup in the manner acquired in Parisian and Viennese restaurants frequented by young men. "'Got a patient?' Hastily, Claude introduced a subject of his own. "'Ought to go and see the champion, father. Heard it's awfully good. Begins with a prize fight.' But the father's attention was given to Thor. "'Who have you picked up?' Uh, "'Fay's wife. Fay, the gardener. Indeed. Have to whistle for your fee.' "'Oh, I know that.' "'Thor, please,' Mrs. Masterman begged, "'don't eat so fast.' 
If you know it already, the father continued, I should think you'd have tried to squeak out of it. He said, know it already, and tried to squeak, owing to a difficulty with the letter R, which gave an appealing, childlike quality to his speech. If you start in by taking patients who are not going to pay... Claude sought another diversion. What does it matter to Thor? In three months' time be able to pay sick people for coming to him, what? That's not the point, Masterman explained. A doctor has no right to pauperwise people, he said, pauperwise people, any more than anyone else. Oh, as to that, Thor said, forcing himself to eat slowly and sit straight in the style commended by his stepmother, it won't need a doctor to pauperise poor Fay. Oh, quite right there, his father agreed. He's done it himself. Thor considered at the moment a favourable one for making his appeal. Claude and I have been talking him over. The devil we have! Claude exclaimed indignantly. What's that? Masterman's handsome face, which after his day's work was likely to be grey and lifeless, grew sharply interrogative. Time had chiselled it to an incisiveness not incongruous with a lingering air of youth. His hair, moustache and imperial were but touched with grey. His figure was still lithe and spare. It was the custom to save him that he looked but the brother of his two strapping sons. Claude emphasised his annoyance. "'Talking him over? I like that. You blow into the office just as I'm ready to come home and begin cross-questioning me about father's affairs. I tell you, I don't know anything about them. If you call that talking them over, well, you're welcome to your own use of terms.' The head of the house busied himself in carving the joint which had been placed before him. "'If you want information, Thor, ask me.' "'I don't want information, Father, and I don't think Claude is fair in saying I cross-questioned him. "'I only said that I thought he and I ought to do what we could to get you to renew Fay's lease.' "'Oh, did you? Then I can save you the trouble, because I'm not going to.' "'The declaration was so definite that it left Thor with nothing to say. "'Poor old Fay has worked pretty hard, hasn't he?' he ventured at last. "'Possibly. So have I.' but with the difference that you've been prosperous, and he hasn't. Masterman laughed good-naturedly. How much is the difference between me and a good many other people? You don't blame me for that. It's not a question of blaming anyone, Father. I only suppose that, among Americans, it was the correct thing for the lucky ones to come to the aid of the less fortunate. Take it that I'm doing that for Fay when I get him out of an impossible situation. Thor smiled ruefully. "'when you get him out of the frying-pan into the fire?' "'Well,' Claude challenged, coming to his father's aid, "'fire's no worse than the frying-pan, and maybe a little better.' "'I've seen the girl,' Mrs. Masterman contributed to the discussion. "'She's been in the greenhouse when I've gone to buy flowers. "'I must say she didn't strike me very favourably. "'The two brothers exchanged glances, without knowing why. "'She seemed to me so much, so very much,' "'Above her station.' "'What is her station?' Thor asked, bridling. "'Her station's the same as ours, isn't it?' The father was amused. "'Same as what? "'Surely we're all much of a muchness. "'Most of us were farmers and market gardeners "'up to forty or fifty years ago. "'I've heard,' he went on, "'utilising the information he had received that afternoon, "'that the Thorleys used to hire out to the Fays.' "'Oh, the Thorleys!' Mrs. Masterman smiled. "'The Mastermans didn't,' Archie said gently. "'You won't forget that, my boy. "'Whatever you may be on on any other side, "'you come from a line of gentlemen on mine. "'Your grandfather Masterman was one of the best-known old-school physicians "'in this part of the country. "'His father before him was a Church of England clergyman in Derbyshire, "'who migrated to America because he'd become a Unitarian. "'Sort of idealist. "'Lots of them in those days.' time of Napoleon and Southey and Coleridge and all that, thought that because America was a so-called republic or a so-called democracy, he'd find people living for one another, and they were just looking out for number one like everyone else. Your Uncle Sim takes after him. Died of a broken heart, I believe, because he didn't find the world made over new. But you see the sort of well-born, high-minded stock you sprang from. Thor lifted his big frame to an erect position, throwing back his head. I don't care a fig for what I sprang from, father. I don't even care much for what I am. It strikes me as far more important to see that our old friends and neighbours, 
who are just as good as we are, don't have to go under when we can keep them up. Yes, when we can, Thor's father said with unperturbed gentleness, but very often we can't. In a world where everyone is swimming for his own dear life, those who can't swim have got to drown. But everyone is not swimming for his own dear life. Most of us are safe on shore. You and I are, for example. And when we are, it seems to me the least we can do is to fling a life preserver to the poor chaps who are throwing up their hands and sinking. Mrs. Masterman rallied her stepson indulgently. Oh, Thor, how ridiculous you are! How you talk! Claude patted his mother's hand. He was still trying to turn attention from forbearing too directly on the phase. Don't listen to him, Mumphy. Beastly socialist, that's what he is. Divide up all the money in the world so that everybody will have thirty cents, and then tell him to go ahead and live regardless. That'd be his way of doing things. But his father was more just. Oh, no, it wouldn't. Thor's no fool. Has some excellent ideas. A little exaggerated, perhaps, but that'll cure itself in time. Fault of youth. Good fault, too. He turned affectionately to his older son. Rather see you that way, my boy, than with an empty head. Thor fell silent, from a sense of the futility of talking. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 6 At the moment when Claude was excusing himself further, begging to be allowed to run away so as not to keep Billy Cheever waiting, Rosie Fay was noticing with relief that her mother was asleep at last. Thor's sedative had taken effect in what the girl considered the nick of time. Having smoothed the pillow, adjusted the patchwork quilt, and placed the small kerosene hand lamp on a chair at the foot of the bed, so as to shade it from the sleeper's eyes, she slipped downstairs. She wore a long, rough coat. Over her hair she had flung a scarf of some gauzy green stuff that heightened her colour. The lamplight, or some inner flame of her own, drew opalescent gleams from her grey-greenish eyes as she descended. She was no longer the desperate, petulant little Rosie of the afternoon. Her face was aglow with an eager life. The difference was that between a blossom wilting for lack of water and the same flower fed by rain. In the tiny living room at the foot of the stairs, her father was eating the supper she had laid out for him. It was a humble supper, spread on the end of a table covered with a cheap cotton cloth of a red and sky-blue mixture. Jasper Fay, in his shirt-sleeves, munched his cold meat and sipped his tea, while he entertained himself with a book propped against a loaf of bread. Another small kerosene hand-lamp threw its light on the printed page and illumined his mild, clear-cut, clean-shaven face. "'She's asleep,' Rosie whispered from the doorway. "'If she wakes while I'm gone, you must give her the second dose. I've left it on the washstand.' The man lifted his starry blue eyes. "'You going out?' "'I'm only going for a little while.' "'Couldn't you have gone earlier?' "'How could I when I had supper to get, and everything?' He looked uneasy. "'I don't like you to be running round these dark roads, my dear. You've been doing it a good deal lately. Where is it you go?' "'Why, Father, what nonsense! Here I am, cooped up all day.' He sighed. "'Very well, my dear. I know you've had much pleasure. But things will be different soon, I hope. The new night farmer seems a good man, and I expect we'll do better now.' He'll be here at ten. Were you going far? She answered promptly. Only to Polly Wilson's. She wants me to... Rosie turned over in her mind the various interests on which Polly Wilson might desire to consult her. She wants me to see her new dress. Very well, my dear. But I hope after this evening you'll be able to do your errands in the daytime. You know how it was with Matt. If he hadn't gone roaming the streets at night... Rosie came close to the table. Her face was resolute. "'Father, I'm not mad. I know what I'm doing,' she added with increased determination. "'I'm acting for the best.' He was mildly surprised. "'Acting for the best in going to see Polly Wilson's new dress?' She ignored this. "'I'm twenty-three, father. I've got to follow my own judgment. If I've a chance, I must use it.' "'What sort of a chance, my dear?' "'There's nothing to hope for here,' she went on cruelly. "'except from what I can do myself. "'Mother's no good, and Matt's worse than if he was dead. "'I wish to God he would die before he comes out. 
and you know what you are, father. I do the best I can, my dear, he said humbly. I know you do, but we can all see what that is. Everybody else is going ahead but us. Oh, no, they're not, my dear. There are lots that fall behind, as bad as we do, and worse. She shook her head fiercely. No, not worse. They couldn't. And whatever's to be done, I've got to do it. If I don't, or if I can't, well, we might as well give up. So you mustn't try to stop me, father. I know what I'm doing. It's for your sake and everybody's sake as much as for my own. He dropped his eyes to his book, in seeming admission that he had no tenable ground on which to meet her in a conflict of wills. "'Very well, my dear,' he sighed. "'If you're going to Polly Wilson's, you'd better be off. You'll be home by ten, won't you? I must go then to show the new farm and his way about the place.' Outside it was a windy night, but not a cold one. Shreds of dark clouds scudded across the face of a three-quarters moon, giving it the appearance of travelling through the sky at an incredible rate of speed. In the south wind there was the tang of ocean salt, mingled with the sweeter scents of woodland and withered garden nearer home. There was a crackling of boughs in the old apple trees, and from the ridge behind the house came the deep, soft, murmurous soughing of pines. If Rosie lingered on the doorstep, it was not because she was afraid of the night sounds or of the dark. She was restrained from it by a sense of terror at what she was about to do. It was not a new terror. She felt it on every occasion when she went forth to keep this tryst. As she had already said to her father, she knew what she was doing. She was neither so young nor so inexperienced as to be unaware of the element of danger that waited on her steps. No one could have told her better than she could have told herself that the voice of wise counsel would have bidden her stay at home. But if she was not afraid of the night, neither was she irresolute before the undertaking. Being forewarned, she was forearmed. Being forearmed, she could run the risks. Running the risks, she could enjoy the excitement and find solace in the romance. For it was romance. Romance of the sort she had dreamed of and planned for and got herself ready to be eager to, if ever it should come. Somehow she had always known it would come. She could hardly go back to the time when she did not have this premonition of a lover who would appear like a prince in a fairy tale and lift her out of her low estate. And he had come. He had come late on an afternoon in the preceding summer, when she was picking wild raspberries in the wood above Duck Rock. It was a lonely spot in which she could reasonably have expected to be undisturbed. She was picking the berries fast and deftly, because the fruit man who passed in the morning would give her a dollar for her harvest. Was it the dollar, or was it the sweet, wandering summer air? Was it the mingled perfumes of vine and fruit and soft loam loosened as she crept among the brambles? Or was it the shimmer of the waning sunlight, or the whir of the wings of birds, or the note of a hermit thrush in some still depth of the woodland ever so far away? Or was it only because she was young, and invincibly happy at times, in spite of a sore heart, that she sang to herself as her nimble fingers secured the juicy, delicate red things and dropped them into the pan. He came, like Pan, or a fawn, or any other woodland thing, with no sound of his approach, not even that of open pipes. When she raised her eyes, he was standing in a patch of bracken. She'd been stooping to gather the fruit that clustered on a long, low, spiny stem. The words on her lips had been, At least be pity to me shown, if love it may na be. But her voice trailed away faintly on the last syllable, for on looking up he was before her. He wore white flannels and a Panama hat of which the brim was roguishly pulled down in front to shade his eyes. He was smiling unabashed, and yet with a friendliness that made it impossible for her to take offence. "'Isn't it rosy?' he asked, without moving from where he stood in the patch of trampled bracken. "'I'm Claude. Don't you remember me?' A Delphic nymph, who had been addressed by Apollo in the seclusion of some sacred grove, could hardly have felt more joyous or more dumb. Rosie Fay did not know in what kind of words to answer the listening being who had spoken to her with this fine familiarity. Later, in the silence of the night, she blushed with shame to think of the figure she must have cut, standing speechless before him, the pan of red raspberries in her hands, 
her raspberry-red lips apart in amazement, and her eyes gleaming and wide with awe. She remained vague as to what she answered in the end. It was confusedly to the effect that, though she remembered him well enough, she supposed that he had long forgotten one so insignificant as herself. Presently he was beside her, dropping raspberries into her pan, while they laughed together as in those early days when they picked peas by her father's permission in Grandpa Foley's garden. Their second meeting was accidental, if it was accidental that each had come to the same spot at the same hour on the following day in the hope of finding the other. The third meeting was also on the same spot, but by appointment, in secret, and at night. Claude had been careful to impress on her the disaster that would ensue if their romance were discovered. But Rosie Fay knew what she was doing. She repeated that statement often to herself. Had she really been a Delphic nymph, or even a young lady of the best society, she might have given herself without reserve to the rapture of her idyll. But her circumstances were peculiar. Rosie was obliged to be practical, to look ahead. A fairy prince was not only a romantic dream in her dreary life, but an agency to be utilised. The least self-seeking of drowning maids might expect the hero on the bank to pull her out of the water. The very fact that she recognised in Claude a tendency to dally with her on the brink, instead of landing her in a place of safety, compelled her to be the more astute. But she was not so astute as to be inaccessible to the sense of terror that assailed her every time she went to meet him. It was the fright of one accustomed to walk on earth when seized and borne into the air. Claude's voice over the telephone, as she had heard it that afternoon, was like the call to adventures at once enthralling and appalling, in which she found it hard to keep her head. She kept it only by saying to herself, I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing. My father is ruined, my brother is in jail. But I love this man, and he loves me. If he marries me... But Rosie's thoughts broke off abruptly there. They broke off because they reached a point beyond which imagination would not carry her. If he marries me... The supposition led her where all was blurred and roseate and golden, like the mists around the happy isles. Rosie could not forecast the conditions that would be hers as the wife of Claude Masterman. She only knew that she would be transported into an atmosphere of money, and money she had learned by sore experience to be the sovereign palliative of care. Love was much to poor Rosie, but relief from anxiety was more. It had to be so, since both love and light are secondary blessings to the tired creature whose first need is rest. It was for rest that Claude Mastermind stood primarily in her mind. He was a fairy prince, of course. He was a lover who might have satisfied any girl's aspirations. But before everything else, he was a hero and a saviour, a being in whose vast potentialities, both social and financial, she could find refuge and lie down at last. It needed but this bright thought to brace her. She clasped her hands to her breast. She lifted her eyes to the swimming moon. She drew deep breaths of the sweet, strong air. She appealed to all the supporting forces she knew anything about. A minute later, she was speeding through the darkness. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 7 Between the greenhouses, of which the glass gleamed dimly in the moonlight, Rosie followed a path that straggled down the slope of her father's land to the new boulevard round the pond. The boulevard here swept inland about the base of Duck Rock in order to leave that wooded bluff an inviolate feature of the landscape. So inviolate had it been that during the months since Rosie had picked wild raspberries in its boscage, the park commissioners had seized on it as a spot to be subdued by winding paths and restful benches. To make it the more civilised and inviting, they placed one of the arc lamps that now garlanded the circuit of the pond, just where it would guide the feet of lovers into the alluring shade. Rosie was glad of this friendly light before engaging on the rough path up the bluff under the skeleton-like trees. She was not afraid. She was only nervous, 
and the light gave her confidence. But tonight, as she emerged on the broad boulevard from the weedy outskirts of her father's garden, the clatter of horse-hoofs startled her into drawing back. She would have got herself altogether out of sight had there been anything at hand in the nature of a shrub high enough to conceal her. As it was, she could only shrink to the extreme edge of the roadside, hoping that the rider, whoever he was, would pass without seeing her. This he might have done, had not the bay mare, Delia, unaccustomed to the sight of young ladies roaming alone at night, thought it the part of propriety to shy. "'Wah, Delia, wah! What's the matter? Steady, old girl, steady!' There was a flash of the quick, penetrating eyes around the circle made by the arc-light. "'Why, hello, Rosie. But my soul. Looks scared as a stray kitten. Where are you going?' Rosie could only reply that she wasn't going anywhere. She was just out. "'Well, it's a fine night. Everybody seems to be out. Just met Claude.' The girl was unable to repress a startled, "'Oh!' Then she bit her tongue at the self-betrayal. Uncle Sim laughed merrily. "'No wonder you're frightened, pretty girl like you. Devil of a fellow, if Claude thinks he is. Suppose you don't know him. Ah, well, that wouldn't make any difference to him if he was to run across you. I'll tell you what, you come along with me.' Chuckling to himself, he slipped from Delia's back, preparing to lead the mare and accompany the girl on foot. "'We'll go round by the old village and up Schoolhouse Lane. Walk will do you good. you sleep better after it. Come along now, and tell me about your mother as we go. Did my nephew Thor come to see her?' "'What did he give her? Did she take it? Did it make her sleep?' Rosie shrank away from him with the eyes of a terrified animal. "'Oh, oh no, Dr. Master, please, I, I, I don't want to take that long walk. I'll, I'll go back up the path the, the way I came. I just ran out to... to, to... He looked at her with suspicious kindliness. "'Will you promise me you'll go back the way you came?' "'Yes, yes, I will.' "'That's all right. It's an awfully dangerous road, Rosie. Tramps and everything.' "'But if you'll go straight back up the path, I'll be easy in my mind about you.' He watched her while she retreated. "'Good night,' he called. "'Good night,' came her voice from halfway up the garden. She was obliged to wait in the shadow of an outlying hothouse till the sound of Delia's hoofs clattering off towards the old village died away on the night. She crept back again, cautiously. Cautiously, too, she stole across the boulevard and into the wood. Once there, she flew up the path with the frantic eagerness of a hare. She was afraid Claude might have come and gone. She was afraid of the incident with old Sim. What did he mean? Did he mean anything? If he betrayed Claude at home, would he keep the latter from meeting her? She had no great confidence in Claude's ability to withstand authority. She had no great confidence in anything, not even in his love or in her own. The love was true enough. It was ardently, desperately true. Would it bear the strain that could so easily be put upon it? She felt of her swept up by an immense longing to be sure. She had so many subjects to think of and to dread that she forgot to be frightened as she sped up the bluff. It was only on reaching the summit and discovering that Claude wasn't there that she was seized by fear. There was a bench beside her, a round bench circling the trunk of an oak tree, and she sank upon it. The crunching of footsteps told her someone was coming up the slope. In all probability it was Claude, but it might be a stranger or even an animal. The crunching continued, measured, slow. She would have fled if there had been any way of fleeing without encountering the object of her alarm. The regular beat of the footsteps growing heavier and nearer through the darkness rendered her almost hysterical. When at last Claude's figure emerged into the moonlight, his erect slenderness defined against the sky. She threw herself, sobbing, into his arms. It was not the least of Claude's attractions that he was so tender with women swept by crises of emotion. Where Thor would have stood helpless or prescribed a mild sedative, Claude pressed the agitated creature to his breast and let her weep. When her sobs had subsided to a convulsive clinging to him without tears, he explained his delay in arriving by his meeting with Uncle Sim. They were seated on the bench by this time, his arms about her, her face close to his. Awful nuisance he is, regular Paul Pry. Can't keep anything from him. Scars the country night and day like the headless horseman of Sleepy Hollow. Never know when you'll meet him. I met him too, Rosie said, getting some control of her voice. The deuce you did. Did he speak to you? Did he say anything about me? He said he'd seen you. 
Is that all? She weighed the possible disadvantages of saying too much, coming to the conclusion that she'd better tell him more. No, it isn't quite all. He seemed to warn me against you. Oh, the devil! In his start he loosened his embrace, but grasped her to him again. What's he up to now? Do you think he's up to anything? What else did he say? Tell me all you can think of. She narrated the brief incident. Will it make any difference to us? She ventured to ask. It'll make a difference to us if he blabs to father, of course. What sort of difference, Claude? The sort of difference it makes when there's the devil to pay. She clasped him to her the more closely. Does that mean that we shouldn't be able to see each other any more? The question being beyond him, Claude smothered it under a selection of those fond epithets in which his vocabulary was large. In the very process of enjoying them, Rosie was rallying her strength. She was still clasping him as she withdrew her head slightly, looking up at him through the moonlight. Claude, I want to ask you something. With his hand on the knot of her hair, he pressed her face once more against his. Yes, yes, darling, ask me anything. Yes, yes, yes. She broke in on his purring with the words, Are we engaged? The purring ceased. Without relaxing his embrace, he remained passive, like a man listening. What makes you ask me that? It's what people generally are when they're... when they're like us, isn't it? Brushing his lips over the velvet of her cheeks, he began to purr again. No one was ever like us, darling. No one ever will be. Don't worry your little head with what doesn't matter. But it does matter to me, Claude. I want to know where I am. Where you are, dearie. You're here with me. Isn't that enough? It's enough for now, Claude, but... That isn't what it's enough for now, all we've got to think of. No, Claude, dearest, a girl isn't like a man. Oh, yes, she is when she loves. And you love me, don't you, dearie? You love me just a little. Say you love me just a little, a very little. Oh, Claude, my darling, my darling, you know I love you. You've all I've got in the world. And you're all I've got, my little Rosie. Nothing else counts when I'm with you. But when you're not with me, Claude, what then? What am I to think when you're away from me? What am I to be? Be just as you are. Be just as you've always been since the day I first saw you. Yes, yes, Claude, but you, you don't understand. If anyone were to find out that I came here to meet you like this... No one must find out, dear. We must keep that, Mum. But if they did, Claude, it, it wouldn't matter to you at all. Oh, wouldn't it, though? Father, to make it a matter, I can tell you. Yes, but you wouldn't be disgraced. I should be. Don't you see? No one would ever believe. Oh, what does it matter what anyone believes? Let them all go hang. We can't let them all go hang. You can't let your father go hang, and I can't let mine. Do you know what my father would do to me if he knew where I am now? He'd kill me. Oh, rot, Rosie. No, no, Claude, I'm telling you the truth. He's that sort. He wouldn't think it, but he is. He's one of those mild, dreamy men who, when they're enraged, which isn't often, don't know where to stop. If he thought I'd done wrong, he'd put a knife into me, just like that. She struck her clenched hand against his heart. When Matt was arrested... He tore himself from her suddenly. The sensitive part of him had been touched. Oh, Lord, Rosie, don't let's go into that. I hate that business. I try to forget it. No one can forget it who remembers me. Oh, yes, they can. I can. When you don't drag it up. What's the use, Rosie? Why not be happy for the few hours every now and then that we can get together? What's got into you? He changed his tone. You hurt me, Rosie. You hurt me. You talk as if you didn't trust me. You seem to have suspicions to, to be making schemes. Oh, Claude, for God's sake! Rosie, too, was touched on the quick perhaps by some truth in the accusation. He kissed her ardently. I know, dear, I know. I know it's all right that you don't mean anything. Kiss me. Tell me you won't do it any more, that you won't hurt the man who adores you. What does anything else matter? You and I are everything there is in the world. Don't let us talk. When we've got each other. Rosie gave it up, for the present at any rate. 
she began to perceive dimly that they had different conceptions of love. For her, love was engagement and marriage, with the material concomitants of the two states implied. But for Claude, love was something else. It was something she didn't understand, except that it was indifferent to the orderly procession by which her own ambitions climbed. He loved her, of that she was sure. But he loved her for her face, her mouth, her eyes, her hair, the colour of her skin, her roughened little hands, her lithe little body. Of nothing else in her was he able to take cognizance. Her hard life and her heart-breaking struggles were conditions he hadn't the eyes to see. He was aware of them, of course, but he could detach her from them. He could detach her from them for the minutes she spent with him, but he could see her go back to them and make no attempt to follow her in sympathy. But he loved her beauty. There was that palliating fact. After all, Rosie was a woman, and here was the supreme tribute to her womanhood. It was not everything, and yet it was the thing enchanting. It was the kind of tribute any woman in the world would have put before social rescue or moral elevation, and Rosie was like the rest. She could be lulled by Claude's endearments as a child is lulled by a cradle song. With this music in her ears, doubts were stilled and misgivings quieted and ambitions overruled. Return to the world of care and calculation followed only on Claude's words uttered just as they were parting. "'And you'd better be on your guard against Thor. So long as he's going to your house, you mustn't give anything away.'" End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 8 Dressed for going out, Mrs. Willoughby was buttoning her gloves as she stood in the square hall hung with tapestries of a late Gubernar period and adorned with a cabinet in the style of Moule, flanked by two decorative Regency chairs. Her gaze followed the action of her fingers or wandered now and then inquiringly up the stairway. Her broad, low figure, wide about the hips, tapered towards the feet in lines suggestive of a spinning top. She was proud of her feet, which were small and shapely, and approved of her fashion in skirts that permitted them to be displayed. Being less proud of her eyes, she also approved of a style of hat which allowed the low, sloping brim, worn slantways across the brows, to conceal one of them. "'You're surely not going in that rag?' The protest was called forth by Lois's appearance in a walking costume on the stairs. "'But, Mamma, I'm not going at all. I told you so.' "'Told me so? What's the good of telling me so? There have been loads of men there, simply loads. Goodness me! Lois, if you're ever going to know any men at all—' "'I know all the men I want to know.' "'You don't know all the men you want to know, and if you do I shall be ashamed to say it. A girl who's had all your advantages and doesn't make more show—' "'What on earth are you doing that you don't want to come?' Lois hesitated, but she was too frank for concealments. "'I'm going to see a girl Thor Masterman wants me to look after. "'He thinks I may be able to help her.' "'The mother subsided. "'Oh, well, if it's that,' she added, so as not to seem to hint too much. "'I always like you to do what you can toward uplift. "'I'll take you as far as the old village, if you're going that way.' There had been a time when such concessions at the mention of Thor Masterman would have irritated Lois more than any violence of opposition, but that time was passing. She could hardly complain if others saw what was daily becoming more patent to herself. She could complain of it the less, since she found it difficult to conceal her happiness. It was a happiness that softened the pangs of care and removed to a distance the conditions incidental to her father's habits and impending financial ruin. Nevertheless, the conditions were there, and had to be confronted. She made, in fact, a timid effort to confront them as she sat beside her mother in the admirably fitted limousine. "'Mother, what are we going to do about Papa?' Mrs. Willoughby's indignant rising to the occasion could be felt like an electric wave. "'Do about him? Do about what?' "'About the way he is.' "'The way he is? What on earth are you talking about?' "'I mean, the way he comes home.' He comes home very tired, if that's what you're trying to say. Any man who works as they work him at that office. Do you think it's work? 
No, I don't think it's work. I call it slavery. It's enough to put a man in his grave. I've seen him come home so that he could hardly speak. And if you've done the same, you may know that he's simply tired enough to die. Lois tried to come indirectly to her point by saying, Thor Masterman has been bringing him home lately. Oh, well, I suppose Thor knows he doesn't lose anything by that move. Lois ignored the remark to say, Thor seems worried. The mother's alertness was that of a ruffled bellicose bird defending its mate. If Thor's worried about your father, he can spare himself the trouble. He can leave that to me. I'll take care of him. What he needs is rest. When everything is settled, I mean to take him away. Of course, we can't go this winter. If we could, we should go to Egypt, he and I. But we can't. We know that. We make the sacrifice. These discreet allusions, too, Lois thought it best to let pass in silence. It wasn't altogether about Papa that Thor was worried. He seems anxious about money. Bessie tossed her head. That may easily be. If your father takes our money out of the firm, as he threatens to do, the masterman's will be, well, I don't know where. The girl felt it right to go a step further. He seemed to hint, he didn't say it in so many words, that perhaps Papa wouldn't have so very much to take out. This was dismissed lightly. Then he doesn't know what he's talking about. Archie's frightfully close in these things, I must say. He's never let either of the boys know anything about the business. He won't even let me. But your father knows. If Thor thinks for a minute the money isn't nearly all ours, he may come in for a rude awakening. Reassured by this firmness of tone, Lois began to take heart. Getting out of the old village, she continued her way on foot, and found Rosie among the azaleas and poinsettias. Thor Masterman met her an hour later, as she returned homeward. He knew where she had been as soon as he saw her turn the corner at which the road descends the hill, recognising with a curious pang her promptness in carrying out his errand. The pang was a surprise to him, the beginning of a series of revelations on the subject of himself. Her desire to please him had never before this instant caused him anything but satisfaction. It had been but the response to his desire to please her. He had not been blind to the goal to which this mutual goodwill would lead them, but he had quite made up his mind that she would make him as good a wife as any one. As a preliminary to marriage, he had weighed the possibility of falling ardently in love, coming at last to the conclusion that he was not susceptible to that passion. His long-standing intention to marry Lois Willoughby was based on the fact that besides being sympathetic to him, she was plain and lonely. If the motive hadn't taken full possession of his heart, it was because the state of being plain and lonely had never seemed to him the worst of calamities by any means. The worst of calamities, that for which no patience was sufficient, that for which there was no excuse, that which kings, presidents, emperors, parliaments, congresses, embassies and armies should combine their energies to prevent, was to be poor. He was entirely of Mrs Fay's opinion, that with money, ill-health and unhappiness were details. You could bear them both. You could bear being lonely. You could bear being plain. Consequently, the menace that now threatened Lois Willoughby's fortunes strengthened her claim on him. But all at once he felt, as he saw her descend the hill, that the claim might make complications. Was it because she was plain? Curious that he had never attached importance to that fact before but it blinded him now to her graceful carriage, as well as to the way she had of holding her head with a noble, independent poise that made her a woman of distinction. She was smiling with an air at once intimate and triumphant. I think I've won the first encounter, at any rate. In his wincing, there was the surprise of a man who in a moment of expansion had made a sacred confidence, only to find it crop up lightly in subsequent conversation he was obliged to employ some self-control in order to say, with a manner sufficiently off-hand, "'What happened?' She told of making her approaches under the plea of buying potted plants. Her cold reception had given way before her persistent friendliness, while there had been complete capitulation on the tender of an invitation to County Street to tea. The visit had been difficult to manage, but amusing, and a little pitiful.' 
To the details that were difficult or pitiful, he could listen with calm, but he was inwardly indignant that Lois should find anything in her meeting with Rosie that lent itself to humour. He knew that humour. The superior were fond of indulging in it at the expense of the less fortunate. Even Lois Willoughby had not escaped that taint of class. Fearing to wound her by some impatient word, he made zeal in his round of duties the excuse for an abrupt good-bye. But zeal in his round of duties changed to zeal of another kind, as with set face and a long swinging stride he hurried up the hill. The plans he had been maturing for the psychological treatment of Mrs. Fay melted into eagerness to know how the poor little thing had taken Lois's advances. He was disappointed, therefore, that Rosie should receive him coldly. Within twenty-four hours his imagination had created between them something with the flavour of a friendship. He had been thinking of her so incessantly that it was disconcerting to perceive that apparently she had not been thinking of him at all. He was the doctor to her, and no more. She continued to direct Antonio, the Italian, who was opening a crate of closely packed azalea plants, while she discussed the effect of his sedative on her mother. Her manner was dry and businesslike, her replies to his questions brief and to the point. But, professional duty being done, he endeavoured to raise the personal issue. "'What did you mean yesterday when you said that you couldn't play fair, but that you'd play as fair as you could?' She turned from her contemplation of the stooping Antonio's back. "'Did I say that?' He hardly heeded the question and the pleasure he got from this glimpse of her green eyes. "'You said that, or something very much like it.' His uncertainty gave her the chance to correct that which, in the light of Claude's warning, might prove to have been an indiscretion. "'I'm sure I can't imagine you must have misunderstood me.' He pursued the topic not because he cared, but in order to make her look at him again. "'Oh, no, I didn't. Don't you remember? It was after you said that there was one thing that might happen.' She was sure of her indiscretion now. He might even be setting a snare for her. Dr. Sim Masterman might have withdrawn from her mother's case in order to put the one brother on the other's tracks. If Claude was right in his suspicions, there was reasonable ground for alarm. She said with assumed indifference. Oh, that, that was nothing, just a fancy. He still talked, for the sake of talking, attaching no importance to her replies. Was it a fancy when you said that I would be one of the people opposed to it, if it happened? Well, yes, but you only be one among a lot. She shifted to firmer ground. I wasn't thinking of you in particular, or of anyone in particular. Were you thinking of anything in particular? The question threw her back on straight denial. No, no, not exactly, just a fancy. But I shouldn't be opposed to it, whatever it is, if it was to your advantage. His persistence deepened her distrust. A man whom she had seen only once before would hardly display such an interest in her and her affairs unless he had a motive, especially when that man was a masterman. She took refuge in her task with the azaleas. No, no, not there, Tantini. Put, put, put them there, like this. I'll show you. The necessity for giving Antonio practical demonstration taking her to the other side of the hothouse, Thor felt himself obliged to go. He went with the greater regret since he had been unable to sound her on the subject of Lois Willoughby's advances, though her skill in eluding him heightened his respect. His disdain for the small arts of coquetry being as sincere as his scorn of snobbery, he counted it to her credit that she eluded him at all. There would be plenty of opportunities for speech with her. During them he hoped to win her confidence by degrees. In the bedroom upstairs, where the mother was again seated in her upholstered armchair with the quilt across her knees, he endeavoured to put into practice his idea of mental therapeutics. He began by speaking of Matt, using the terms that would most effectively challenge her attention. "'When he comes back, you know, we must make him forget that he's ever worn stripes.' She eyed him sternly. "'What'll be the good of his forgetting it? He'll have done it just the same.' Some of us have done worse than that, and yet and yet we didn't get into coal corp for them, but that's what counts. You can do what you like as long as you ain't put in jail. Look at your father. So when he comes home, he interrupted craftily. She leaned forward, throwing the quilt from her knees. 
"'See here,' she asked confidentially. "'How would you feel if you saw your son coming out of hell?' "'How should I feel? "'I should be glad he was coming up instead of going down. "'You would, too, wouldn't you? "'And now that he's coming up, we must keep him up. "'That's the point. "'So many poor chaps that have been in his position "'feel that because they've once been down, they've got to stay down. "'We must make him see that he's come back among friends, "'and you must tell us what to do. "'You must give your mind to it and think it out. "'He's your boy, so it's your duty to take the lead.' Her cold eye rested on him as if she were giving his words consideration. "'Why don't you ask your father to take the lead? He sent him to Colcord.' They got no further than this during the hour he spent with her, seeing that Uncle Sim had been right in describing the case as one for ingenuity, and something more. Questioning himself as to what this something more could be, he brought up the subject tentatively with Jasper Fay, whom he met on leaving the house. Thor himself stood on the doorstep, while Fay, who wore gardening overalls, confronted him from the withered grass plot that ended in a leafless hedge of bridal veil. "'She's never been a religious woman at all, has she?' Fay answered with a distant smile. "'She did go in for religion at one time, sir, but I guess she found it slim diet. It got to seem to her like Thomas Collar's hungry lion invited to a feast of chickenweed. After that she quit.' "'I had an idea that you belonged to the First Church "'and were Dr. Hillary's parishioners.' "'Fay explained. "'Dr. Hillary married us, "'but we haven't troubled the Church much since. "'I never took any interest in the Christian religion to begin with. And "'When I looked into it, I found it even more fallacious than I supposed.' "'To account for this advanced position on the part of a simple market gardener, "'he added, "'I've been a good deal of a reader.' "'Fall spoke slowly and after meditation. It isn't so much a question of its being fallacious as of its capacity for producing results. Fay turned partially round towards the south, where a haze hung above the city. His tone was infused with a mild bitterness. Don't we see the results it can produce over there? That's right, too. Thor was so much in sympathy with this point of view that he hardly knew how to go on. And yet, some of us doctors are beginning to suspect that there may be a power in Christianity, a, a purely psychological power, you understand, that hasn't been used for what it's worth. Fay nodded. He'd been following this current of contemporary thought. Yes, Dr. Thor, so I hear. Just as I dare say, you haven't found out all the uses of opium. Well, opium is good in its place, you know. I suppose so. He lifted his starry eyes with their mystic visionary rapture fully on the young physician. And yet I remember how George Eliot prayed that when her troubles came she might get along without being drugged by that stuff, uh, meaning the Christian religion, sir. And I guess I kind of like that me and mine should do the same. Thor dropped the subject and went his way. As far as he had opinions of his own, they would have been similar to Fay's, had he not, within a year or two, heard of sufficiently authenticated cases in which sick spirits or disordered nerves had yielded to spiritual counsels after the doctor had had no success. He had been so little impressed with these instances that he might not have allowed his speculations with regard to Mrs. Fay to go beyond the fleeting thought, only for the fact that on passing through the square he met Reuben Hillary. In general, he was content to touch his hat to the old gentleman and go on. But today, urged by an impulse too vague to take an accurate account of, he stopped with respectful greetings. "'I've just been to see an old parishioner of yours, sir,' he said, when the preliminaries of neighbourly conversation had received their due. "'Have you now?' was the non-committal response, delivered with a North of Ireland intonation. Uh, "'Mrs. Fay, wife of Fay the gardener,' "'I can't say she's ill,' Thor went on, feeling his way. "'But she's mentally upset.' He decided to plunge into the subject boldly, smiling with that mingling of frankness and perplexity which people found appealing because of its conscientiousness. "'And I've been wondering, Dr. Henry, if you couldn't help her.' "'Have you now? And what would you be wanting me to do?' 
Thor reflected as to the exact line to take, while the kindly eyes covered him with their shrewd, humorous twinkle. "'You see,' Thor tried to explain, "'that if she could get the idea that there's any other stand to take towards trouble than that of kicking against it, she might be in a fair way to get better. At present she's like a prisoner who dashes his head against the stone wall, not seeing that there's a window by which he might make his escape.' There was renewed twinkling in the merry eyes. "'But if there's a window, why don't you point it out to her?' Thor grinned. "'Because, sir, I don't see it myself.' "'Don't you, then? And how do you know it's there?' Thor continued to grin. "'To be frank with you, sir, I don't believe it is there. But if you can make her believe it is—' "'That is, you want me to deceive the poor creature?' "'Oh, no, sir,' Thor protested. You wouldn't be deceiving her because you do believe it. So that I'd only be deceiving her to the extent that I'm deceiving myself. You're too many for me, Thor laughed again, preparing to move on. I didn't know but that if you gave her what are called the consolations of religion, that's the right phrase, isn't it? There is such a phrase. But you can't give people the consolations of religion. they got to find them for themselves. If they won't do that, there's no power in heaven or earth that can force consolation upon them. But religion undertakes to do something, doesn't it? The old man shook his head. Nothing whatever. No more than air undertakes that you shall breathe it, or water that you shall drink it, or fire that you should warm yourself at its blaze. Thor mused. When he spoke, it was as if summing up the preceding remarks. "'So that you can't do anything, sir, for my friend Mrs. Fay?' "'Nothing whatever, me dear Thor, but help her to do something for herself.' "'Very well, sir. Will you try that?' "'Sure, I'll try it. I'm too proud of the word of God to thrust it where it isn't wanted. Margarita's antiparochos, if you're lucky enough for that. But when anyone asks for it as earnestly as you, me dear Thor?' Having won what he asked, Thor shook the old man's hand and thanked him, after which he hurried off to the garage to take out his runabout and bring Lois's father home from town. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 9 as November and December passed and the new year came in, small happenings began to remind Thorley Masterman that he was soon to inherit money. It was a fact which he himself could scarcely credit. Perhaps because he was not imaginative, the condition of being thirty years of age continued to seem remote even when he was within six weeks of that goal. He was first impressed with the rapidity of his approach to it on a morning when he came late to breakfast, finding at his plate a long envelope, bearing in its upper left-hand corner the request that in the event of non-delivery it should be returned to the office of Darling and Darling at 27 Commonwealth Row. A glance, which he couldn't help reading, passed round the table as he took it up. It was not new to him that among the other members of the household, closely as they were united, there was a sense of vague injustice because he was coming into money and they were not. The communication was brief, stating no more than the fact that in view of the transfer of the estate which would take place a few weeks later, Mr. William Darling, the sole trustee, would be glad to see the heir on a day in the near future to submit to him the list of investments and other properties that were to make up his inheritance. Thor saw his grandfather's money, so long a fairy prospect, as likely to become a matter of solid cash. The change in his position would be considerable. As yet, however, his position remained that of a son in his father's family, and, in obedience to what he knew was expected of him, he read the note aloud. Though there was an absence of comment, his stepmother, in passing him his doctor, murmured caressingly, "'Dear old Thor!' "'Dear old Thor!' Claude mimicked. "'Will soon be able to do everything he pleases.' Mrs. Masterman smiled. It was her mission to conciliate. "'And what will that be?' "'I know what it won't be.' Claude said scornfully. It won't be anything that has to do with a pretty girl. Thor flushed. It was one of the minutes at which Claude's taunts gave him all he could do to contain himself. 
As far as his younger brother was concerned, he meant well by him. It had always been his intention that his first use of Grandpa Thorley's money should be in supplementing Claude's meagre personal resources and helping him to keep on his feet. He could be patient with him, too, patient under all sorts of stinging jibes and double-edged compliments, patient for weeks, for months, patient right up to the minute when something touched him too keenly on the quick, and his wrath broke out with a fury he knew to be dangerous. It was so dangerous as to make him afraid, afraid for Claude, and more afraid for himself. There had been youthful quarrels between them from which he had come away pale with terror, not on what he had done, but at what he might have done had he not maintained some measure of self-control. The memory of such occasions kept him quiet now, though the irony of Claude's speech cut so much deeper than any one could suspect. "'Won't be anything that has to do with a pretty girl. Good God! When he was beginning to feel his soul rent in the struggle between love and honour, it was like something sprung on him that had caught him unawares.' There were days when the suffering was so keen that he wondered if there was no way of lawfully giving in. After all, he never asked Lois Willoughby to marry him. There had never been more between them than an unspoken intention in his mind which had somehow communicated itself to hers. But that was not a pledge. If he were to marry someone else, she couldn't reproach him by so much as a syllable. It was not often that he was tempted to reason thus but Claude's sarcasm brought up the question more squarely than it had ever raised itself before. It was exactly the sort of subject on which, had it concerned anyone else, Thor would have turned for light to Lois herself. In being debarred from her counsels, he felt strangely at a loss. While he said to himself that after all these years there was but one thing for him to do, he was curious as to the view other people might take of such a situation. It was because of this need and with Claude's sneer ringing in his heart, that later in the day he sprang the question on dear love. Dear love was the derelict English butler whom Thor had picked out of the gutter and put in charge of his office so that he might have another chance. He had been summoned into his master's presence to explain the subsidence and the contents of a bottle of cognac that Thor kept at the office for emergency cases and had neglected to put under lock and key. "'That was a full bottle a month ago,' Thor declared, holding the accusing object up to the light. "'Was it, sir?' dear love asked dismally. He stood in his habitual attitude, his arms crossed on his stomach, his hands thrust monk-like into his sleeves. "'And I've only taken one glass out of it, the day that young fellow fell off his bicycle.' Dear love eyed the bottle piteously. "'Haven't you, sir? Perhaps you took more out that day than you thought.' but Thor broke in with what was really on his mind. "'Look here, dear love, what would you say to a man who is in love with one woman if he married another?' Dear love was so astonished as to be for a minute at a loss for speech. "'What did I say to him, sir? I say, what did he do it for? If it was—' "'Yes, dear love,' Thor encouraged. "'If it was f for what?' "'Well, sir, if he got money with her, like, well, that'd be one thing.' "'But if he didn't, if it was a case in which money didn't matter?' "'Dear Love shook his head. "'I never heard of no such case as that, sir.' "'Thor grew interested in the sheerly human aspects of the subject. "'Romance was so novel to him that he wondered if everyone came under its spell at some time, "'if there was no exception, not even Dear Love. "'He leaned across his desk, his hands clasped upon it. "'Now, Dear Love, suppose it was your own case, and—' "'Oh, me, sir, I'm no example to no one, "'not with Brightstone hanging on to me the way she does. "'I can't look friendly at so much as a kitten without Brightstone. "'Now here's the situation, dear love,' Thor interrupted, "'while the ex-butler listened, his head judicially inclined to one side. "'Suppose a man, a, a patient of mine, let us say, "'meant to marry one young lady, and let her see it. "'And suppose later he fell very much in love with another young lady.' "'He'd have to ease the first one off a bit, wouldn't he, sir?' "'You think he ought to?' "'I think he'd have to, sir, unless he wanted to be sued for breach.' "'It's the question of duty I'm thinking of, dear love.' "'Ain't it his duty to marry the one he's in love with, sir? "'Doesn't the good book say as our falling in love?' "'Dear love blushed becomingly. "'As our falling in love is the way God Almighty means to fertilise the earth with people?' "'Doesn't the good book say that, sir?' 
Perhaps it does. I believe it's the kind of primitive subject it's likely to take up. So that there's that to be thought of, sir. They say the children not born of love matches ain't always strong. He added, as he shuffled towards the door, We never had no little ones, Brightstone and me. Only a very small one that died a few hours after it was born. Thor was not convinced by this reasoning, but he was happier than before. Such expressions of opinion, which would probably be endorsed by nine people out of ten, assured him that he might follow the urging of his heart, and yet not be a dastard. He fell on stronger ground, therefore, when he talked with Fay one afternoon in the following week. "'Suppose my father doesn't renew the lease. What would happen to you?' Fay raised himself from the act of doing something to a head of lettuce which was unfolding its petals like a great green rose. His eyes had the visionary look that marked his inability to come down to the practical. "'Well, sir, I don't rightly know. But you've thought of it, haven't you?' "'Not exactly thought of it. He said he wouldn't two or three times already, and then changed his mind. "'Would it do you any good if he did? Aren't you fighting a losing battle, anyhow?' "'That's not wholly the way I judge, Dr. Thor. Neither the losing battle nor the winning one can be told from the balance sheet.' The success or failure of a man's work is chiefly in himself. Thor studied this, gazing down the level of soft verdure to the end of the greenhouse in which they stood. I can see how that might be in one way, but it's the way I mostly think of, sir. Every man has his own habit of mind, hasn't he? I agree with the great prophet Thomas Carlyle when he says, he brought out the words with a mild pomposity, when he says that a certain inarticulate self-consciousness dwells in us which only our works can render articulate. He speaks of the folly of the precept, Know thyself, till we've made it know what thou canst to work at. I can work at this, Dr. Thor. I couldn't work at anything else. I know that making both ends meet is an important part of it, of course. But to you it isn't the most important part of it. Fay's eyes wandered to the other greenhouse, in which lettuce grew, to the hothouse full of flowers, and out over the forcing beds of violets. No, Dr. Thor, not the most important part of it to me. I've created all this. I love it. It's my life. It's myself. And if... And if my father doesn't renew the lease? Then I shall be done for. It won't be just going bankrupt in the money sense. It'll be everything else. Blasted he subjoined dreamily. I don't know what would happen to me after that. I'd be I'd be equal to committing crimes. Thor couldn't remember ever having seen tears on an elderly man's cheeks before. He took a turn down half the length of the greenhouse, and back again. Look here, Fay, he said in the tone of one making a resolution. Supposing my father would give me a lease of the place. You, Dr. Thor? Yes, me. Would you work it for me? Fay reflected long, while Thor watched the play of light and shadow over the mild, mobile face. "'It wouldn't be my own place any more, would it, sir?' "'No, I suppose it wouldn't, not strictly. But it would be the next best thing. It would be better than—' "'It would be better than being turned out.' He reflected further. "'Was you thinking of taking it over as an investment, sir?' Not having considered this side of his idea— Thor sought for a natural, spontaneous answer, and was not long in finding one. I wanted to be identified with the village industries, because I'm going into politics. Who are you, sir? I didn't know you was that way inclined. I'm not, Thor explained, when they moved from the greenhouse into the yard. I only feel that we people of the old stock hang out of politics too much, and that I ought to pitch in and make one more. So you get my idea, Fay. It'll give me standing to pot a bit of property like this, even if it's only on lease. There was no need for further explanations. Fay consented, not cheerfully, but with a certain saddened and yet grateful resignation, of which the expression was cut short by a cheery ringing voice from the gateway. Hello, Mr. Fay. Hello, Dr. Thor. Wah, Maud, wah. Stand with you. What are you thinking of? The response to this greeting came from both men simultaneously, each making it according to his capacity for heartiness. "'Hello, Jim!' They emphasised the welcome 
by unconsciously advancing to meet the tall, stalwart young Irishman of the third generation on American soil, who came toward them with a long, loose limbs and swinging stride, inherited from an ancestry bred to tramping the hills of Connemara. A pair of twinkling eyes, and a mouth that was always on the point of breaking into a smile when it was not actually smiling, tempered the peasant shrewdness of a face that got further softening, and a touch of superiority, from a carefully tended young moustache. Thor and Jim Breen had been on friendly terms ever since they were boys, but the case was not exceptional, since the latter was on similar terms with everyone in the village. From childhood upward he had been a local character, chiefly because of a breezy self-respect that was as free from self-consciousness as from self-importance. There was no one to whom he wasn't polite, but there had never been any one of whom he was afraid. "'Hello, Mr. Marston. "'Hello, Dr. Hillary. "'Hello, Father Ryan. "'Hello, Dr. Sim,' had been his form of greeting, ever since he had begun swaggering around the village, with head up and face alert, at the age of five. No one had ever been found to resent this cheerful familiarity, not even Archie Masterman. As a man in whom friendliness was a primary instinct, Jim Breen never entered a trolley car, nor turned a street corner, without speaking or nodding to everyone he knew. Never did he visit a neighbouring town without calling on, or calling up, everyone he could claim as an acquaintance. He was always on hand for fires, for fights, for fallen horses, for first aid in accidents, for ball games, for the outings of Boy Scouts, and for village theatricals and dances. There were rumours that he was sometimes wild, but the wildness being confined to his incursions into the city, which generally took place after dark, it was not sufficiently in evidence to shock the home community. It was a matter of common knowledge that he used, in village phrase, to go with Rosie Fay. The breaking of the friendship being attributed by some of the well-informed to his reported wildness, and by others to differences in religion. As Thor had been absent in Europe during this episode, and was without the native suspicion that would have connected the two names, he took Jim's arrival pleasantly. Having finished his bit of business, which concerned an order for azaleas too large for his father to meet, and in which Mr. Fay might find it to his advantage to combine, Jim turned blithely towards Thor. "'Hear about the town meeting, Dr. Thor. What old Billy Taylor said about the new bridge. What do you think of that for nerve? Tell you what, there's some things in this town need clearing up.' The statement bringing out Thor's own intention to run as a candidate for office at the next election, Jim expressed his interest in the vernacular of the hour. "'What do you know about that?' Further discussion of politics, ending in Jim's pledging his support to his boyhood's friend, Thor shook hands with an encouraging sense of being embarked on a public career, and went forward to visit his patient in the house. His steps were arrested, however, by hearing Jim say, with casual light-heartedness, "'Rosy anywhere about, Mr. Fay?' The old man having nodded in the direction of the hothouse, Jim advanced almost to the door, where Thor, on looking over his shoulder, saw him pause. It was a curious pause for one so self-confident as the young Irishman, a pause like that of a man grown suddenly doubtful, timid, distrustful. His hand was actually on the latch, when, to Thor's surprise, he wheeled away, returning to his team, with head bent and stride slackened thoughtfully. By the time he had mounted the wagon, however, and begun to tug at Maud, he was whistling the popular air of the moment, with no more than a subdued note in his gaiety. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 10. But Thor was pleased with the idea that his father could scarcely refuse him the lease. He would, in fact, make it worth his while not to do so. Rosie Fay and those who belonged to her might, therefore, feel solid ground beneath their feet and go on working, and, if need were, suffering without the intolerable dread of eviction. It would be a satisfaction to him to accomplish this much, whatever the dictates of honour might oblige him to forego. He felt, too, that he was getting his reward, when, after Jim's departure, Rosie nodded through the glass of the hothouse, giving him what might almost be taken for a smile. He forbore to go to her at once, keeping that pleasure for the end of his visit. 
After seeing his patient, there were generally small directions to give the daughter which afforded pretext for lingering in her company. His patient was getting better, not through ministrations of his own, but through some mysterious influence exerted by Reuben Hillary. As a man of science and a sceptic, Thor was slightly impatient of this aid, even though he himself had invoked it. He was halfway up the stairs on his way to the bedroom in the mansard roof, when, on hearing a man's voice, he paused. The voice was saying, with the inflection in which there was no more than a hint of the brogue, "'Now there's what we were talking of the last time I was here. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye believe in God, believe also in me.' There's the two great plagues of human existence, fear and trouble, staggered for you at a blow. And you do believe in God now, don't you? Thor had turned to tiptoe down again when he heard the words, spoken in the rebellious tones with which he was familiar, modulated now to an odd submissiveness. I don't know whether I do or not. Isn't there something in the Bible about, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief? There he is, and it's a good way to begin. Thor was out in the yard before he could hear more. Standing for a minute in the windy sunshine, he wondered at the curious phenomenon presented by men in evident possession of their faculties, who relied for the dispersion of human care on means invisible and mystic. The fact that in this case he himself had appealed to the illusion rendered the working of it none the less astonishing. His own method for the dispersion of human care, and the project was dear to him, was by dollars and cents. It was, moreover, a method as to which there was no trouble in proving the efficiency. He took up the subject of her mother with Rosie, who, with the help of Antonio, was rearranging the masses of azaleas, carnations and poinsettias after the depletion of the Christmas sales. "'She's really better, isn't she?' Rosie pushed a white azalea to the place on the stand that would best display its dome-like regularity. "'She seems to be.' "'What do you think has helped her?' She gave him a queer little sidelong smile. You're the doctor. I should think you'd know. He adored those smiles, constrained, unwilling, distrustful smiles, the varied, the occasional earnest looks that he got from her green eyes. Oh, but I don't know. It isn't anything I do for her. She banked two or three azaleas together, so that their shades of pink and pomegranate red might blend. I suppose it's Dr. Hillary. I know it's Dr. Hillary, but he isn't working by magic. If she's getting back her nerve, it isn't because he wishes it on her, as the boys say. Suspecting all his approaches, she confined herself to saying, I'm sure I don't know, speaking like a guilty witness under cross-examination. The assiduity of his visits, the persistency with which he tried to make her talk, kept her the more carefully on her guard against betraying anything unwarily. But to him the reserve was an added charm. He called it shyness, or coyness, or maidenly timidity, according to the circumstance that called it forth. But whatever it was, this apathy to his passionate dumb-show piqued him to a frenzy infused with an element of homage. Any other girl in her situation would have come halfway at least toward a man in his. His training having rendered him analytical of the physical side of things, he endeavoured, more or less unsuccessfully, to account for the extraordinary transformation in himself, whereby every nerve in his body yearned and strained toward this hard, proud little creature, who, too evidently, as yet at any rate, refused to take him into account. She made him feel like a man signalling in the dark, or speaking across a vacuum through which his voice couldn't carry, while he was conscious at the same time of searchings of heart and making the attempts to do either. He was beset by these scruples, when, after taking his runabout from the garage in order to go to town, he met Lois Willoughby in the square. On the instant he remembered dear love's counsel of a few days earlier. He'd have to ease the first one off a bit. Whatever was to be his ultimate decision, the wisdom of this course was incontestable. As she paused, smiling, expecting him to stop, he lifted his hat and drove onward. Perhaps it was only his imagination that caught in her great, velvety brown eyes an expression of surprise and pain. But whether his sight was accurate or not, the memory of the moment smote him. The process of easing the first one off would probably prove difficult. I shall have to explain to her that I was in a hurry, 
he said to comfort himself, as he flew onward to the town. The explanation would have been not untrue, since he was already overdue at his appointment with Mr. William Darling, his grandfather's executor. It was the second of the meetings arranged for giving him a general idea of the estate he was coming into. At the first he had gone over the lists of stocks, mortgages and bonds. Today, with a map of the city and the surrounding country spread out, partially on his desk and partially over Mr. Darling's knees as he tilted back in a revolving chair, Thor learned the location of certain bits of landed property which his grandfather, twenty or thirty years before, had considered good investments. The astuteness of this ancestral foresight was illustrated by the fact that Thor was a richer man than he had supposed. One who could possess no enormous wealth, according to the newer standards of the day, he would have something between thirty and forty thousand dollars of yearly income. And that, Mr. Darling explained with pride, at a very conservative rate of investment. You could easily have more, but if you take my advice, you'll not be in a hurry to look for more till you need it. I, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. You surely understand that. Thor was not sure that he did understand it. He was not sure, and yet he hesitated to ask for the elucidation of what was intended, perhaps, to remain cryptic. In a small chair drawn up beside Mr. Darling's revolving seat of authority, his elbow on his knee, his chin supported by his fist, he studied the map. "'I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings,' the lawyer declared again, I "'either before or after the fact.' This time an intention of some sort was so evident that Thor felt obliged to say, "'Do you mean anyone in particular, sir?' The trustee threw the map from off his knees, and, rising, walked to the window. He was a small, neat, sharp-eyed man of fresh, frosty complexion, his exquisite clothes making him something of a dandy, while his manner of turning his head, with quick little jerks and perks, reminded one of a bird. At the window he stood with his hands behind his back, looking over the jumble of nineteenth-century roofs, out of which an occasional skyscraper shot like a tower, to where a fringe of masts and funnels edged the bay. He spoke without turning round. "'I don't mean anyone in particular, unless there should be anyone in particular to mean.' With this oracular explanation, Thor was forced to be content, and as the purpose of the meeting seemed to have been accomplished, he rose to take his leave. Mr. Darling was quick in showing himself not only faithful as a trustee, but cordial as a man of the world. "'My, my wife would like you to come and see her,' he said, in shaking hands. She asked me to say, too, that she hopes you and your brother will come to the dance she's going to give for Elsie in the course of a month or two. You'll get your cards in time. Warmly expressing the pleasure this entertainment would give him, while knowing in his heart that he wouldn't attend it, the young man took his departure. But no later than that evening he began to perceive why the oracle had spoken. Claude, having excused himself from dressing for dinner on the ground of another mysterious engagement with Billy Cheever, and Mrs. Masterman having retired upstairs, Thor was alone in the library with his father. It was a mellow room in which the bindings of long rows of books, mostly purchased by Grandpa Thorley in sets, an admirable white marble chimney-piece in a Georgian style, and a few English eighteenth-century prints added by Archie Masterman himself, disguised the heavy architectural tastes of the sixties. Grandpa Thorley had built the house at the close of the Civil War, the end of that struggle having found him, for reasons he was never eager to explain, a far richer man than its beginning. He had built the house not on his own old farm, which was already been absorbed into the suburban portion of the city, but on a ten-acre plot in County Street, which, with its rich bordering fields, its overarching elms and its lofty sites, was revealing itself even then as the predestined quarter of the wealthy. So long as there had been no wealthy, County Street had been only a village highway, but the social developments following on the Civil War had required a Faubourg Saint-Germain. In this house Miss Louisa Thorley had grown up and been wooed by Archie Masterman. It had been the wooing of a very plain girl by a good-looking lad, and had received a shock when Grandpa Thorley suspected other motives than love to account for the young man's ardour. Her suitor being forbidden the house, Miss Thorley had no resource but to meet him in the city, on the 7th of March, 1880, 
and to go with him to a convenient parsonage. Thor was born on the 10th of February of the year following. Two days later, the young mother died. Grandpa Thor himself held out for another ten years. When his will revealed the fact that he had taken every precaution to keep Archie Masterman from profiting by a penny of the Thorley money, so strict were the provisions of this document that on the father was thrown the entire cost of bringing up and educating Louisa Thorley's son. But Archie Masterman was patient. He took a lease of the Thorley house when Darling and Darling, as executors, put it in the market, and paid all the rent it was worth. Moreover, there had never been a moment in Thor's life when he had been made to feel that his maintenance was a burden unjustly thrown on one who could ill afford to bear it. For this consideration, the son had been grateful ever since he knew its character, and was now eager to make a due return. For the minute, he was moving restlessly about the room, not knowing what to say. From the way in which his father, who was comfortably stretched in an armchair before the fire, dropped the evening paper to the floor while he puffed silently at his cigar, Thor knew that he was expected to give some account of the interview between himself and the trustee that afternoon. Any father might reasonably look for such a confidence, while the conditions of affectionate intimacy in which the Masterman family lived made it a matter of course. The sun was still marching up and down the room, smoking cigarettes rapidly and throwing the butts into the fire, when he completed his summary of the information received in his two meetings with the executor. The father had neither interrupted nor asked questions, but he spoke at last. "'What did you say was the approximate value of the whole estate?' Thor told him. "'And of the income?' Thor repeated that also. "'Criminal!' Thor stopped dead for an instant, but resumed his march. He had stopped in surprise, but he went on again so as to give the impression of not having heard the last observation. "'It's criminal,' the father explained, with repressed indignation, "'that money should bring in so trifling a return.' "'He said it was very conservatively invested. "'It's damned idiotically invested. "'Such incompetence deserves an even stronger term. "'If my own money didn't earn more for me than that, "'well, I'm afraid you wouldn't have seen Vienna and Berlin.' The remark gave Thor an opening he was glad to seize. "'I know that, father. I know how much you've spent for me, and how generous you've always been, with Claude to provide for too. And now that I've had enough of my own, I want to repay you every—' "'Don't hurt me, boy. You surely don't think I'd take compensation for bringing up my own son. It's not in the least what I'm driving at. I simply mean that now that the whole thing is coming to your own hands, you'll probably want to do better with it than has been done heretofore.' Thor said nothing. There was a long silence before his father went on. "'Even if you didn't want me to have anything to do with it, I could put you in touch with people who'd give you excellent advice.' Thor paced softly, as if afraid to make his footfalls heard. Something within him seemed frozen, paralysed. He was incapable of a response. "'Of course,' the father continued, gently with his engaging lisp, "'I can quite understand that you shouldn't want me to have anything to do with it.' The new generation is often distrustful of the old. Thor beat his brains for something to say that would meet the courtesies of the occasion without committing him. But his whole being had grown dumb. He would have been less humiliated if his father had pleaded with him outright. And yet I haven't done so badly, Masterman continued, with pathos in his voice. I have very little to begin with. When I first went into old Two Goods' office, I had nothing at all. I made my way by thrift, foresight, and integrity. I think I can say as much as that. Your grandfather thought it was unjust to me, but I've never resented it, not by a syllable. It was a relief to Thor to be able to say with some heartiness, I know that, father. Not that I didn't have some difficult situations to face on account of it. When the two good executors withdrew the old man's money, it would have gone hard with me if I hadn't been able to... to... Thor paused in his walk, waiting for what was coming. "'If I hadn't been able to command confidence in other directions,' the father finished quietly. Thor hastened to divert the conversation from his own affairs. Uh, "'Mr. Willoughby put his money in then, didn't he?' "'That was one thing,' Master admitted coldly. Thor could speak the more daringly, because his march up and down kept him behind his father's back. 
"'And now, I understand, you think of dropping him?' "'I shouldn't be dropping him. That's not the way to put it. He drops himself, automatically.' The clock on the mantelpiece ticked a few times before he added, "'I can't go on supporting him.' "'Do you mean that he's used up all the capital he put in?' Ah, "'That's what it comes to. He's spent enormous sums. At times he's been near to crippling me. But I can't keep it up. He's got to go. Besides, the big drunken oafers are disgraced me. I can't afford to be associated with him any longer.' Thor came round to the fireplace, where he stood on the hearth-rug, his arm on the mantelpiece. "'But, Father, what'll he do?' "'Surely that's his own lookout. Bessie's got money still. I don't get all of it, by any means.' "'No, but if you've got most of it—' Masterman shot out of his seat. "'Take care, Thor. I object to your way of expressing yourself. It's offensive.' "'I only mean, Father, that if Mr. Willoughby saved the business—' "'He didn't do anything of the kind,' Masterman said sharply. "'No one knows better than he that I never wanted him at all.' "'But Thor ventured to speak up. "'Didn't you tell Mother one night in Paris, when we were there in 1892, "'that his money might as well come to you as go to the deuce? "'Mother said she hated business and didn't want to have anything to do with it. "'She hoped you'd let the Willoughbys and their mother alone. "'Didn't that happen, father?' "'If Thor was expecting his father to blanch and betray a guilty mind,' He was both disappointed and relieved. "'Possibly. I have no recollection. I was looking for someone to enter the business. He wasn't my ideal, the Lord knows. Yet I might have said something about it, carelessly. Why do you ask?' The son tried to infuse his words with a special intensity, as, looking straight into his father's eyes, he said, "'Because I—I I remember the way things happened at the time.' "'Indeed.' "'May I ask what your memories lead you to infer? "'They've clearly led you to infer something.' "'During the seconds in which father and son scrutinised each other, "'Thor felt himself backing down with a sort of spiritual cowardice. "'He didn't want to accuse his father. "'He shrank from the knowledge that would have justified him in doing so. "'To express himself with as little stress as possible, he said, "'They lead me to infer that we've some moral responsibility toward Mr. Willoughby.' "'Really? That's very interesting. "'Now I should have said that if I've ever had any, I'd richly worked it off.' "'It was perhaps to glide away from the points already raised that he asked, "'Aren't you a little hasty in looking for moral responsibility? "'Let me see. Who was it the last time? Old Fay, wasn't it?' "'Thor flushed, but he accepted the diversion. "'He even welcomed it. "'Such glimpses as he got of his father's mind appalled him. For the present, at any rate, he would force no issue that would verify his suspicions and compel him to act upon them. Better the doubt. Better to believe that Willoughby had been a spendthrift. He would have no difficulty as to that, had it not been for those dogging memories of the little hotel in the Rue de Rivoli. Besides, as he said to himself, he had his own axe to grind. He endeavoured, therefore, to take the reference to Frey jocosely. "'That reminds me,' he smiled, though the smile might have been a trifle nervous, that if you don't want to renew Fay's lease when it falls in, I wish you'd make it over to me. Disconcerted by the look of amazement his words called up, he hastened to add, I, I take it on any terms you please. You've only got to name them. Masterman backed away to the large oblong library table strewn with papers and magazines. He seemed to need it for support. His tones were those of a man amazed to the point of awe. "'What in the name of heaven do you want that for?' "'Thor steadied his nerve by lighting a cigarette. "'To give me a footing in the village. "'I'm going into politics.' "'Oh, Lord!' "'Thor hurried on. "'Yes, I, I know how you feel, but to me it seems a duty.' "'Seems a what?' "'The son felt obliged to be apologetic. "'You see, father, so few men of the old American stock "'are going into politics nowadays.' "'Well, why should they? "'The country has to be governed. "'Lots of fools to do that who are no good at anything else. "'Why should you dirty your hands with it?' "'That isn't the way I look at it. "'It's the way you will look at it "'when you know a little more about it than you evidently do now. "'Of course, with your money, "'you'll have a right to fritter away your time in anything you please. "'But as your father, "'I feel that I ought to give you a word of warning. 
You wouldn't be a masterman if you didn't need it, on that score. What score? The score of being caught by every humbugging socialistic scheme. I'm not a socialist, father. Well, what are you? I thought you were. I'm not now. I've passed that phase. That's something to the good, at any rate. With politics in this country as they are, and so many alien peoples to be licked into shape, it's no use looking for the state to undertake anything progressive for another two hundred years. Ha! Want something more rapid firing? Want something immediate? And you found it? Only in the conviction that whatever's to be done must be done by the individual. I've no theories any longer. I've finished with them all. I'm driven back on the conclusion that if anything is to be accomplished in the way of social betterment, it must be by the man-to-man process in one's own small sphere. If we could get that put into practice on a considerable scale, we should do more than the State will be able to carry out for centuries to come. Put what into practice? The principle that no man shall let a friend or a neighbour suffer without relief when he can relieve him. Thor, you should have been God. I don't know anything about God, father. But if I were to create a God, I should make that his first commandment. Masterman squared himself in front of his son. So that's behind this scheme of yours for taking over Fay's lease. You're trying to trick me into doing what you know I won't do of my own accord. What could you do with the lease but make a present of it to old Fay? Politics be hanged. Come now, be frank with me. Thor threw back his head. I can't be wholly frank with you, father, but I'll be as frank as I can. I do want to help the poor old chap. You'd be sorry for him if you'd been seeing him as I have, but that was only one of my motives. Leaving politics out of the question, I have others, but I don't want to speak of them yet. Probably I shall never need to speak of them at all. Thor was willing that his father should say, It's the girl but he contented himself with a curt statement. "'I'm sorry, Thor, but you can't have the lease. I'm going to sell the place.' "'But, father,' the young man cried, "'what's to become of Fay?' "'Isn't that what you asked me just now about Lynn Willoughby? "'Who do you think I am, Thor? "'Am I in this world to carry every lame dog on my back?' "'It isn't a question of every lame dog, "'but of an old tenant and an old friend, "'toward whom I have what you have pleased to call a moral responsibility.' Is that it? That's it, father, put mildly. Well, I don't admit your moral responsibility, and what's more, I'm not going to bear it. Do you understand? Thor felt himself growing white, with the whiteness that attended one of his surging waves of wrath. He clenched his fists. He drew away, but he couldn't keep himself from saying, quietly, with a voice that shook because of his very effort to keep it firm, All right, father, if you don't bear it, I will. He was moving toward the door when Archie called after him, Thor, for God's sake, don't be a fool! He answered from the threshold over his shoulder, It's no use asking me not to do as I've said, father, because I can't help it. He was in the hall when he added, And if I could, I shouldn't try. End of chapter 10《チャプター11》of《The Side of the Angels》by Basil King。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers。Chapter 11 By the time his anger had cooled down, Thor regretted the words with which he had left his father's presence, and continued to regret them. They were braggart and useless. Whatever he might feel impelled to do, for either Leonard Willoughby or Jasper Fay, he could do better without announcing his intentions beforehand. He experienced a sense of guilt when, on the next day, and for many days afterward, his father showed by his manner that he had been wounded. Lois Willoughby showed that she, too, had been wounded. The process of easing the first one off, besides affording him sidelights on a woman's heart, involved him in an erratic course of blowing hot and cold that defeated his own ends. When he blew cold, the chill was such that he blew hotter than ever to disperse it. He could see for himself that this seeming capriciousness made it difficult for Lois to preserve the equal tenor of her bearing, though she did her best. 
he had kept away from her for a week or more, and would have continued to do so longer, had he not been haunted by the look his imagination conjured up in her eyes. He knew its trouble, its bewilderment, its reflected heartache. "'I'm a damned cad,' he said to himself, and whenever he worked himself up to that point, remorse couldn't send him quick enough to pay her a visit of atonement. He knew she was at home because he met one or two of the county street ladies coming away from the house. With knowing looks they told him he should find her. They did not, however, tell him that she had another visitor, whose voice he recognised while depositing his hat and overcoat on one of the regency chairs in the tapestried square hall. "'Oh, don't go yet,' Lois was saying. "'Here's Dr. Thor Masterman. He'll want to see you.' But Rosie insisted on taking her departure, making polite excuses for the length of her call. She was deliciously pretty. He saw that at once on entering. Wearing the new winter suit for which she had pinched and saved, and a hat of the moment's fashion, she easily dazzled Thor, though Lois could perceive in details of material the cheapness that in American eyes is the most damning of all qualities. Rosie's face was bright with the flush of social triumph, for the county street ladies had been kind to her, and she had had tea with all the ceremony of which she read in the accredited annals of good society. If she had not been wondering whether or not the county street ladies knew her brother was in jail, she could have suppressed all other causes for anxiety and given herself freely to the hour's bliss. But she would not be persuaded to remain, taking her leave with a full command of graceful niceties. Thor could hardly believe she was his fairy of the hothouse. She was a princess, a marvel. "'Beats them all,' he said gleefully to himself, referring to the ladies of County Street, and almost including Lois Willoughby. He did not quite include her. He perceived that he couldn't do so, when, after having bowed Rosie to the door, he returned to take his seat in the drawing-room. There was a distinction about Lois, he admitted to himself, that neither prettiness nor fine clothes nor graceful niceties could rival. He wondered if she wasn't even more distinguished since this new something had come into her life. Was it joy or grief? which he himself had brought there. Her greeting to him was of precisely the same shade as all her greetings during the past two months. It was like something rehearsed and executed to perfection. When she had given him his tea and poured another cup for herself, they talked of Rosie. "'Do you know,' she said in a musing tone, "'I think the poor little thing has really enjoyed being here this afternoon.' "'Why shouldn't she?' "'Yes, but why should she?' apart from the very slight novelty of the thing, which to an American girl is no real novelty after all, I don't understand what it is she cares so much about. He weighed the question seriously. She finds a world of certain, what should I say, of certain amenities to which she's equal, anyone can see that, and which she hasn't got. That's something in itself to a girl with imagination. I think she's in love, Lois said suddenly. Thor was startled. "'Oh, no, she isn't. She can't be. Who on earth could she be in love with?' "'Oh, it's not with you. Don't be alarmed,' Lois smiled. It was so like Thor to be shy of a pretty girl. He had been so ever since she could remember him. "'That's good,' he managed to say. He regained control of himself, though he tingled all over. "'It would have to be with me or Dr. Hillary. We're the only two men, except the Italians, who ever appear on the place.' "'Oh, you don't know.' Lois said pensively. "'Girls like that often have what they call, rather picturesquely, a fellow.' "'Oh, don't!' His cry was instantly followed by a nervous laugh. He felt obliged to explain. "'It's so funny to hear you talk like that. It doesn't go with your style.' She took this pleasantly, and they spoke of other things, but Thor was eager to get away. A real visit of atonement had become impossible.' That must be put off for another day, perhaps for ever. He wasn't sure. He couldn't tell. For the minute his head was in a whirl. He hardly knew what he was saying, except that his rejoinders to Lois's remarks were more or less at random. Vital questions were pounding through his brain and demanding an answer. Who knew but that with regard to Rosie she was right, and yet wrong? Women with their remarkable powers of divination didn't always hit the nail directly on the head— it might be the case with Lois now. She might be right in her surmise that Rosie was in love, and mistaken in those light and cruel words, 
Oh, not with you. He didn't suppose it was with him. And yet? And yet? He got away at last, and tore through the winter twilight toward the old apple orchard above the pond. He knew what he would say. Rosie, are you in love with anyone? If so, for God's sake, tell me. What he would do when she answered him was matter outside his present capacity for thought. It had begun to snow. By the time he reached the house on the hill, his shoulders were white. The necessity for shaking himself in the little entry gave the first prosaic chill to his ardour. Rosie had returned and was preparing supper. The princess and Marvel had resolved herself again into the fairy of the hothouse. Not that Thor minded that. What disconcerted him was her dry little manner of surprise. She had not expected him. There was nothing in her mother's condition to demand his call. She herself was busy. She had come from the kitchen to answer the door. A smell of cooking filled the house. No one of these details could have kept him from carrying out his purpose, but together they were unromantic. How could he adjure her to tell him, for God's sake, whether or not she was in love with anyone, when he saw she was afraid that something was burning on the stove? He could only stammer out excuses for having come. Inventing on the spot new and incoherent directions for the treatment of Mrs. Fay, he took himself away again, not without humiliation. Being in a savage mood as he stalked down the hill, he was working himself into a rage when an unexpected occurrence gave him other things to think of. At the foot of the hill, just below the slope of the square, was the terminus of the electric tram line from the city. In summer it was a pretty spot, well shaded by ornamental trees, with a small Gothic church and its parsonage in the centre of a trimly kept lawn. It was prettier still as Thor Masterman approached it, at the close of a winter's day, with the great soft flakes heaping their beauty on roof and shrub and roadway, the whole lit up with plenty of cheerful electricity, and no eye to behold it but his own. Because of this purity and solitude, a black spot was the more conspicuous, and because it was a moving black spot, it caught the onlooker's glance at once. It was a moving black spot, though it remained in one place, on the cement seat that circled a copper beech tree for the convenience of villagers awaiting for the cars. It was extraordinary that anyone should choose this uninviting, snow-covered resting place, unless he couldn't do otherwise. The doctor in Thor was instantly alert, but before advancing many paces he had made his guess. Patients were beginning to take his time, were entering his afternoons less free, and so what might have been expected had happened. Mr. Willoughby had managed to come homeward by the electric car, but was unable to go any farther. Nevertheless, Thor was startled as he crossed the roadway to hear a great choking sob. The big creature was huddled somehow on the seat, but with face and arms turned to the trunk of the tree, against whose cold bark he wept. He wept shamelessly aloud, with broken exclamations of which, "'Oh, my God! Oh, my God!' was all that Thor could hear distinctly. "'It's delirium this time, for sure,' he said to himself, and he laid his hand on the great snow-heaped shoulder. He changed his mind on that score as soon as Mr. Willoughby was able to speak coherently. "'I'm heartbroken, Thor. Haven't touched a thing today, scarcely. But I'm all in.' More sobs followed. It was with difficulty that Thor could get the lumbering body on its feet. "'You mustn't stay here, Mr. Willoughby. You'll catch cold. Come along home with me.' "'I don't want to go home, Thor. Got no home now. Ruined, that's where I am. Ruined. Your father's kicked me out. All my money gone. Not a cent left in the world.' Thor dragged him onward. "'But you must come home just the same, Mr. Willoughby. You can't stay out here. The next car will be along in a minute, and everyone will see you.' "'I don't care who sees me, Thor. I'm ruined.' "'Father says I'll have to go. Got all the papers ready. "'Oh, my God, what'll Bessie say?' "'As they stumbled forward through the snow, Thor tried to learn what had happened. "'Got all my money and then kicked me out,' was the only explanation. "'Not a cent in the world. What'll Bessie say? Oh, what'll Bessie say? "'All her money. Hasn't got a hundred thousand dollars left out of the great big estate. "'Make away with myself. That's what I'll do. Oh, my God!' My God! On arriving in front of the house, 
Thor saw lights in the drawing-room. Lois was probably still there. It was no more than a half-hour since he had left her, and other callers might have succeeded him. He tried to steer his charge round the corner towards the side entrance in Willoughby's Lane. But Len grew querulous. "'I don't want to go in the side door. Go in the front door, hang it all. Father can't turn me out of my own house, the infernal hound!' The door opened, and Lois stood in the oblong of light. "'Oh, what is it?' she cried, peering outward. "'Is it you, Thor? What's the matter?' "'Treat me like a servant,' Willoughby complained, as, with Thor supporting him, he stumbled up the steps. "'I didn't want to go in the side door. Front door good enough for me. No confounded kitchen boy, if I am ruined.' "'Who oh, here, Lois?' he rambled on when he got into the hall, and Thor was helping him to take off his overcoat. Look here, Lois, we haven't got a cent of the world. That's what we haven't got, not a cent of the world. Archie Marston's got my money, and your money, and your mother's money, and the whole damn money of all of us. Keep me out now. No good to him any more. With some difficulty, Thor got him to his room, where he undressed him and put him to bed. On his return to the hall, he found Lois seated in one of the armchairs, her face pale. Oh, Thor, is that what you meant a few weeks ago? He did his best to explain the situation to her gently. "'I don't know just what's happened, but I'm afraid there's trouble ahead.' She nodded. "'Yes, I've been expecting it, and now I suppose it's come.' "'I shouldn't wonder if it had. But you must be brave, Lois, and not think matters worse than they are.' "'Oh, I shan't do that,' she said, with a hint of haughtiness at his solicitude. "'Don't worry about me. I'm quite capable of bearing whatever's to be borne.' "'Please go on.' "'If anything has happened,' he said, speaking from where he stood in the middle of the floor, "'it's that Father wants to dissolve the partnership.' "'I've been looking for that. So has Mamma. "'And if they do dissolve the partnership, I'm afraid— "'I'm afraid there'll be very little money coming to Mr. Willoughby.' "'Whose fault would that be?' "'Frankly, Lois, I don't know. "'It might be that of my father, or of yours.' "'and I shouldn't think you'd want to find out.' "'He looked down at her curiously. "'Why do you say that? Shouldn't you?' "'She seemed to shiver. "'Why should I? If the money's gone, it's gone. "'Whether my father has squandered it, or your father has—' "'She rose and crossed the hall to the stairs, "'where, with a foot on the lowest of the steps, "'she leaned on the pilaster of the balustrade. "'I don't want to know,' she said with energy. If the money's gone, they've shuffled it away between them, and I don't see that it would help either you or me to find out who's to blame. It was a minute at which Thor could easily have brought out the words which for so many years he had supposed he would one day speak to her. His pity was such that it would have been a luxury to tell her to throw all the material part of her care on him. If he could have said that much without saying more, he would have had no hesitation but there was still a chance of the miracle happening with regard to Rosy Fay. Love was love, and sweet. It was first love, and in its way it was young love. It was springtide love. The dew of the morning was on it, and the freshness of sunrise. It was hard to renounce it, even to go to the aid of one whose need of him was so desperate that to hide it she turned her face away. Instead of the words of cheer and rescue that were almost gushing to his lips, he said soberly, "'Has your mother any idea of what's going on?' She began pacing restlessly up and down. "'Oh, she's been worried for the last few weeks. She couldn't help knowing something. Papa's been dropping so many hints that she's been meaning to see your father. I suppose it will be very hard for her.' She paused, confronting him. "'It will be at first, but she'll rise to it. She does that kind of thing. "'You don't know, mother?' Very few people do. She simply adores Papa. It's pathetic. All this time that he's been so... so... She won't recognise it. She won't admit for a second, or let me admit it, that he's anything but tired or ill. It's splendid, and yet there's something about it that almost breaks my heart. Mamma has lots of pluck, you know. You mightn't think it. Oh, I know it. I'm glad you do. People in general see only one side of her, but it's not the only side. She has her weaknesses, I see that well enough. She's terribly a woman, and she can't grow old. But that's not criminal, is it? There's a great deal in her that's never been called on, 
and perhaps this trouble will bring it out. He spoke admiringly. It will bring out a great deal in you. She began again to pace up and down. Oh, me, I'm so useless, I've never been of any help to anyone. Do you know at times latterly I've envied that little rosy fay? Why? Because she's got duties and responsibilities and struggles. She's got something more to do than dress and play tennis and make calls. There are people who depend on her. She's splendid, isn't she? She paused in her restless pacing. She might be. She is, very nearly. Though he had taken the opportunity to get further away from the appeal of her distress, he felt a pang of humiliation in the promptness with which she followed his lead. But he couldn't go on with the discussion. It was too sickening. Every inflection of her voice implied that, with her own need, he had no longer anything to do, that it was all over, that she recognised the fact, that she was trying her utmost to let him off easily. That she should suspect the truth, or connect the change with Rosie Fay, he knew was out of the question. It was not the way in which her mind would work. If she accounted for the situation at all, it would probably be on the ground that, when it came to the point, he had found that he didn't care for her. The promises he had tacitly made, and she had tacitly understood, she was ready to give back. He was quite alive to the fact that her generosity made his impotence the more pitiable. That he should stand tongue-tied and helpless before the woman whom he had allowed to think that she could count on him was galling not only to his manhood, but to all those primary instincts that sent him to the aid of weakness. There was a minute in which it seemed to him that if he did not on the instant redeem his self-respect, it would be lost to him for ever. After all, he did care for her, in a way. There was no woman in the world toward whom he felt an equal degree of reverence. More than that, there was no woman in the world whom he could admit so naturally to share his life, whose life he himself could so naturally share. If Rosie were to marry him, the whole process would be different. In that case, there would be no sharing, there would be nothing but a wild, gypsy joy. His delight would be to heap happiness upon her, content with her acceptance, and the very little which was all he could expect her to give him in return. With Lois Willoughby, it would be equality, partnership, companionship, and a life of mutual comprehension and respect. That would be much, of course. It was what a few months ago he would have thought enough. It was plainly that with which he must manage to be satisfied. He was about to plunge in, to plunge in with one last backward look to the more exquisite joys he must leave behind, and tell her that his strength and loyalty were hers to dispose of as she would have, when she herself unwittingly balked the impulse. It was still to hold open to him the way of escape that she continued to speak of Rosie. If she were to marry some nice fellow like Jim Breen, for instance. Fall bounded. Like who? She was too deeply preoccupied with her own emotions to notice his. He was attentive to her for a long time once. He cried out incredulously. Oh, no, it couldn't be. She's too, too superior. I'm afraid the superiority is just the trouble, though I don't know anything about it beyond the gossip one hears in the village. Anyone who goes to so many of the working people's houses as I do hears it all. He was still incredulous. And you've heard that? I've heard that poor Jim wanted to marry her, and she wouldn't look at him. It's a pity, I think. She'd be a great deal happier in marrying a man with the same kind of ways as herself than she'd be with someone. I can only put it, she added with a rueful smile, in a way you don't like, Thor, than she'd be with someone of another station in life. His heart pounded so that he could hardly trust himself to speak with the necessary coolness. Is there any question of, of any one of another station in life? No, only that if she is in love, and of course I'm only guessing at it, I think it's very likely to be with someone of that kind. The statement, which was thrown out with gentle indifference, affected him so profoundly that had she again declared that it was not with him, he could have taken it with equanimity. With whom else could it be? It wasn't with Antonio, and it wasn't with Dr. Hilary. There was the choice. Were there any other rival, he couldn't help knowing it. He had sometimes suspected—no, it was hard enough for suspicion. 
he had sometimes hoped, but it had been hardly enough for hope. And yet sometimes, when she gave him that dim, sidelong smile, or turned to him with the earnest, wide-open look in her greenish eyes, he thought that possibly, just possibly, he didn't know what answers he made to her further remarks. Her faint memory remained with him of talking incoherently against reason, against sentiment, against time, as, with her velvety regard resting upon him sadly, he swung on his overcoat and hurried to take his leave. End of chapter 11Chapter 12 of The Side of Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 12. He hurried because inwardly he was running away from the figure he had cut. Never had he supposed that in any one's time of need, to say nothing of hers, he could have proved so worthless. And he hurried because he knew a decision one way or the other had become imperative. And he hurried because his failure convinced him that so long as there was a possibility that Rosie cared for him secretly, he would never do anything for Lois Willoughby. Whatever his sentiment toward the woman friend of his youth, he was tied and bound by a stress of a love of which the call was primitive. He might be over-abrupt, he might startle her, but at the worst he should escape from this unbearable state of inactivity. So he hurried. It had stopped snowing, the evening was now fair and cold. As it was nearly six o'clock, his father would probably have come home. He would make him first an offer of new terms, and he would see Rosie afterward. His excitement was such that he knew he could neither eat nor sleep till the questions in his heart were answered. But on reaching his own gate, he was surprised to see Mrs. Willoughby's motor turn in at the driveway and roll up to the door. It was not that there was anything strange in her paying his mother a call, but to-day the circumstances were unusual. Anything might happen. Anything might have happened already. On reaching the door, he let himself in with misgiving. He recognised the visitor's voice at once, but there was a note in it that he had never heard before. It was a plaintive note, and rather childlike. Oh, Ina, what's become of my money? His mother's inflections were as childlike as the others, and as full of distress. How do I know, Bessie? "'Why don't you call Archie?' "'I have asked him. I've just come from there. "'I can't make out anything he says. "'He's been trying to tell me that we've spent it, "'when I know we haven't spent it.' "'There were tears in Edith's voice as she said, "'Well, I can't explain it, Bessie. "'I don't know anything about business.' "'From where he stood with his hand on the knob "'as he closed the door behind him, Thor could see into the huge, old-fashioned, "'gilt-framed mirror over the chimney-piece in the drawing-room.' The two women were standing, separated by a small table which supported an azalea in bloom. His stepmother, in a soft, trailing house-gown, her hands behind her back, seemed taller and slenderer than ever in contrast to Mrs. Willoughby's dumpiness, dwarfed as it was by an enormous muff and encumbering furs. The latter drew herself up indignantly. Her tone changed. "'You do know something about business, Ina?' You know well enough about it to drag Len and me into what we never would have thought of doing if you and Archie hadn't. I? Why, Bessie, you must be crazy. I'm not crazy, though God knows it's enough to make me so. I remember everything as if it had happened this afternoon. There was a faint scintillation in the diamonds in Enid's brooch and earrings as she tossed her head. If you do that, you must recall that I was afraid of it from the first. Bessie was quick to detect the admission. "'Why?' she demanded. "'If you were afraid of it, why were you afraid? "'You weren't afraid without seeing something to be afraid of.' "'Mrs. Masterman nearly wept. "'I don't know anything about business at all, Bessie.' "'Oh, don't tell me that,' Bessie broke in fiercely. "'You knew enough about it to see that Archie wanted our money in 1892.' "'But I hadn't anything to do with it.' "'Hadn't anything to do with it? Then who had? "'Who was it suggested to me that Len should go into business?' "'One evening, in the Hotel de Marson, after dinner. "'Who was that?' "'If I said anything at all, it was that I hated business "'and everything that I had to do with it.' "'Oh, I can understand that well enough,' Bessie exclaimed scornfully. "'You hated it because you saw already that your husband was going to ruin us. "'Come now, Ina, didn't you?' "'Mrs. Masterman protested tearfully. "'I didn't know anything about it. 
I only wish that Archie would let you and your money alone, and I wish it still. Very well, then, Bessie cried, flinging her hands outward dramatically. Isn't that what I'm saying? You knew something, you knew it, and you let us go ahead. You not only let us go ahead, but you led us on. You could see already that Archie was spinning his web like a spider, and that he'd catch us as flies. Now, didn't you? Tell the truth, Ina. Wasn't it into your mind from the first, long before it was in his? I'll say that for Archie, that I don't suppose he really meant to ruin us, while you knew he would. That's the difference between a man and his wife. The man only drifts, but the wife sees years ahead what he's drifting to. You saw it, Ina. When his stepmother bowed her head to sob into her handkerchief, Thor ventured to enter the room. Neither of the women noticed him. "'I must say, Ina,' Bessie continued, "'that seems to me frightful. I don't know what you can be made of that you've lived cheerfully through these last eighteen years when you knew what was coming. If it had been coming to yourself, well, that might be born. But to stand by and watch for it to overtake someone else, someone who has always been your friend, someone you liked, for I do believe you've liked me in your way and my way, that, I must say, is the limit. C'est la passe les bonnes. Now, doesn't it? Mrs. Masterman struggled to speak, but her sobs prevented her. "'In a way, it's funny,' Bessie continued philosophically, "'how bad a good woman can be. "'You're a good woman, Ina, of a kind. "'That is, you're good in as far as you're not bad. "'And I suppose that for a woman that's a very fair average. "'But I can tell you that there are sinners whom the world has scourged to the bone "'who haven't begun to do what you've done during these last eighteen years, "'who wouldn't have had the nerve for it. "'No, Ina,' she continued with another sweeping gesture, "'pon my soul I don't know what you're made of.' I almost think I admire you. I couldn't have done it. I'd be hanged if I could. There are women who've committed murder and who haven't been as cool as you. They've committed murder in a frantic fit of passion that went as quick as it came, and they swung for it or done time for it. But they never have had the pluck to sit and smile and wait for this minute as you waited for it when you saw it from such a long way off. It was the crushed attitude in which his stepmother sank, weeping into a chair, that broke the spell by which Thor had been held paralysed. But before he could speak, Bessie turned and saw him. Oh, so it's you, Thor. Well, I wish you could have come a minute ago to hear what I've been saying. I've heard it, Mrs. Willoughby. Then I'm sure you must agree with me, or rather you would if you knew how things have been managed in Paris eighteen years ago. I've been trying to tell your dear stepmother that we've been mistaken in her. We haven't done her justice. We've thought her as just a sweet and gentle ladylike person, when all the while she's been a heroine. She's been colossal as Clytemnestra was colossal, and Lady Macbeth. She beats them both, for I don't believe either of them could have watched the sword of Damocles taking eighteen years to fall on a friend and not have had nervous prostration, while she's as fresh as ever. He laid his hand on her arm. You'll come away now, won't you, Mrs. Willoughby? he begged. She adjusted her furs hurriedly. All right, Thor, I come. I only want to say one thing more. No, no, please. "'I will say it,' she insisted, as he led her from the room, "'because it'll do Ina good. "'It's just this,' she threw back over her shoulder, "'that I forgive you, Ina. "'You're so magnificent that I can't nurse a grudge against you. "'When a woman has done what you've done, "'she may be punished by her own conscience, but not by me. "'I'm lost in admiration of the scale on which she carries out her crimes.' "'By the time they were in the porch, with the door closed behind them, "'Mrs. Excitement subsided suddenly.' Her voice became plaintive and childlike again, as she said wistfully, "'Oh, Thor, do you think it's all gone, that we shan't get any of it back? I know we haven't spent it. We can't have spent it.' Since Thor was Thor, there was only one thing for him to say. He needed no time to reflect or form resolutions. Whatever the cost to him, in whatever way, he could say nothing else. "'You'll get it all back, Mrs. Willoughby. Don't worry about it any more. Just leave it to me.' But Bessie was not convinced. "'I don't see how that's going to be. "'If your father says the money is gone, it is gone, "'whether we've spent it or not. "'Trust him.' "'Nevertheless, she kissed him, saying, "'But I don't blame you, Thor. "'If there were two like you in the world, "'it would be too good a place to live in, "'and Len and Lois think the same.' "'He got her into the motor and closed the door upon her. "'Standing on the doorstep, he watched it crawl down the avenue,' like a great black beetle on the snow. 
As he passed the gateway, his father appeared, coming on foot from the electric car. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 13 On re-entering the house, Thor waited for his father in the hall. Finding the drawing-room empty, and inferring that his mother had gone upstairs, he decided to say nothing of the scene between her and Mrs. Willoughby. For the time being, his own needs demanded right of way. Nothing else could be attended to till they had received consideration. With that reflection something surged in him, surged and exulted. He was to be allowed to speak of his love at last, he was to be forced to confess it. If he was never to name it again, he would do so this once, getting some outlet for his passion. He both glowed and trembled, he both strained forward and recoiled. Already he felt drunk with a wine that roused the holier emotions as ardently as it fired the senses. He could scarcely take in the purport of his father's words, as the latter stamped the snow from his boots in the entry and said, "'Has that poor woman been here? Sorry for her, Thor. Sorry for her from the bottom of my heart.' The young man had no response to make. He was in a realm in which the reference had no meaning. Archie continued, while hanging his hat and overcoat in the closet at the foot of the stairs, "'Possible to make her understand. Women like that can never see why they shouldn't eat their cake and have it too. Books open for her inspection?' "'What's one to do?' When he emerged from the closet, Thor saw that his face was grey. He looked mortally tired and sad. He had been sad for some weeks past, sad and detached, ever since the night when he had made his ineffectual bid for the care of Thor's prospective money. He betrayed no hint of resentment toward his son, nothing but this dignified lassitude, this reserved, hybrid, speechless expression of failure that smote Thor to the heart. But this evening he looked worn as well, worn and old, though brave and patient and able to command a weary, flickering smile. But I'm glad it's come. It'll be a relief to have it over. Seen it coming so long that it's been like a nightmare. I'd rather come to grief myself. Surely I would. Father, could I speak to you for a few minutes? About this? No, not about this. About something else. Something rather important. There was a sudden gleam in the father's eyes, which gave Thor a second pang. He had seen it once or twice already during these weeks of partial estrangement. It was the gleam of hope, of hope that Thor might have grown repentant. It had the sparkle of fire in it, when, seated in a business attitude at the desk which held the centre of the library, he looked up expectantly at his son. "'Well, my boy?' Thor remained standing. "'It's about that property of Fay's, father.' "'How, again?' The light in the eyes went out with the suddenness of an electric lamp. "'I only want to say this, father,' Thor hurried on, so as to get the interview over, "'that if you want to sell the place, I'll take it. I'll take it on your own terms. You can make them what you like.' Archie leaned on the desk, passing his hand over his brow. "'I'm sorry, Thor. I can't.' Thor had the curious reminiscent sensation of being once more a little boy, with some pleasure forbidden him. "'Oh, father, why? I want it awfully.' "'So I see. I don't see why you should, but—' "'Well, I'll tell you. I, I want to protect Fay because—' Masterman interrupted without looking up. "'And that's just what I don't want to do. I want to get rid of the lot.' "'Rid of the lot?' The expression was alarming. In his father's mind the issue, then, was personal. It was not only personal, but it was inclusive. It included Rosie. She was rated in The Lot.' clearly the minute had come at which to speak plainly. "'If you wanted to get rid of them on my account, father, I may as well tell you—' "'No, it's got nothing to do with you.' He was still resting his forehead on his hand, looking downward at the blotting paper on his desk. "'It's Claude.' Thor started back. "'Claude? What's he got to do with it?' "'Well, I hadn't made up my mind whether to tell you or not, but he doesn't even know them. Of course he knows who they are. Fay was Grandpa Thorley's—' Masterman continued to speak wearily. "'He may not know them all. It's motive enough for my action that he knows the girl.' "'Oh, no, he doesn't. you better ask him.' "'I have asked him.' "'Then you'd better ask him again.' "'But, father, she couldn't know him without my seeing it. I'm at the house nearly every day. The mother, you know.' 
Apparently your eyes aren't sharp enough. You should take a lesson from your Uncle Sim. But, Father, I, I don't understand. Then I'll tell you. It seems that Claude has known this girl for the past four or five months. Oh, no, no, that's all wrong. It isn't three months since I talked to Claude about her. Claude didn't even remember they had a girl. He'd forgotten it. I know what I'm talking about, Thor. Don't contradict. Seems your Uncle Sim has had his eye on them all along. Thor smote his side with his clenched fist. There's some mistake, Father. It can't be. I wish there was a mistake, Thor. But there isn't. If I could afford it, I should send Thor abroad. Send him round the world. But I can't just now with this mix-up in the business. There's no doubt but that the girl is bad. Father! If Master had been looking up, he would have seen the convulsion of pain on his son's face, and got some inkling of his state of mind. As bad as they make em, he went on tranquilly. No, no, father, you, you mustn't say that. I can't help saying it, Thor. I know how you feel about Claude. He feels as I do myself. But you and I must take hold of him and save him. We must get rid of this girl. But she's not bad, father. Masterman raised himself and leaned back in his chair. He saw that Thor was white, with curious black streaks and shadows in his long, gaunt face. "'Oh, I know how you feel,' he said again. It "'Does seem monstrous that the thing should have happened to Claude. "'But after all, he's young, and with a little tact we can pull him out. "'I've said nothing to your mother, and don't mean to. "'No use alarming her needlessly. "'I've not said anything to Claude either. I "'Only know the thing for four or five days. "'Don't want to make him restive, or drive him to take the bit between his teeth. "'High-spirited young fellow Claude is. "'Needs to be dealt with tactfully.' "'Thing will be to cut away the ground beneath his feet without his knowing it, "'by getting rid of the girl. "'But I know Rosie Fay, father, and she's not—' "'Now, my dear Thor, what is it, girl, but bad, "'when she's willing to meet a man clandestinely night after night? "'Oh, but she, she, she hasn't done it. "'And I tell you she has done it, ever since last summer, night after night.' "'Where?' Thor demanded hoarsely. "'In the woods above Duck Rock. Look here.' "'the father suggested, struck with a good idea. "'The next time Claw says he has an engagement "'to go out with Billy Cheever, why don't you follow him?' "'There was both outrage and authority in Thor's abrupt cry. "'Father!' "'Oh, I know how you feel. "'You'd rather trust him. "'Well, I would myself. "'It's the plan I'm going on. "'Mustn't be too hard on him, must we? "'Sympathetic steering is what he wants. "'Fortunately, we're both men of the world "'and can accept the situation with no puritanical hypocrisies.' "'He's not the first young fellow who's got into the clutches of a hussy.' "'It was to keep himself from striking his father down that Thor got out of the room. "'For an instant he had seen red, and across the red the word patricide flashed in letters of fire. "'It might have been a vision. It was frightening. "'Outside it was a night of dim, spirit-like radiance. "'The white of the earth and the violet of the sky were both spangled with lights.' Low on the horizon the full moon was a glorious golden disk. The air was sweet and cold. As he struck down the avenue, of which the snow was broken only by his own and his father's footsteps and the wheels of Bessie's car, he bared his head to cool his forehead and the hot masses of his hair. He breathed hard. He was aching. His distress was like that of being roused from a weird, appalling dream. He had not yet got control of his faculties, he scarcely knew why he had come out, except that he couldn't stay within. On nearing the street, the buzzing of an electric car reminded him that Claude was probably coming home. Instinctively, he turned his steps away from meeting him, tramping up the long, white, empty stretch of County Street. At Willoughby's Lane he turned up the hill, not for any particular purpose, but because the tramping there would be a little harder. He needed exertion. It eased the dull ache of confused inward pain. In the Willoughby house there was no light except in the hall and in Bessie's bedroom. Mother and daughter had doubtless taken refuge in the latter spot to discuss the disastrous turn of their fortunes. Ah, oh, well, there would probably be nothing to keep him from going to their rescue now. Probably. He clung to the faint chance offered by the word. He didn't know the real circumstances, yet. Probably his father had been accurate in his statements, even though wrong in what he had inferred. Probably Claude and Rosie had met, night after night, secretly, in the woods, in the dark. Probably. 
He stopped dead in his walk. He threw back his head and groaned to the violet sky. He pulled with both hands at his collar as though choking. Secretly, in the woods, in the dark. It was awful, and yet it was entrancing. If Rosie had only come to meet him like that, in that mystery, in that seclusion, with that trust, with that surrender of herself. How can I blame Claude? It was his first formulated thought. He tramped on again. How could he blame Claude? Poor Claude! He had his difficulties. No one knew that better than Thor. And if Rosie loved the boy... But over the ridge of the long wooded hill there was a road running parallel to County Street. He turned into that. But he began to perceive to what goal he was tending. He had taken this direction aimlessly, and yet it was as if his feet had acted of their own accord, without the guiding impulse of the mind. From a long, straight stem, a banner of smoke floated heavy and luminous against the softer luminosity of the sky. He knew now where he was going, and what he had to do. But he paused at the gate when he got there, uncertain as to where at this hour he should find her. There was a faint light in the mother's room, but none elsewhere in the house. The moon was by this time high enough to throw a band of radiance across Thorley's pond and strike pale gleams from the glass of the hothouse roofs. It required some gazing to detect in Rosie's greenhouse the blurred glow of a lamp. He remembered that there was a desk near this spot at which she sometimes wrote. She was writing there now, perhaps to Claude. But she was not writing to Claude. She was making out bills. As bookkeeper to the establishment, as well as utility woman in general, it was the one hour in the day when she had leisure for the task. She raised her head to peer down the long, dim aisle of flowers on hearing him open the door. "'It's I, Rosie,' he called to her, as he passed between banks of carnations. "'Don't be afraid.' She was not afraid, but she was excited. As a matter of fact, she was saying to herself, "'He's found out.' It was what she had been expecting. She had long ago begun to see that his almost daily visits were not on her mother's account. He would be coming less as a doctor than as a detective. Very well, if his detecting had been successful, so much the better. Since the battle had to be fought some time, it couldn't begin too soon. She remained seated, her right hand holding the pen, her left lying on the open pages of the ledger. He spoke before he had fully emerged into the glow of the lamp. "'Oh, Rosie, what's this about you and Claude?' Her little face grew hard and defiant. She was not to be deceived by this wounded, unhappy tone. "'Well, what?' she asked guardedly, looking up at him. He stooped. His face was curiously convulsed. It frightened her. "'Do you love him?' Instinctively she took an attitude of defence, rising and pushing back her chair to shield herself behind it. "'And what if I do?' "'Then, Rosie, you should have told me.' Again the heart-broken cry seemed to her a bit of trickery to get her confidence. "'Told you? How could I tell you? What should I tell you for? "'How long have you loved him?' Her face was set. The shifting opal lights in her eyes were the fires of her will. She would speak. She would hide nothing. Let the responsibility be on Claude. Her avowal was like that of a calamity or a crime. I've loved him ever since I knew him. And how long is that? It will be five months, the day after tomorrow. Tell me, Rosie, how did it come about? She was still defiant. She put it briefly. I was in the wood above Duck Rock. He came by. He spoke to me. "'And you loved him from the first? She nodded with the desperate little air he had long ago learned to recognise. "'Oh, Rosie, tell me this. Do you love him much?' She was quite ready with her answer. It was as well the masterman should know. "'I had to die for him.' "'Would you, Rosie? And what about him?' Her lip quivered. "'Oh, men are not so ready to die for love as women are.' leaned toward her, supporting himself with his hands on the desk. "'And you are ready, Rosie? You really would?' She thought he looked wild. He terrified her. 
she shrank back into the dimness of a mass of foliage. Oh, "'What do you mean? What are you asking me for? Why do you come here? Go away!' "'I'll go presently, Rosie. You won't be sorry I've come. I only want you to tell me all about it. There are reasons why I want to know.' "'Then why don't you ask him?' she demanded passionately. "'He's your brother.' "'because I want you to tell me the story first. "'There was such tenderness in his voice "'that she grew reassured in spite of her alarm. W "'What do you want me to say?' "'I want you to say, first of all, "'that you know I'm your friend.' "'You can't be my friend,' she said suspiciously, "'unless you're Claude's friend too, "'and Claude wouldn't own to a friend "'who tried to part us.' "'I don't want to part you, Rosie. "'I want to bring you together.' The assertion was too much for credence. She was thrown back on the hypothesis of trickery. You? Yes, Rosie. Has Claude never told you that he's more to me than anyone in the world except... He paused. He panted. He tried to keep it back, but it forced itself out in spite of his efforts. Except you. Once having said it, he repeated it. Except you, Rosie. Except... You. Though he was still leaning toward her across the desk, his head sank. There was silence between them. It was long before Rosie, the light in her eyes concentrated to two brilliant, penetrating points, crept forward from the sheltering mass of foliage. She could hardly speak above a whisper. Except who? He lifted his head. She noticed subconsciously that his face was no longer wild, but haggard. He spoke gently. "'Except you, Rosie. You're most to me in the world.' As she bent toward him, her mouth and eyes betrayed her horror at the irony of this discovery. She would rather never have known it than know it now. It was all she could do to gasp the one word. "'Me?' "'I shouldn't have told you,' he hurried on apologetically, but I, I couldn't help it. Besides, I want you to understand how utterly I'm your friend. I ask nothing more than to be allowed to help you and Claude in every way. She cried out. The thing was preposterous. You're going to do that? Now? I'm your big brother, Rosie. The big brother to both of you. That's what I shall be in future. And what I've said will be a dead secret between us, won't it? I shouldn't have told you... "'but I couldn't help it. "'It was stronger than me, Rosie. "'Those things sometimes are. "'But it's a secret now, dead and buried. "'It's as if it hadn't been said, isn't it? "'And if I should marry someone else?' "'This was too much. "'It was like the world slipping from her "'at the minute she had it within her grasp. "'The horror was not only in her eyes and mouth, "'but in her voice. "'Are you going to marry someone else?' "'I might have to, Rosie.' for a lot of reasons. It might be my duty. And now that I can't marry you... She uttered a sort of wail. Oh! <laughs> Don't be sorry for me, Rosie, dear. I can't stand it. I, I could stand it better if you're not sorry. But I am! She cried desperately. Then I must thank you. And it don't be. It will make me grieve the more for saying what I never should have said. But that's a secret between us, as I said before, isn't it? And if I do marry, she'll never find out, will she? That wouldn't do, would it, Rosie? His words struck her as passing all the bounds of practical common sense. They were so mad that she felt herself compelled to ask for more assurance. Are you in love with... with me? If the last syllable had been louder, it would have been a scream. Oh, Rosie, forgive me. I, I shouldn't have told you. It was weak. It was wrong. I only did it to show you how you could trust me. But I should have showed you that some other way. You'd already told me how it was between you and Claude, and so it was treachery to him. But I never dreamed of trying to come between you. Believe me, I didn't. I swear to you, I only want... She broke in, panting. She wouldn't have spoken crudely or abruptly if there had been any other way. But the chance was there. In another minute it might be too late. Yes, but when I said that about Claude... She didn't know how to go on. He encouraged her. Yes, Rosie. She wrung her hands. Oh, don't you see? When I said that about Claude, I didn't... I didn't know... He 
hastened to relieve her distress. "'You didn't know I cared for you?' "'No!' The word came out with another long wail. He looked at her curiously. "'But what's that got to do with it?' Her eyes implored him piteously while she beat the palm of one hand against the back of the other. It was terrible that he couldn't see what she meant, and the moment slipping away. "'It wouldn't have made you love Claude any the less, would it?' She had to say something. If she didn't, he wouldn't never understand. "'Not love, perhaps, but—' A sudden coldness in his voice terrified her again, but differently. "'But what, Rosie?' She cried out as if the words rent her. "'But Claude has no money.' "'And I have. Is that it?' It was no use to deny it. She nodded dumbly. Besides, she counted on his possession of common sense, though his use of it was slow. He raised himself from his attitude of leaning on the desk. It was his turn to take shelter amid the dark foliage behind him. He couldn't bear to let the lamplight fall too fully on his face. "'Is it this, Rosie?' he asked, with an air of bewilderment, "'that you'd marry me because I... "'I have the money?' "'It seemed to Rosie that the question gave her reasonable cause for exasperation. "'She was almost sobbing as she said, "'Well, I can't marry Claude without money. He can't marry me.' "'A worry was thrown into her little soul when she gasped in addition, "'And there's father and mother and Matt!' "'Fourth expression lost some of its bewilderment because it deepened to sternness. "'But Claude means to marry you, doesn't he?' She cried out again with that strange effect of the words rending her. "'I don't know!' He had a moment of wild fear lest his father had been right after all. "'You don't know? Then what's your relation to each other?' "'I, I don't know that either. Claude won't tell me.' She crossed her hands on her bosom as she said desperately, "'I sometimes think he doesn't mean anything at all.' The terror of the instant passed. "'Oh, yes, he does, Rosie. I'll see to that. "'Do you mean that you'll make him marry me?' "'He smiled pitifully. "'There'll be no making, Rosie. You leave it to me.' "'He turned from her not merely because the last word had been spoken, "'but through fear lest something might be breaking within himself. "'On regaining the white roadway, he thought he saw Jasper Fay in the shadow of the house, "'but he was too deeply stricken to speak to him.' He went up the hill and farther from the village. It was not yet eight o'clock, but time had ceased to have measurement. He went up the hill to be alone in that solitude which was all that for the moment he could endure. He climbed higher than the houses and the snow-covered gardens. His back was toward the moon and the glow above the city. The prospect of reaching the summit gave something for his strong body to strain forward to. The ridge, when he got to it, was treeless, windswept, and moonswept. It was a great white altar, victimless and bare. He felt devastated, weak. It was a relief, bodily and mental, to sink to his knees, to fall, to lie at his length. He pressed his hot face into the cool, consoling whiteness, as a man might let himself weep on a pillow. His arms were outstretched beyond his head. His fingers pierced beneath the snow till they touched the tender, nestling mosses. All round him there was silveriness and silence, and overhead the moon. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 14 Descending the hill, Thor saw a light in his Uncle Sim's stable, and knew that Delia was being settled for the night. Uncle Sim still lived in the ramshackle house to which his father, old Dr. Masterman, as elderly people in the village called him, had taken his young wife, who had been Miss Lucy Dawes. In this house, both Sim and Archie Masterman were born. It was the plainest of dwellings, painted by wind and weather to a dove-like silver-grey. Here lived Uncle Sim, 
cared for in the domestic sense by a lady somewhat older and more eccentric than himself, known to the younger Mastermans as Cousin Amy Dawes. Thor avoided the house and Cousin Amy Dawes, going directly to the stable. By the time he had reached the door, Uncle Sim was shutting it. In the light of a lantern standing in the snow, the naked elms round about loomed weirdly. The greetings were brief. "'Hello, Uncle Sim.' "'Hello, Thor.' Thor made an effort to reduce the emotional tremor of his voice to the required minimum. "'Father's been telling me about Claude and Rosie Fay.' Uncle Sim turned to the key in the lock with a loud grating. "'Father had to do it, did he? Thought you might have caught on to that by yourself. One of the reasons I sent you into the Fay family.' "'Did you know it then, already?' "'Didn't know it. Couldn't help putting two and two together.' "'You see everything, Uncle Sim.' Uncle Sim stooped to pick up the lantern. "'See, everything's under my nose. Thought you could, too.' "'This hasn't been under my nose.' "'Oh, well, there are noses and noses. A donkey has one kind and a dog has another.' Thor was not a finished actor, but he was doing his best to play a part. "'Well, what do you think now?' "'What do I think now? I don't think anything but other people's business.' "'I think we ought to do something,' Thor declared with energy. "'All right. Everyone to his mind. Only it's great fun to let other people settle their own affairs.' "'Settle their own affairs and suffer?' "'Yes, and suffer. Suffering doesn't hurt anyone.' "'Do you mean to say, Uncle Sim, that I should sit still and do nothing, while the people I care for most in the world are in all sorts of trouble that I could get them out of?' "'That little baggage, Rosy Fay, isn't one of the people you care for most in the world, I presume?' Thor knew that, with Uncle Sim's perspicacity, this might be a leading question, but he made the answer he considered the most diplomatic in the circumstances. "'She is, if, if Claude is in love with her, but, but why do you call her that, Uncle Sim?' "'Because he's a little witch, most determined little piece I know. Hard-working, lots of pluck, industrious as a devil.' "'Whole soul set on attaining her ends.' "'Thor considered it prudent to return to the point from which he had been diverted. "'Well, if the people I care for most are in trouble that I can get them out of—' "'Oh, if you can get them out of it.' "'Well, I can. "'Then that's all right. "'Only the case must be rather rare. "'I haven't often seen the attempt made except with one result. "'Not that of getting people out of trouble, but of getting oneself in. "'Every one to his own taste, Thor.' wouldn't stop you for the world. Only advise you not to be in a hurry. There's no question of being in a hurry when things have to be done now. All right, Thor, you know better than I. I'm one of those slowpokes who look on the fancy for taking a hand in other people's affairs as I do on the taste for committing suicide. There's always time. If you don't do it today, you can tomorrow, which is a reason for putting it off, ain't it? There was more than impatience in Thor's protest as he cried, "'But how can you put it off when there's someone, someone who's, who's unhappy?' "'I see. Comes back to that. "'But I don't mind someone's being unhappy. "'Don't care a tuppenny damn. Do them good. "'I've seen more people unhappy than I could tell you about in a year, "'and nine out of ten were made men and women by it, "'who before that had been only rags.' "'I'm afraid I can't accept that cheerful doctrine, Uncle Sim.' "'All right, Thor, don't want you to.' "'Wouldn't interfere with you any more than with anyone else. "'Free country. Got your own row to hoe. "'If you make yourself miserable in the process, "'why, it'll do you as much good as it does all the rest. "'Nothing like it. "'Wouldn't save you from it for anything. "'But there's a verse of an old song that you might turn over in your mind. "'Old song written about two or three thousand years ago. "'Oh, tarry thou the Lord's leisure.' "'Thor tossed his head impatiently. "'Oh, pshaw! "'But it goes on. "'And be strong. "'You can be awful strong when you're tarrying the Lord's leisure, Thor, "'because then you know you're not making any damn fool mistakes.' "'Thor spoke up proudly. "'I'd rather make mistakes than do nothing.' "'That's all right, Thor. Splendid spirit. "'Don't disapprove of it a mite. "'Go ahead. Make mistakes. "'It'll be live and learn. "'Not the least afraid. "'I've often noticed that when young fellows of your sort "'prefer their own haste to the Lord's leisure,' There's a lord's haste that hurries on before em, so as to be all ready to meet em when they come a cropper in the ditch. Thor turned away sharply. I guess I'll beat it, Uncle Sim. The old man, swinging his lantern, 
shambled along by his nephew's side, as the latter made for the road again. "'Oh, I ain't trying to hold you back, Thor. Now am I? On the contrary, I say, go ahead, rush in where angels fear to tread. If you don't do anything else, you'll carry the angels along with you. You may make an awful fool of yourself, Thor, but you'll be on the side of the angels, and the angels will be on yours.' Though dinner was over by the time Thor reached home, his stepmother sat with him while he ate it. It was a new departure for her. Thor could not remember that she had ever done anything of the sort before. She sat with him and served him, asking no questions as to why he was late. She seemed to divine a trouble on his part beyond her power to console, and for which the only sympathy she dared to express was that of small, kindly acts. He understood this, and was grateful. He found her society soothing. This, too, surprised him. He felt so battered and sore that the mere presence of one who approached him from an affectionate impulse had the effect on him of a gentle hand. Never before in his life had he been conscious of woman's genius for comforting, possibly because never before in his life had he needed comfort to the same degree. No reference was made by his stepmother or himself to the scene with Mrs. Willoughby in the afternoon but it was not hard for him to perceive that in some strange way it was stirring the victim of it to newness of life. It was not that she admitted the application of Bessie's charges to herself. They only startled her to the knowledge that there were heights and depths in human existence such as her imagination had never plumbed. Her nature was making a feeble effort to expand, as the petals of a bud that had been kept hard and compact by a backward spring may unfold in the heat of summer. When he had finished his hasty meal, Thor rose and kissed her, saying, "'Thank you, Mumphy,' using the pet name that had not been on his lips since childhood. She drew his face downward with a sudden sob, a sob quite inexplicable, except on the ground that her poor, withered, strangled little soul was at last trying to live. Having gone upstairs to his room, Thor shut the door and bolted it in his desire for solitude. He changed his coat and kicked off his boots. When he had lighted a pipe, he threw himself on the old sofa, which had done duty as couch at the foot of his bed ever since he was a boy. It was the attitude in which he had always been best able to think things out. Now that he had eaten a sufficient dinner, he felt physically less bruised, though mentally there was more to torture him. He regretted having seen Uncle Sim. He hated the alternative of letting things alone. There was a sense in which action would have been an anodyne to suffering, and had it not been for Uncle Sim, he would have had no scruple in making use of it. It was all very well to talk of letting people settle their own affairs, but how could they settle them, in these particular cases, without his intervention? As far as power went, he was like a fairy prince who had only to wave a wand to see the whole scene transfigured. If he hadn't asked Uncle Sim's advice, he would be already waving it, instead of lolling on his back, with his right foot poised over his left knee, and dangling a heelless slipper in the air. He felt shame at the very attitude of idleness. True, there were two distinct lines of action, that of making a number of people happy now, and that of holding back that they might fight their own battles. By fighting their own battles they might emerge from the conflict the stronger, after forty or fifty years. Those who were unlikely to live so long, Len and Bessie Willoughby, for example, would probably go down rebelling and protesting to their graves. But Claude and Rosie and Lois might all grow morally the stronger. There was that possibility. It was plain. Claude and Rosie might marry on the former's fifteen hundred dollars a year, have children, and bring them up in poverty as model citizens. But whatever the high triumph of their middle age, four shrank from the thought of the interval for both and Lois, too, might live down grief, disappointment, small means, and loneliness, might become hardened and toughened and beaten to endurance, and grow up to be the best and bravest and kindest old maid in the world. Uncle Sim would probably consider that, in these noble achievements, the game would be worth the candle. But he, Thor Masterman, didn't. The more he developed the possibilities of this future for everyone concerned, himself included, the more he loathed it. It was past eleven before he reached the point of loathing at which he was convinced that action should begin, but once he reached it, he bounded to his feet. 
he felt wonderfully free and vigorous. If certain details could be settled there and then, he couldn't wait till the morrow, he thought that, in spite of everything, he should sleep. He had heard Claude go to his room, which was on the same floor as his own, an hour earlier. Claude was probably by this time in bed and asleep, but the elder brother couldn't hesitate for that. Within less than a minute he had crossed the passage, entered Claude's bedroom, and turned on the electric light. Claude's profile, sunk into the middle of the pillow, might have been carved in ivory. His dark, wavy hair fell back picturesquely from temple and brow. Under the coverings his slim form made a light, graceful line. The room was at once dainty and severe. A striped paper, brightened by a design of garlands, knots and flowers a la Marie Antoinette, made a background for white furniture in the style of Louis XVI, modern and inexpensive, but carefully selected by Mrs. Masterman. The walls were further lightened by coloured reprints of old French scenes, discreetly amorous, collected by Claude himself. Thor stood for some seconds in front of the bed, before the brother opened his eyes. More seconds passed while the younger gazed up at the elder. "'Oh, the devil!' Claude began sleepily. But Thor broke in promptly. "'Claude, why didn't you ever tell me you knew Rosie Fay?' Claude closed his eyes again. The expected had happened. Like Rosie, he resolved to meet the moment cautiously, creating no more opposition than he could help. "'Why should I?' he parried without hostility. "'Because I asked you for one thing.' He opened his eyes. "'When did you ever ask me?' "'At the bank, one day when I found you there. It must have been two months ago.' Claude stirred slightly under the bedclothes. "'Oh, then?' "'Yes, then. Why didn't you tell me?' I didn't see how I could. What good would it have done, anyhow? It was on Thor's tongue to say, It would have done the good of not telling lies, but he suppressed that. One of his objects was to be conciliating. He had other objects, which he believed would be best served by taking a small chair and sitting on it astride, close to Claude's bed. An easy fraternal air was maintained by the effect of the pipe still hanging by its curved stem from the corner of his mouth. He began to think highly of himself as a comedian. "'I wish you had told me,' he said quietly, "'because I could have helped you.' Claude lay still. His eyes grew brilliant. "'Help me? How?' "'Helped you in whatever it is you're trying to do,' he added with significance. "'You are trying to do something, aren't you?' Claude endeavoured to gain time by saying, "'Trying to do what?' "'You're... Thor hesitated, but dashed in. "'You're in love with her?' It was still to gain time that Claude replied, "'What do you think?' Thor's heart bounded with a great hope. Perhaps Claude was not in love with her. He had not been noticeably moved as yet. In that case it might be possible, barely possible, that after Rosie had outlived her disappointment there might be a chance that he... But he dared not speculate. Mustering everything that was histrionic within him, he said, with the art that conceals art, "'I think you are, decidedly.' Claude rolled partly over in bed. "'That's about it.' The confession was as full as one brother could expect from another. Thor's heart sank again. He managed, however, to keep on the high plane of art as he brought out the words, "'And what about her?' Again, Claude's aval was as ardent as the actual conditions called for. Oh, I guess she's all right. So what now? Claude rolled back toward his brother, raising his head slightly from the pillow. Well, what now? You're going to be married, I suppose. Claude lifted himself on his elbow. Married on fifteen hundred a year? He went on before Thor could say anything. If there was nothing else to consider... Thor felt stirrings of hope again. "'Then, if you're not going to be married, what do you mean?' "'What do I mean? What can I mean?' "'Oh, come, Claude, you're not a boy any longer. You know perfectly well that a man of honour, with your traditions, can't trifle with a girl like that, or break her heart, or, or ruin her.' "'I'm not doing any of the three. She knows I'm not. She knows I'm only in the same box she's in herself.' "'That is, 
you're both in love without seeing how you're going to... Claude lurched forward in the bed. Look here, Thor. If you want to know, it's this. I've tried to leave the girl alone, and I can't. I'm worse than a damn fool. I'm every sort of a hound. I can't marry her, and I can't give her up. When I haven't seen her for a week, I'm frantic. When I do see her, I swear to God I'll never see her again. So now you know. Claude threw himself back again on the pillows, but Thor went on quietly. Why do you swear to God that you'll never see her again? Because I'm killing her. That is, I should be killing her if she wasn't the bravest little brick on earth. You don't know her, Thor. You've seen her and you know she's pretty, but you don't know that she's as plucky as they make them. Pluckier. Thor answered wearily. I'd rather guess that, which is one of the reasons why I feel you should be true to her. I am true to her, truer than I ought to be. If I was less true, it would be better for us both. She'd get over it. Again Thor was aware of an upleaping hope. And you too? Oh, I suppose so, in time. Yes, but you'd suffer. Claude gave another lurch forward in the bed. I couldn't suffer worse than I'm suffering now, knowing I'm an infernal cad and not seeing how to be anything else. But you wouldn't be an infernal cad if you married her. The young man flung himself about the bed impatiently. Ah, oh, what's the use of talking? If she had money, you could marry her all right. I'll go to the devil, Thor. The tone was one of utter exasperation. Thor persisted. If she had, let us say, four or five thousand dollars a year of her own. Claude stretched his person halfway out of the bed. I said, go to the devil. Well, she has. Has what? Four or five thousand dollars a year of her own. That is, she will have it, if you and she get married. Say, Thor, have you got the Jim Jams? I'm speaking quite seriously, Claude. I've always intended to do something to help you out when I got hold of Grandpa Thorley's money. And if you like, I'll do it that way. Do it what way? The way I say. If you and Rosie get married, she shall have five thousand a year of her own. From you? Thor nodded. The younger brother looked at the elder curiously. It was a long minute before he spoke. If it's to help me out, why don't I have it? I'm your brother. I should think I'd be the one. Because I'd rather do it that way. It would be a means of evening things up. It would make her more like your equal. You know as well as I do that father and mother will kick like blazes. But if Rosie has money... If Rosie has money, they'll know she gets it from somewhere. They won't think it comes down to her out of heaven. They can think what they like. They needn't know that I have anything to do with it. They know you haven't got five thousand a year, and if she has, why, there'll be the solid cash to convince them. The whole thing will be a pill for them. But if it's gilded... Claude's knees were drawn up in the bed, his hands clasped about them. Thor noticed the strangeness of his expression, but he was unprepared for his words when they came out. Say, Thor, you're not in love with her yourself, are you? Owing to what he believed to be the perfection of his acting, it was the question Thor had least expected to be called on to answer. He knew it was turning white or green, and that his smile when he forced it was nothing but a ghastly movement of the mouth. It was his turn to gain time, but he could think of nothing more forcible than what makes you answer me that? Because he looks so funny, so damn funny. There's nothing funny in my trying to give a lift to my own brother, is there? Mm, no, perhaps not. But see here, Thor, he leaned forward. You're not in love with her, are you? Thor knew the supreme moment of his life had come, that he should never reach another like it. It was within his power to seize the cup and drain it, or thrust it aside. Of all temptations he had ever had to meet, none had been so strong as this. It was the stronger for his knowing that if it was conquered now, it would probably never return. He would have put himself beyond reach of its returning. That in itself appalled him. There was some joy in feeling the temptation there as a thing to be dallied with. He dallied with it now. He dallied with it to the extent of saying, with a smile he tried to temper to playfulness, Well, 
What if I was in love with her? Something about Claude leaped into flame. Then I wouldn't touch a cent of your money. I wouldn't let her touch it. I wouldn't let her look at it. I'd marry her on my own. I'd be hanged if I wouldn't. I'd marry her tomorrow. I'd get out of bed and marry her tonight. I'd... Thor forced his smile to a tenderer playfulness, sitting calmly astride of his chair, his left arm along the back, his right hand holding his pipe by the bowl. So you wouldn't let me have her? Claude lashed across the bed. I'd see you hanged first. I'd see you damned. I'd see you damned to hell. She's mine, I tell you. I'm not going to give her up to anyone, and to you least of all. Do you get that? Now you know. All right, Claude. Now I know. Yes, but I don't know. Claude wriggled to the side of the bed, drawing as near to his brother as he could without getting out. I don't know. I've asked you a question, and you haven't answered it. By God, you've got to answer it. Sooner than let anyone else get her, I'll marry her and starve. Now speak. Thor got up heavily. He had the feeling with which the ancients submitted when they stood soberly and affirmed that it was useless to struggle against fate. Fate was upon him. He saw it now. He had tried to elude her, but she had got him where he couldn't move. She asserted herself again when Claude, hanging half out of bed, his mouth feverish, his eyes burning, insisted imperiously, "'Say you speak!' Thor spoke. He spoke from the middle of the floor, his pipe still in his hand. He spoke without premeditation, as though but uttering the words that destiny had put into his mouth from all eternity. "'It's all right, Claude. Calm down. I'm—I'm I'm going to be married to Lois Willoughby.' But Claude was not yet convinced. When? Just as soon as we can fix things up after the tenth of next month, after I get the money. How long has this been settled? Claude demanded with lingering suspicion. It's been settled for years, as far as I'm concerned. I can hardly remember the time when I didn't intend just what I'm going to do. Claude let himself drop back again among the pillows. So now it's all right, isn't it? Thor continued, making a move towards the door. It'll be Lois and I, and you and Rosie, and the money will go to Rosie. I insist on that. It'll even things up. Five thousand a year. Perhaps more. We'll see. He looked back from the door, but Claude, after his excitement, was lying white and silent, his eyes closed, his profile upturned. Thor was swept by compunction. It had always been part of the family tradition to respect Claude's high-strung nerves. Nothing did him more harm than to be thwarted or stirred up. With a murmured good night, Thor turned out the light, opening and closing the door softly. But in the passage he heard the pad of bare feet behind him. Claude stood there in his pyjamas. "'Say, Thor,' he whispered hoarsely, "'you're top hole. Upon my soul you are!' He caught his brother's hand, pulling it rather than shaking it, like a boy tugging at a bell-rope. "'You're a top-hole, brother Thor,' he repeated nervously. "'And I'm a beast. I know you don't care anything about Rosie. Of course you don't. But I've got the jumps. I've been through such a lot during the months I've been meeting her that I'm on springs. But with you to back me up. "'I'll back you up, all right, Claude. Just wade in and get married. And I guess our team will hold its own against all comers. Lois will be with us. She's fond of Rosie.' With another tug at his brother's arm, and more inarticulate thanks, Claude darted back to his room again. Thor closed his own door and locked it behind him. He was too far spent for more emotion. He had hardly the energy to throw off his clothes and turn out the light. Within five minutes of his final assurance to Claude, he was sleeping profoundly. End of chapter 14《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピー Consequently, Lois would be taken care of. Thor turned the idiom over with a vast content. 
It was the tune to which he bathed and dressed. They would all three be taken care of. Those who were taken care of were as folded sheep. His mind could be at rest concerning them. It was something to have the mind at rest, even at the cost of heartache. There was, of course, one intention that before all others must be carried out. He would have to clinch the statement he had made, for the sake of appeasing and convincing Claude concerning Lois Willoughby. It was something to be signed and sealed before Claude could see her or betray the daring assertion to his parents. Fortunately, the younger brother's duties at the bank would deprive him of any such opportunity earlier than nightfall, so that Thor himself was free for the regular tasks of the day. He kept there for his office hours during the forenoon, and visited his few patients after a hasty luncheon. There was one patient whom he omitted, whom he would leave henceforth to Dr. Hillary. It was but little after four when he arrived at the house at the corner of Willoughby's Lane and County Street. Mrs. Willoughby met him in the hall, across which she happened to be bustling. She wore an apron, and struck him as curiously businesslike. As he had never before seen her share in household tasks, her present aspect seemed to denote a change of heart. "'Oh, come in, Thor,' she said briskly. "'I'm glad you've come. Go up and see poor Len. He's so depressed. You'll cheer him.' If there was a forced note in her bravery, he did not perceive it. "'I'm glad to see you're not depressed,' he observed as he took off his overcoat. She shrugged her shoulders. "'I'm going to die game, which means that there's fight in me yet.' "'Fight?' His brows went up anxiously. "'Oh, not with your father. "'You needn't be afraid of that. "'Besides, I see well enough it would be no use. "'If he says we've spent our money, "'he's got everything fixed to make it look so, "'whether we've spent it or not. "'No, I'm not going to spare him because he's your father. "'I'm going to say what I think, "'and if you don't like it, you can lump it. "'I shan't go to law. "'I'd get the worst of it if I did. "'But neither shall I be bottled up, so there.' "'It doesn't matter what you say to me.' Thor began, with significant stress on the ultimate word. "'It may not matter what I say to you, but I can tell you it will matter what I say to other people.' Thor took no notice of that. "'And if you're not going to law, would it be indiscreet to ask what you are going to do?' Bessie forced the note of bravery again with a flash in her little eyes. "'I'm going to live on my income. That's what I'm going to do. Thank the Lord I've got some money left. I didn't let Archie Masterman get his hands on all of it. Not me.' I've got some money left, and we've got this house. I'm going to let it. I'm going to let it tomorrow, if I get the chance. I'm getting it ready now. And then we're going abroad. Oh, I know lots of places where we can live. Petit Trou, Parcher, dear little places, too, where Len will have a chance to, to get better. Thor made a big resolution. If you're going to let the house, why not let it to me? She knew what was coming, but it made her feel faint. Back into one of the Regency chairs, she sank into it. It was in mere pretense that she said, "'What do you want it for?' "'I want it because I want to marry Lois,' he added with an anxiety that sprang of his declaration to Claude. D "'Do you think she'll take me?' Bessie spoke with conviction. "'She'll take you unless she's more of a fool than I think. "'Of course she'll take you. "'Any woman in her senses would jump at you. "'I know I would.' She dashed away a tear. "'But look here, Thor.' she hurried on. If you marry Lois, you won't have the whole family on your back, you know. You won't be marrying Len and me. I tell you right now, because you're the sort that'll think he ought to do it. Well, you won't have to. I mean what I say when I tell you we're going to live on our income, what's left of it. We can, and we will, and we're going to. Couldn't we talk about all that when... When you're married to Lois and have more of a right to speak? No, we'll talk about it now, and never any more. Len and I are going to have plenty, plenty, "'If you think I can't manage, well, you'll see. "'Oh, I know you've got lots of pluck, Mrs. Willoughby.' "'She sprang to her feet. "'With her hands thrust jauntily into the pockets of her apron, "'she looked like some poor little soubrette, "'grown middle-aged, stout and rather grotesque, in a Marivaux play. "'She acted her part well. "'Pluck! Oh, I've got more than that. "'I've got some ability. "'If you never knew it before, you'll see it now. "'I spent a lot, but then I've had a lot, or thought I had.' "'And now that I'm going to have little, well, I'll show you I can cut my coat according to my cloth as well as the next one.' "'I, I don't doubt that in the least, and yet—' "'And yet you want us to have all our money back. "'Oh, I know what you meant yesterday afternoon. "'I didn't see it at the time. "'I had so many things to think of. "'But I caught on to it as soon as I got home. "'We should get it back because you give it to us. "'Well, you won't. "'You can marry Lois, if she'll marry you. 
and I hope to the Lord she won't be such a goose as to refuse you, and you can take the house off our hands, but more than that you won't be able to do, not if you were Thor Masterman ten times over. He smiled. I shouldn't like to be that. Once is bad enough. Her little eyes shone tearily. All the same, I like you for it. I do believe that if you hadn't said it I should have gone to law. I certainly meant to. But when I saw how nice you were— Dashing away another tear, she changed her tone suddenly. "'Tell me, what did your mother say after I left yesterday?' Thor informed her that, to the best of his knowledge, she hadn't said anything. Bessie chuckled. "'I didn't leave her much to say, did I? Well, I'm glad to have had the opportunity of talking it out with her.' "'You certainly talked it out, if that's the word.' "'Yes, didn't I? And now I suppose she's mad.' Thor was unable to affirm as much as this. In fact, the conversation, since Mrs. Willoughby liked to apply that term to the encounter, had induced in his stepmother, as far as he could see, a somewhat superior frame of mind. "'Well, I hope it'll do her as much good as it did me,' Betty sighed devoutly. "'And now that I've let off steam, I'll go round and make it up. Now go and see Len. He'll want to talk to you.' Thor intimated that he would be glad of a minute with Lois, to which Mrs. Willoughby replied that Lois was having one of her fits of bird craze. She was in the kitchen at that minute getting suet with which to go up into the woods and feed the chickadees. Good Lord! There had been chickadees since the world began, and they had lived through the winter somehow. Bessie had no patience with what she called nature fads, but it was as easy to talk sense into a chickadee itself as to keep Lois from going into the woods with two or three pounds of suet after every snowstorm. She undertook, however, to delay her daughter's departure on this errand till warning had been given to Thor. Upstairs, Thor found Len sitting in his big armchair, clad in a gorgeous dressing gown. He was idle, stupefied, and woebegone. With his bushy, snow white hair and beard, his puffy cheeks, his sagging mouth, and his clumsy bulk, he produced an effect half spectral and half fleshly, but quite pathetically ludicrous. His hand trembled violently as he held it toward his visitor. Not well today, Thor, he complained. Ought to be back in bed. Any other man would have got up. Always had too much energy. Awful blow, Thor. Awful blow. Never could have believed it of your father. But I'm not down yet. Go to work, make another fortune. That's what I'll do. Thor sympathised with his friend's intentions, and, having slipped downstairs again, found Lois in the hall, a basket containing a varied assortment of bird foods on her arm. When she had given him permission to accompany her, they took their way up Willoughby's Lane, whence it was possible to pass into the woodland stretches of the hillside. The day was clear and cold, with just enough wind to wake the Aeolian harp of the forest into sound. Once in the woods, they advanced warily. "'Listen to the red poles,' Lois whispered. She paused, leaning forward, her face alight. There was nothing visible, but a low, continuous warble interspersed with a sort of liquid rattle struck the ear. Taking a bunch of millet stalks from her basket, she directed Thor while he tied them to the bough of a birch that trailed its lower branches to the snow. When they had gone forward, they perceived, on looking around, that some dozen or twenty of the crimson-headed birds had found their food. So they went on, scattering seeds or crumbs in sheltered spots, and fixing masses of suet in conspicuous places to a reproving chirrup of dee-dee, chick-a-dee-dee-dee, from friendly little throats. The basket was almost emptied by the time they reached the outskirts of the wood and neared the top of the hill. Lois was fastening the last bunch of millet stalks to a branch hanging just above her head. Thor stood behind her, holding the basket, and noticing, as he had often noticed before, the slim shapeliness of her hands. In spite of the cold they were bare, the fur of the cuffs falling back sufficiently to display the exquisitely formed wrists. "'Lois, when can we be married?' She gave no sign of having heard him, unless it was that her hands stopped for an instant in the deft rapidity of their task. Within a few seconds they had resumed their work, though it seemed to him with less sureness in the supple movement of the fingers. Beyond the upturned collar of her coat, he saw the stealing of a warm, slow flush. He was moved. He hardly knew how. He hardly knew how, except that it was with an emotion different from that which Rosie Fay had always roused in him. In that case, the impulse was primarily physical. 
He couldn't have said what it was primarily in this. It was perhaps mental or spiritual, or only sympathetic. But it was an emotion. He was sure of that, though he was less sure that it had the nature of love. As for love, since yesterday, the words sickened him. Its association had become, for the present, at any rate, both sacred and appalling. He couldn't have used it, even if he had been more positive concerning the blends that made up his present sentiment. It was to postpone as long as possible the moment for turning around that Lois worked unnecessarily at the fastening of her minute stalks. They were not yet secured to her satisfaction, when, urged by a sudden impulse, he bent forward and kissed her wrist. She allowed him to do this without protest, while she knotted the ends of her string. But he was obliged to turn at last. "'I didn't know you wanted to be married,' she said, with shy frankness. He responded as simply as she. "'But now that you do know it, how soon can it be?' "'Why are you asking me?' For, Before he had time to reply, she went on. "'Is it because Papa has got into trouble?' He was ready with his answer. "'It's because he's got into trouble that I'm asking you today, "'but I've been meaning to ask you for years and years.' She uttered something like a little cry. "'Oh, Thor, is that true?' The fact that he must make so many reservations impelled him to be the more ardent in what he could affirm without putting a strain on his conscience. "'I can swear to it, Lois, if you want me to. "'It began as long ago as when I was a youngster and you were a little girl.' She clasped her hands tightly. "'Oh, Thor! Since that time there hasn't been a—' He's going to say a day, but he made a rapid correction. "'There hasn't been a year when I haven't looked forward to your being my wife.' He allowed a few seconds to pass before adding, "'I should think you'd have seen it.' She answered as well as a joyous distress would let her. "'I did see it, Thor, or thought I did, for a while. Only latterly—' "'You mustn't judge by latterly.' he broke in, hastily. Latterly, I've had a good deal to go through. Oh, you poor Thor, tell me about it. Nothing would have eased his heart more effectively than to have poured out to her the whole flood of his confidence. It was what he was accustomed to doing when in her company. He could talk to her with more open heart than he had ever been able to talk to any one. It would have been a relief to tell her the whole story of Rosie Fay. And if he refrained from taking this course, it was only because he reminded himself that it wouldn't do. It obviously wouldn't do. He was unable to say why it wouldn't do, except on the general grounds that there were things a man had better keep to himself. He curbed, therefore, his impulse toward frankness to say, I can't, because there are things I shall never be able to talk about. If I could speak of them to anyone, it would be to you. She looked at him anxiously. It's nothing that I have to do with, is it? "'Only in so far as you have to do with everything that concerns me.' Tears in her eyes could not keep her face from growing radiant. "'Oh, Thor, how can I believe it?' "'It's true, Lois. I can hardly go back to the time when, in my own mind, it hasn't been true.' "'But I'm not worthy of it,' she said, half tearfully. "'I hope it isn't a question of worthiness on the one side or the other. It's just a matter of, of our belonging together.' It was not in doubt, but with imploring looks of happiness that she said, "'Oh, are you sure we do?' He was glad she could accept his formula. It not only simplified matters, but enabled him to be sincere. The fact that in his own way he was quite sincere rendered him the more grateful to her for not forcing him, or trying to force him, to express himself insincerely. It was almost as if she divined his state of mind. "'Words aren't of much use between us,' he declared in his appreciation of this attitude on her part. We're more or less independent of them, don't you think? She nodded her approval of this sentiment, as her eyes followed the action of her fingers in buttoning her gloves. But I'll tell you what I feel as exactly as I can put it, he went on. It's that you're essential to me, and I'm essential to you. At least, he subjoined humbly, I hope I'm essential to you. She nodded again, her face averted, her eyes still following the movements of her fingers at her wrist. I, I can't express it in language very different from that, he stammered, because, well, because I'm not, not very happy, and the chief thing I feel about you is that you're a kind of, of shelter. He had found the word that explained his state of mind. 
it was as a shelter that he was seeking her. If there were points of view from which his object was to protect her, there were others from which he needed protection for himself. In desiring her as his wife, he was, as it were, fleeing to a refuge. He did desire her as his wife, even though but yesterday he had more violently desired Rosie Fay. The violence was perhaps the secret of his reaction, not that it was reaction so much as the turning of his footsteps towards home. He was homing to her. He was homing to her by an instinct beyond his skill to analyse, though he knew it to be as straight and sure as that of the pigeon to the cot. There was a silence following his use of the word shelter, a silence in which she seemed to envelop him with her deep, luminous regard. The still, remote beauty of the winter woods, the notes of friendly birds, the sweet, wild music of the wind in the treetops accompanied that look, as mystery and incense and organ harmonies go with benedictions. "'Oh, Thor, you're wonderful,' was all she could say when words came to her. "'You make me feel as if I could be of some use in the world. "'What's more wonderful still, you make me feel as if I've been of use all these years "'when I've felt so useless.' It was in the stress of the sensation of having wandered into far exotic regions in which his feet could only stray, that he said simply, "'You're home to me.' She was so near to bursting into tears that she turned from him sharply and walked up the hill. He followed slowly, swinging the empty basket. Her buoyant step on the snow, over which the frost had drawn the thinnest of shining crusts, gave a nymph-like smoothness to her motion. Having reached the treeless ridge, she emerged on that high altar on which, not twenty-four hours earlier, he had sunk face downward in the snow. The snow had drifted again over his footprints and the mark of his form. It was drifting still, in little powdery whirls, across a surface that caught tints of crimson and glimpse of fire from an angry sunset. It was windy here. As she stood above him, facing the north, her figure poised against a glowering sky, her garment blew backward. Even when he reached her and was standing by her side, she continued to gaze outward across the undulating, snow-covered country, in the folds of which an occasional farmhouse lamp shone like a pale twilight star. "'You see, it's this way,' he pursued, as though there had been no interruption. "'When I'm with you, I seem to get back to my natural conditions, the conditions in which I can live and work. That's what I mean by your being home to me. Other places,' he ventured this much of the confession he had at heart, other places have their temptations, but it's only at home that one lives. He took courage to go on from the way in which her loved hand had stole into his. I dare say you think I talk too much about work, but after all we can't forget that we live in a country in the making, can we? In a way, it's a world in the making. There's everything to do, and I want to be doing some of it, Lois, he declared with a little outburst. I can't help it. I know some people think I'm an enthusiast and others put me down as a prig, but I can't help it. I know you can't, Thor, and I can't tell you how much I... She felt for the right word. I admire it. He turned to her eagerly. You're the only one, Lois, who knows what I mean, who can speak my language. You want to be useful, too. And I never have been. Nor I. I've known that things were to be done, but I haven't known how to set about them or, or where to begin. Don't you think we may be able to find the way together? She seemed suddenly to cling to him. Oh, Thor, if you'd only make me half as good as you are. Perhaps the ardour with which he seized her was the unspent force of the longing roused in him by Rosie. Perhaps it blazed up in him merely because she was a woman. For two or three days now his need of the feminine had been acute. Did she minister to that? Or did she bring him something that could be offered by but one woman in the world? He couldn't tell. He only knew that he had her in his arms, with his lips on hers, and that he was content. He was content with a sense of fulfilment and appeasement. It was as if he had been straining for a great prize, and won the second. But at a moment when he had expected none at all. There was happiness in it, even if it was a quieter, staider happiness than that of which he now knew himself to be capable. "'You're home to me, Lois he murmured as he held her. "'You're home to me.' He meant that though there were strange, entrancing Edens on which he had not been allowed to enter, 
there was nevertheless a vast peace of mind to be found at the restful, friendly fireside. "'And you're the whole wide world to me, Thor,' she whispered, clasping her arms about his neck and drawing his face nearer. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 16 On leaving Lois and returning homeward, Thor met his brother at the entrance to the avenue. They had not spoken since the preceding night. On purpose to avoid a meeting, Claude had breakfasted early and escaped to town before Thor had come downstairs. In the glimpse Thor had caught of his younger brother as the latter left the house, he saw that he looked white and worried. He looked white and worried still under the glare of street electricity. As they walked up the driveway together, Thor took the opportunity to put himself right in the matter that lay most urgently on his mind. "'Lois and I are to be married on one of the last days of February,' he said, with his best attempt to speak casually. "'She wants to work it in before Lent, which begins on the first day of March. Have scruples about marrying in Lent in their church. Quite a fair. No one but the two families.' Claude asked the question as to which he felt most curiosity. "'Going to tell father?' "'Tonight. No use shilly-shallying about things of that sort. Father mayn't like it, but he can't kick.' Claude spoke moodily. "'He can't kick in your case.' "'We're grown men, Claude. We're the only judges of what's right for us. I don't mean any disrespect to father, but we've got to be free. Best way, as far as I can see, is to be open and above board and firm. Then everybody knows where you are.' Claude made no response till they reached the doorstep, where he lingered. "'Look here, Thor,' he said then. "'I've got to put this thing through in my own way, you know.' Thor didn't need to be told what this thing was. "'That's all right, Claude. I've got nothing to do with it.' "'You've got something to do with it when you've put up the money. "'And what I feel,' he added complainingly, "'is that my taking it makes me look as if I was bought.' "'Oh, rot, Claude!' Thor made a great effort. "'Hang it all, when a fellow's in, in love and going to be married himself, "'you don't suppose he can ignore his own brother, who's in the same sort of box, "'and can't be married for the sake of a few hundred dollars? <laughs> "'That wouldn't be human.' "'It was not difficult for Claude to take this point of view, "'but he repeated tenaciously, "'I've got to do it in my own way.' "'Good Lord, old chap, I don't care how you do it,' Thor declared airily, "'so long as it's done. "'Just buck up and be a man, and you'll pull it off magnificently.' It's the sort of thing you've got to pull off magnificently, or slump. That's what I think, Claude agreed. And so I'm... He hesitated before announcing so bold a programme. And so I'm going to take her abroad. Oh! Thor gave a little gasp. He had not expected to have Rosie pass out of his ken. He'd supposed that he should remain near her, watch over her, know what she was doing and what was being done to her. He was busy trying to readjust his mind while Claude stammered out suggestions for the payment of Rosie's proposed diary. It was clear without his saying so that he hated doing it, but he did say so, adding that it made him feel as if he was bought. Thor was irritated by the repetition. Let's drop that, Claude, if you don't mind. Be satisfied once for all that if you and Rosie accept the money, it will be as a favour to me. I am so built that I can't be happy in my own marriage without knowing that you and and she have the chance to be happy in yours. With all the money that's coming to me, and that I've never done any more to deserve than you have, what I'm setting aside will be a trifle. As to the payments, I'll do just as you say. The first quarter will be paid to Rosie on the day you're married, when there'll be a little cheque for you, for good luck. So go ahead and make your plans. Go abroad if you want to. Dare say it's the best thing you can do. To escape his brother's shamefaced thanks, Thor passed into the porch. "'I'm not going to tell anyone about it till I'm ready,' Claude warned as he followed. Thor turned. "'Of course you know that father's on to the whole business.' "'The deuce he is.' "'Father told me. How did you suppose I knew anything about it?' "'So that's it. Been wondering all day you could have given me away. That's Uncle Sim's tricks. Knew the old fool had his eye. Was bound to come out somehow, you know, in a little village like this.' Natural enough that Uncle Sim should want to put Father Wise to a matter that concerns the whole family. I thought I'd tell you so that you could take your line. 
take what line? How do I know? That's up to you. The line that will best protect Rosie, I suppose. Remember that that's your first consideration now. I only want you to understand that you can't keep father in the dark. I should say it was more dignified and perhaps better policy not to try. An hour later, Mrs. Masterman was commenting at the dinner-table on the pleasing circumstance that invitations to Miss Elsie Darling's party had come for the entire family. There were cards not only for the two young men, but for the father and mother also. Since both the older and the younger members of society were included, it was clear that the function was to pass the limitations of a dance and become a ball. Neither Mr. or Mrs. Masterman was superior to this form of entertainment. It was the one above all others that reminded them that they belonged to society in the higher sense. They dined out with tolerable frequency. With tolerable frequency their friends dined with them. As for the afternoon teas to which they were bidden in the course of a season, Mrs. Masterman could scarcely keep count of them. But balls came only once or twice in a winter, and not always so often as that. A ball was a community event. It was an occasion on which to display the fact that the neighbourhood could unite in a gathering more socially significant than the mere frolicking of boys and girls. Moreover, it was an opportunity for proving that the higher circles of the village stood on equal terms with those of the city, with the solidarity of true aristocracies all over the world. On Mrs. Masterman's murmuring something to the effect that Claude would go to the ball, of course, the young man mumbled words that sounded like, "'Not for mine.' The mother understood the response to be a negative, and replied with a protest. "'Oh, but you must, Claudie, dear. It will be so nice for you to meet Elsie. She is a charming girl, they say, after her years abroad.' She concluded with a wrinkling of her pretty brow. "'It seems to me you don't know many really nice girls.' She had been moved by no more than a mother's solicitude, but Claude kept his eyes on his plate. He knew that his father was probably looking at him, and that Thor was saying— Now's your chance to speak up and declare that you know the nicest girl in the world. Poor Claude was sensible of the opportunity, and yet felt himself paralysed with regard to making use of it. In reply he could only say, vaguely, that if he had to go, he would have to go, and not long afterward Mrs. Masterman rose. The sons followed their parents into the library, pausing to light their cigarettes on the way. By the time they had crossed the hall, the head of the house had settled himself with the evening paper in his favourite armchair before the slumbering wood fire. Mrs. Masterman stooped over the long table strewn with periodicals, turning the pages of a new magazine. Thor advanced to a discreet distance behind his father's chair, where he paused and said quietly, "'Father, I want to tell you, Mother, that I am engaged to Lois Willoughby. We are to be married almost at once, toward the end of next month.' There was dead silence. As far as could be observed, Masterman continued to study his paper, while his wife still stooped over the pages of her magazine. It was long before the father said, with the seeming indifference meant to be more bitter than gall, "'That, I presume, is your answer to my move with regards to the father. Very well, Thor. You're your own master. I have nothing to say.' Before Thor could explain, that it was only the carrying out of a long planned intention. His stepmother looked up and spoke. I have something to say, Thor, dear. I hope you're going to be very happy. I'm sure you will be. She's a noble girl. Her newly germinating vitality having asserted itself to this extent, she stood aghast till Thor strode up and kissed her, saying, Thank you, Mumphy. She is a noble girl, one of the best. The example had its effect on Claude who had stood hesitating in the doorway, and now came towards his father's chair, though timidly. "'Father, I'm going to be married too.' His mother uttered a smothered cry. Masterman turned sharply. "'Who? You?' Implied scorn in the tone put Claude on his mettle. "'Yes, father,' he tried to say with dignity. It was in search of further support for this dignity that he added— in a manner that he tried to make formal, but which became only faltering, to, to, uh, to Miss Rosanna Fay. Masterman shrugged his shoulders and returned to his newspaper. There were full three minutes in which each of the spectators waited for another word. "'Have you nothing to say to me, father?' Flaw pleaded in a tone curiously piteous. The father barely glanced over his shoulder. 
What do you expect me to say? To call you a damn fool? The words would be wasted. I'm a grown man, father. Claw began to protest. Are you? It's the first intimation I've had of it. But I'm willing to take your word. If so, you must assume a grown man's responsibilities from now on. Claw's throat was dry and husky. What do you mean, from now on? I mean from the minute when you've irrevocably chosen between this woman and us. You haven't irrevocably chosen as yet. You've still time to reconsider. But if I don't reconsider, Father, if I can't, the choice is between her and us. He returned to his paper, but again his wife's nascent will to live asserted itself, to no one's astonishment more than to her own. "'It's not between her and me, Claude,' she cried, casting as she did so a frightened glance at the back of her husband's head. "'I'm your mother. I shall stand by you, whoever fails.' Her words terrified her so utterly that before she dared to cross the floor to her son, she looked again beseechingly at the iron-grey top of her husband's head as it appeared above the back of the armchair. Nevertheless, she stole swiftly to her boy and put her hands on his shoulders. "'I'm your mother, dear.' she sobbed tremblingly, and if she's a good girl and loves you, I'll accept her. Masterman turned his newspaper inside out, as though pretending not to hear. Thor waited till Claude and his mother, clinging to each other, had crept out of the room, before saying, I'm responsible for this, father. There was no change in the father's attitude. So I supposed. The girl is a good girl, and I couldn't let Claude break her heart. You find it easier to break mine. I don't mean that, father. Then I can only say that you're as successful in what you don't mean as in what you do. I don't understand. No, perhaps not. But it would be futile for me to try to explain to you. Good night. Thor remained where he was. It isn't futile for me to try to explain to you, father. I know Rosie Fay, and you don't. She's a beautiful girl, with that strong character which Claude needs to give him backbone. He's in love with her, and he's made her fall in love with him. It wouldn't be decent on his part, or honourable on ours. The father interrupted wearily. You'll spare me the sentimentalities. The facts are bad enough. When I want instructions in decency and honour, I'll come to you and I'll get them. In the meantime, I've said good night. But, father, we must talk about it. Masterman raised himself in his chair and turned. Thor, he said sternly, his words getting increased effect from his childlike lisp, if you knew how painful your presence is to me, you go. Thor finished. There was nothing left for him but to, to turn. And yet he had not gone many steps beyond the library door before he heard his father fling the paper to the floor, uttering a low groan. The young man stood still, shifting between two minds. Should he go away and leave his father to the mortifying sense that his sons were setting him at defiance? Or should he return and insist on full explanations? He would have done the latter, had it not been for the words, if you knew how painful your presence is to me. He still heard them. They cut him across the face, across the heart. He went on upstairs. As he passed the open door of Mrs. Masterman's room, he heard Claude saying, Oh, mother darling, if you knew her, you'd feel about her just as I do. When she's dressed up as a lady, she'll put every other girl in the shade. You'll see she will. After she's had a year or two in Paris. Thor entered the room while the mother was crying out, Paris? Why, Claudia dear, what are you talking about? How are you going to live, let alone Paris? That's all right, mother, don't fret. I can get money. I'm not a fool. Look here, he added in a confidential tone, winking at Thor over her shoulder. I'll tell you something. It's a secret, mind you, not a word to father. I'm all right for money now. She could only repeat in a tone of mystification. All right for money now? Claude made an inarticulate sound of assent. Yeah, got it all fixed. Oh, but how? I said it was a secret. He winked at his brother again. I shouldn't tell even you, and you've been such a spanking good mother to back me up, that I want to ease your mind. She threw an imploring look at her stepson, though she addressed her son. Oh, Claude, you haven't done anything wrong, have you? Forged, or embezzled, or whatever it is they do in banks? 
No, mother, it's all on the square. Because of Thor's presence, he added, If it will make you any the more cheerful, I'll tell you this, too. It's not going to be my money. It'll be Rosie's. Strictly speaking, I shan't have anything to do with it. She'll have about five thousand dollars a year. When it's all over and we're married, you can put father wise to that, but, but not before, mind you. But, Claudia, darling, I don't understand a bit. How can she have five thousand dollars a year when they're as poor as poor? And she hasn't a relation who could possibly— He, too, threw a glance at Thor. She may not have a relation, but she might have a, a friend. Now, mother, this is just between you and me. If you hadn't been such a spanky good mother, I shouldn't have told you a word of it. Yes, but, Claude, think. What sort of a friend could it possibly be who'd give a girl all that money? Why, it's, it's ridiculous. It isn't ridiculous, is it, Thor? You leave it to me, Mumphy. But it is ridiculous, Claudie dear. You'll see if it isn't. No man in the world would settle five thousand dollars a year on a girl like that, without a penny, unless he had a reason, and a very good reason, too. Would he, Thor? She demanded of her stepson, whom she had not hitherto included. She continued to address him. I don't care who he is or what he is. Don't you agree with me? Wouldn't anybody agree with me who had his senses? Thor's heart jumped. This was a view of his intentions that he had not foreseen. Fortunately, he could disarm his stepmother by revealing himself as the god from the machine, for she would consider it no more than just that he should use part of his inheritance for Claude's benefit. He might have made the attempt there and then, had not Claude done it for himself. Now you leave it to me, Mumphy dear. I know exactly what I'm about. I can't explain, but I'll tell you this much more. It'll make your mind quite easy. That it's all on my account that Rose is to have the money. He gave his brother another look. If she didn't marry me, she wouldn't get it. At least, he added more doubtfully, I don't think she would. See? Mrs. Masterman confessed that she didn't see. Quite. But her tone made it clear that she was influenced by Claude's assurances, while Thor felt it prudent to go on his way up the second stairway. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 17 There were both amazement and terror in Rosie's face when, at dusk next day, Claude strolled down the flowery path of the hothouse. Since Thor had turned from her, on almost the same spot, forty-eight hours previously, no hint from either of the brothers had come her way. Through the intervening time she had lived in an anguish of wonder. What was happening? What was to happen still? Would anything happen at all? Had Claude discovered the astounding fact that the elder brother was in love with her? If he had, what would he do? Would he go wild with jealousy, or would he never have anything to do with her again? Either case was possible— and the latter more than possible, if he had received a hint of the degree in which she had betrayed herself to Thor. As to that, she didn't know whether she was glad or sorry. She knew how crude had been her self-revelation, and how shocking, but the memory of it gave her a measure of relief. It was like a general confession, like the open declaration of what had been too long kept buried in the heart. It had been a shameful thing to own that, loving one man, she would have married another man for money but a worse shame lay in being driven to that pass. For this she felt herself but partly responsible, if responsible at all. What did she, Rosie Fay, care for money in itself? Put succinctly, her first need was of bread, of bread for herself and for those who were virtually dependent on her. After bread she wanted love and pleasure and action and admiration and whatever else made up life, but only after it. She was craving for them, she was stifling for lack of them, but they were all secondary. The very best of them was secondary. Only one thing stood first, and that was bread. Undoubtedly her frankness had revolted Thor Masterman. But what did he know of an existence which left the barest possible margin for absolute necessity? What would life have meant to him had he never had a day since he first began to think, when he had been entirely free from anxiety as to the prime essentials? Rosie couldn't remember a time when the mere getting of their pinched daily food hadn't been a matter of contrivance with some doubt as to his success. 
She couldn't remember a time when she'd ever been able to have a new dress or a pair of boots without long calculation beforehand. On the other hand, she remembered many a time when the pinched food couldn't be paid for, and the new dress or the pair of boots had come almost within reach, and it would be whisked aside that the money might be used for something still more needful. In a world of freedom and light and flowers and abundance, her little soul had been kept in a prison where the very dole of bread and water was stinted. She had never been young. Even in childhood she had known that. She had known it and been patient with the fact, hoping for a chance to be young when she was older. If money came in then, money for boots and bread, for warm clothes in winter and thin clothes in summer, for fuel and rent and taxes and light and the pay of the men and the innumerable details which, owing to her father's dreaminess, she was obliged to keep on her mind, if money were ever to come in for these things, she could be young with the best. She could be young with the intenser happiness that would come from spirits long thwarted. It might never now be a light-hearted happiness, but it would be happiness for all that. It would be the deeper and the more satisfying and the more aware of itself for its years of suppression. To her long experience in denial, Rosie could only oppose a heart more imperiously exacting in its demands. Her tense little spirit didn't know how to do otherwise. From lines of ancestry that had never done anything but toil with patient relentlessness to wring from the soil whatever it was capable of yielding, she had inherited no habit of compromise. In them it had been called grit, but a softer generation having let that word fall into disuse, Rosie could only account for herself by saying she wasn't a quitter. She meant that she could neither forego what she asked for, nor be content with anything short of what she conceived to be the best. Could she have done that, she might have enjoyed the meagre good time of other girls in the village. She might have listened to the advances of young Breen the gardener, or of Matt's colleague in the grocery store, but she had never presented such possibilities for her own consideration. She was like an ant, that sees but one object to the errand on which it has set out, disdaining diversion. And if it had all summed itself up into what looked like a hard, unlovely avariciousness, it was because poor Rosie had nothing to tell her the values and correlations of the different ingredients in life. For the element that suffuses good fortune and ill fortune alike with corrective significance, she had imbibed from her mother one kind of scorn, and from her father another. She knew no more of it than did Thor Masterman. Like him, she could only work for a material blessing with material hands, though without his advantages for moulding things to his will. He had his advantages through money. Since all things material are measured by that, by that Rosie measured them. The matter and the measure were all she knew. They meant safety for herself and for her parents, and protection for Matt when he came out of jail. How could she do other than spend her heart upon them? What choice had she when the alternative lay between Claude and love on the one side, and on the other Thor with his hands full of daily bread for them all? With Claude and his love there went nothing besides, while with Thor and his daily bread there would be peace and security for life. She asked it of herself, she asked it in imagination of him. What else could she do but sell herself when the price on her poor little body had been set so high? She had spent two burning, rebellious days. All the while she was cooking meals, or setting tables, or washing dishes, or making beds, or selling flowers, or pruning, or watering, or addressing envelopes for the monthly bills, her soul had been raging against the unjust code by which she would have to be judged. Thor would judge her, Claude would judge her if he knew. Anyone who knew would judge her, and women most fiercely of all. But what did they know about it? What did they know of twenty-odd years of going around in a cage? What did they know of the terror of seeing the cage itself demolished and being without a protection? Did they suppose she wouldn't suffer in giving up her love? Of course she would suffer. The very extremity of her suffering would prove the extremity of her need. Passionately Rosie defended herself against her imaginary accusers, because unconsciously she accused herself. Nevertheless, Claude's sudden appearance startled her, though the set of his shoulders, tiring through the dusk, transported her to the enchanted land. Here were mountains and lakes and palaces and plashed marble steps and the music of lutes and banquets of ambrosial things to which daily bread was as nothing. Claude brought them with him. They were the conditions of that glorious life in which he had his being. 
They were the conditions in which she had her being too, the minute she came within his sphere. She passed through some poignant seconds as he approached. For the first time since her idol had begun to give a new meaning to existence, she perceived that if he renounced her, it would be the one thing she couldn't bear. She might have the strength to give him up. For him to give her up would be beyond all the limits of endurance. She put it to herself tersely in saying it would break her heart. But he dispelled her fears by smiling. He smiled from what was really a long way off. Even she could see that he smiled from pleasure, though she couldn't trace his pleasure to his delicious feeling of surprise. If she had ceased to be a dryad in a wood, it was to become the armida of an enchanted garden. She could have no idea of the figure she presented to a connoisseur in girls, as from a background of palms, fern trees, and banked masses of bloom, she stared at him with lips half-parted and wide, frightened eyes. Submitting to this new witchery, in the same way as he was yielding to the heavy, languorous perfumes of the place, Claude smiled continuously. "'The fat's all in the fire, Rosie,' he said in a loud whisper as he drew nearer. "'So we've nothing to be afraid of any longer.' It was some minutes before she could give concrete significance to these words. In the meantime, she occupied herself with assuring him that there was no one in the hot house but herself, and that in this gloaming they could not be seen from outside. She even found a spot, a kind of low staging from which foliage plants had recently been moved away, on which they could sit down. They did so, clinging to each other, though, conscious of her coarse working dress, she was swept by a shameful sense of incongruity in being on such terms with this faultlessly attired man. She did her best to shrink from sight, to blot herself out in his embrace, unaware that to Claude the very roughness and the scent of growing things gave her a savage, earthy charm. He explained the situation to her, word by word. When he told her that their meetings were known to his father, she hid her face on his breast. When he went on to describe how resolute he had been in taking the bull by the horns, she put her hands on his shoulders and looked up into his face with the devotion of a dog. On hearing what a good mother Mrs. Masterman had been, her utterances which welled up out of her heart as if she had been crying were like broken phrases of blessing. As a matter of fact, she was only half listening. She was telling herself how mad she had been in fancying for an instant that she could ever have married Thor, that she could ever have married anyone, no matter how great the need or how immense the compensation. Having confronted the peril, she knew now, as she had not known it hitherto, that her heart belonged to this man who held her in his arms, for him to do with it as he pleased. He might treasure it, or he might play with it, or he might break it. It was all one. It was his. It was his, and she was his, to shatter on the wheel or to trample in the mire, just as he was inclined. It was so clear to her now, that she wondered she hadn't seen it with equal force in those days when she was so resolute in declaring that she knew what she was doing. And yet, within a few minutes, she saw how difficult it was to surrender herself, even mentally, without reserves. She was still listening, but partially. She recognised plainly enough that the things he was saying were precisely those which a month ago would have filled her soul with satisfaction. He loved her, loved her, loved her. Moreover, he had found the means of sweeping all obstacles aside. They were to be married as soon as possible, just as soon as he could arrange things. Thor and his mother were with them, and his father's conversion would be only a matter of time. These assurances, by which all the calculations of her youth were crowned, found her oddly apathetic. It was not because she had lost the knowledge of their value, but only that they had become subsidiary to the great central fact that she was his, without money or price on his side, and no matter what cost on hers. It was only when he began to murmur semi-coherent plans for the future, in which she detected the word Paris, that she was frightened. "'Oh, but, Claude, darling, how could I go to Paris when there's so much for me to do here?' It could not be said that he took offence, but he hinted at reproval. "'Here, dearest, where?' "'Here where we are. I don't see how I could go away.' "'But you'd have to go away.' if we were married. Would it be necessary to go so far? Wouldn't it be the farther the better? For some things, but, oh, Claude, I have so many things to consider. But I thought that when a woman married, she left her father and mother and everything. Yes, I know. But how can I leave mine when I am the only one who has any head? 
Mother's getting better, but father's not much good except for mooning over books. And then... She hesitated, but whipped herself on. Then there's Matt. He'll be out before long. Someone must be here to tell them what to do. He withdrew his arms from about her. Of course, if you're going to raise so many difficulties... I'm not raising difficulties, Claude, darling. I'm only telling you what difficulties there are. God knows I wish there weren't any. But what can I do? If it were just going to Paris and back... Well, why not go and come back when we're obliged to? In the end they compromised on that, each considering it enough for the present. Rosie was unwilling to dampen his ardour when for the first time he seemed able to enter into her needs as a human being with cares and ties. He discussed them all, displaying a wonderful disposition to shoulder and share them. He went so far as to develop a philanthropic interest in Matt. Rosie had never known anything so amazing. She clasped him to her with a kind of fear lest the man should disappear in the god. "'I'll talk to Thor about him,' Lord said confidently. "'Got to be in his bonnet, Thor has, about helping chaps who come out of jail and all that.' Rosie shuddered. It was curiously distasteful for her to apply to Thor. She felt guilty toward him. If she could do as she chose, she would never see him again. She said nothing, however, while Claude went on. "'Thor's a top-hole brother, you know. You'll find that out one of these days. Lots of things I shall have to explain to you.' He added, while leading up to it, "'He's engaged to Lois Wellaby.' Rosie sprang from his arms. "'What? Already?' She was standing. He looked up at her curiously. "'Already? Already how? What do you mean by that?' She tried to recapture her position. "'Why, already, right after us.' She reseated herself, getting possession of one of his hands. To this tenderness he made no response. He seemed to ruminate. "'Say, Rosie,' he began at last, but apparently thought better of what he had meant to say. "'All right,' he broke in carelessly, going on to speak of the wisdom of leaving the public out of their confidence until their plans were more fully matured. Thor's to be married about the twentieth of next month, he continued, while Rosie was on her guard against further self-betrayal. After that we'll have Lois on our side, and she'll do a lot for us. By the time Claude emerged from the hothouse it was dark. Glad of the opportunity of slipping away unobserved, he was hurrying towards the road, when he found himself confronted by Jasper Fay. In the latter's voice there was a sternness that got its force from the fact that it was so mild. "'You've been in the hothouse, Mr. Claude?' Claude laughed. In his present mood of happiness he could easily have announced himself as Fay's future son-in-law. Nothing but motives of prudence held him back. He answered jestingly, "'Been in to see if you had any American beauties?' "'No, Mr. Claude, we don't grow them. No kind of American beauties.' Claude laughed again. Oh, "'I don't know about that. Good night, Mr. Fay. Glad to have seen you.' He passed on, with spirits slightly dashed, because his condescension met with no response. He was so quick to feel that Fay's silence struck him as hostile. It struck him as hostile with a touch of uncanniness. On glancing back over his shoulder, he saw that Fay was following him watchfully, like a dog that sneaks after an intruder till he has left the premises. Being sensitive to the creepy and the sinister, Claude was glad when he had reached the road. End of chapter 17《Chapter 18 of The Sight of the Angels》by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 18 The provision that for the moment he was to lead his customary life, and Rosie hers, made it possible for Claude to attend the ball by which Mrs. Darling drew the notice of the world to her daughter. He did so with hesitations, compunctions, reluctances, and repugnances, which in no wise diminished his desire to be present at the event. It took place in the great circular ballroom of the city's newest and most splendid hotel. The ballroom itself was white and gold and Louis Quinze. Against this background, a tasteful decorator had constructed a colonnade that reproduced in flowers the exquisite marble circle of the bosquet at Versailles. An imitation of Girardon's fountain splashed in the centre of the room and cooled the air. Claude arrived late. He did so partly to compromise with his compunctions, and partly to accentuate his value. 
In gatherings of which young men were sometimes at a premium, none knew better than he the heightened worth of one when no more were to be looked for, and who carried himself with distinction. Handsome at any time, Claude rose above his own levels when he was in evening dress. His figure was made for a white waistcoat, his feet for dancing pumps. Moreover, he knew how to enter a room with that modesty which prompts a hostess to be encouraging. As he stood rather timidly in the doorway, long after the little receiving group had broken up, Mrs. Darling said to herself that she had never seen a more attractive young man, whoever he was. She was glad afterward that she had made this reservation, for without it she might have been prejudiced against him on learning that he was Archie Masterman's son. As it was, she could feel that the sins of the fathers were not to be visited on the children, especially in the case of so delightful a lad. Mrs. Darling had an eye for masculine good looks, particularly when they were accompanied by a suggestion of the thoroughbred. Claude's very shyness, the gentlemanly hesitation which on the threshold of a ballroom has no dandified airs of seeming too much at ease, had this suggestion of the thoroughbred. Mrs. Darling, dragging a long pink train and waving slowly a bespangled pink fan, moved toward him at once. "'How do you do? So glad to see you. I'm afraid my daughter is dancing.' There was something in her manner that told him she had no idea who he was, something that could be combined with polite welcome only by one born to be a hostess. Claude had that ready perception of his role which makes for social success. He bowed with the right inclination, and spoke with a gravity dictated by respect. "'I'm afraid I must introduce myself, Mrs. Darling. I'm so late. I'm Claude Masterman. My father is—' "'Oh, they're here! So lovely your mother looks! Really, there's not a young girl in the room can touch her. Won't you find someone and dance? I'm sorry, my daughter, but later on I'll find her into— "'Why, maidy, there you are! I thought you'd never come. How do you do, my dear?' A more important guest than himself being greeted— Claude felt at liberty to move on a pace or two and look over the scene. For the outer rim of the circle, that which came beneath the colonnade, was raised by two steps above the space reserved for dancing. The coupe d'oeil was therefore extensive. A mass of colour, pleasing and confused, revolved languorously to those strains of the Viennese operetta in which the waltz might be said to have finished the autocracy of its long reign. The rhythm of the dancers was as regular and gentle as the breathing of a child. In glide and turn, in balance and smoothness, in that lift which was scarcely motion, there was the suggestion of frenzy restrained, of passion lulled, which emanates from the barely perceptible heave of a slumbering summer sea. It was dreamy to a charm. It was graceful to the point at which the eye begins to sicken of gracefulness. It was monotonous, with the force of a necromantic spell. It was soothing. It also threw a hint of melancholy into a gathering intended to be gay. It was as though all that was most sentimentally lovely in the essence of the nineteenth century had concentrated its strength to subdue the daring spirit of the twentieth, winning a decade of success. Now, however, that the decade was past, there was indications of revolt. On the arc of the circle most remote from the eye of the hostess, audacious couples were giving way to bizarre little dips and kicks and attitudes named by outlandish names inaugurating a new freedom. Claude stood alone beneath one of the wide, delicate floral arches, a spectator who was not afraid of being observed. In reality, he was noting to himself the degree to which he had passed beyond the merely pleasure-seeking impulse. In Rosie and Rosie's cares he had come to realities. He was rather proud of it, with regard to the young men and young women swirling in this variegated whirlpool, as well as those who, wearied with the dance, were sitting or reclining on the steps, where rugs and cushions had been thrown for their convenience, he felt a distinct superiority. They were still in the childish stage, while he was grown to be a man. To the pretty girls with their Parisian frocks and their relatively idle lives, Rosie, with her power of tackling actualities, was as a human being to a race of marionettes. It would be necessary for him, in deference to his hosts, to step down among them in a minute or two, and twirl in their company. But he would do it with a certain pity for those to whom this sort of thing was really a pastime. He would do it as one for whom pastimes had lost their meaning, and who would be, in some sense, taking a farewell. 
the music breathed out its last drowsy cadence, and the whirlpool resolved itself into a series of shimmering, subsidiary eddies. There was a decentralising movement towards the rugs and cushions on the steps, or to the seclusion of seats skilfully embowered amid groups of palms. Dowagers sought the rose-coloured settees against the walls. Gentlemen, clasping their white-gloved hands at the base of their spinal columns, bent in graceful conversational postures. A few pairs of attractive young people continued to pace the floor. Claude remained where he was. He remained where he was partly because he hadn't decided what else to do, and partly because his quick eye had singled out the one girl in the room who embodied something that was not embodied by every other girl. When first he saw her, she was standing beside the Girardon fountain in conversation with a young man. The fact that the young man was his friend Cheever brought her directly within Claude's circle, and stirred that spirit of emulation which five minutes earlier he thought to have outlived. The girl was adjusting something in her corsage, a glance flying upward from the action of her fingers towards Cheever's face, not shyly or coquettishly, but with a perfectly straightforward nonchalance which might have meant anything from indifference to defiance. Claude knew the precise moment at which she noticed him, by the fact that she glanced toward him twice in rapid succession, after which Cheever glanced towards him too. He understood then that she had been sufficiently struck by him to ask his name, and judged that Biddy would treat him to some such pardonable epithet as awful ass, in order to keep her attention on himself. In this, apparently, he didn't succeed, for presently they began to saunter in Claude's direction. The latter stood his ground. In the knowledge that he could endure scrutiny, he stood his ground with an ease that plainly roused the young lady's interest. With her hand on the arm of her cavalier, she sauntered forward, and, swerving slightly, sauntered by. She sauntered by with a lingering look of curiosity that seemed to throw him a challenge. Never in his life had Claude received such a look. It was perhaps the characteristic look of the girl of the twentieth century. It was neither bold, nor rude, nor self-assertive, but it was unconscious, inquiring, and unabashed. For Claude it was a new experience, calling out in him a new response. It was a rule with Claude never to take the initiative with girls of his own class, or with those who, because they lived in the city while he lived in the village, felt themselves geographically his superiors. He found it wise policy to wait to be sought, and therefore fell back toward his hostess with compliments for her scheme of decoration. He got the reward he hoped for when Mrs. Darling called to her daughter, saying, "'Elsie, dear, come here. I want to introduce Mr. Claude Masterman.' So it happened that when the nineteenth century was putting forth a further effort with the swooning phrases of the Barcarolle from the Comte de Hoffman, adapted to the Boston, Claude found himself swaying with the twentieth. They had not much to say. Whatever interest they felt in each other was guarded, taciturn. When they talked, it was in disjointed sentences on fragmentary subjects. "'You've uh, been abroad, haven't you?' "'Yes, for the last five years.' "'Do you like being back?' the answer was doubtful. "'Rather, for some things.' Then, as though to explain this lack of enthusiasm, "'Everybody looks alike.' She qualified this by adding, "'You don't.' "'Neither do you,' he stated, in the matter-of-fact tone, which he felt to be suited to the piquantly matter-of-fact in her style. It was a minute or two before either of them spoke again. "'You've got a brother, haven't you? My father's his guardian or something.' Assenting to these statements, Claude said further, "'He couldn't come tonight because he's going to be married on Thursday.' "'Oh, to that Miss Willoughby, isn't it?' A jerky pause was followed by a jerky addition. "'I think she's nice.' "'Yes, she is. Top hell. Says my brother.' She threw back her head to fling him up a smile that struck him as adorably straightforward. "'I like to hear one brother speak of another like that. You don't often.' Oh, well, every brother couldn't, you know. They had circled and reversed more than once before she sighed. I wish I had a brother, or a sister. It's an awful bore being the only one. Better to be the only one than one of too many. More minutes had gone by in the suave swinging of their steps to Offenbach's somnolent measures, when she asked abruptly, Do you skate? Sometimes, do you? 
I go to the Colosseum. Claude's next question slipped out with the daring simplicity he knew how to employ. Do you go on particular days? I generally go on Tuesdays. If she was moved by an afterthought, it was without flurry or apparent sense of having committed an indiscretion. Not every Tuesday, she said quietly, and dropped the subject there. When, a few minutes later, she was resting on a rug thrown down on the steps, with Claude prosed gracefully by her side, Archie Masterman found the opportunity to stroll near enough to his wife to say in an undertone, Do you see Claude? Ina's answer was no more than a flutter of the eyelids, but a flutter of the eyelids quite sufficient to take in the summing up of significant, unutterable things in her husband's face. End of chapter 18《Chapter 19 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 19 By the time Thor and Lois had returned from their honeymoon in early May, the line of battle in Claude's soul had been extended. The Claude who might be was fighting hard to get the better of the Claude who was. It was nevertheless the Claude who was that spoke in response to the elder brother's timid inquiry concerning the situation as it affected Rosie Fay. Hardly knowing how to frame his question, Thor had put it awkwardly. "'Done anything yet?' "'No.' In the little smoking-room that had been Lens and was now Thor's, Mr. and Mrs. Willoughby having retired already to their petit trou par chair, they puffed at their cigars in silence. It had been the wish of both bride and bridegroom that Claude should dine with them on their second evening at home. Thor had manoeuvred for these few minutes alone with his brother in order to get the information he was now seeking. For his own assurance, there were things he needed to know. He wanted to feel convinced that he hadn't acted hastily, that in marrying he had made no mistake. There would be proof of that when he saw that Claude and Rosie had found their happiness in each other, and that in what he himself had done, there had been no other way. He wished that Uncle Sim's pietistic refrain wouldn't hum so persistently in his memory. "'Oh, tarry thou the Lord's leisure!' He didn't believe in a Lord's leisure, but neither did he want to be afraid of his own haste. He had grown so self-conscious on the subject that it took courage for him to say, "'Isn't it getting to be about time?' Claude drew the cigar from his lips and stared obliquely. "'Look here, old chap, I thought I was to put this thing through in my own way.' "'Oh, quite so, quite so.' Claude's thrust went home when he said, "'I don't see why you should be in such a hurry about it.' He followed this by a question that Thor found equally pertinent. "'Why the devil are you?' "'Because I thought you were.' "'Well, even if I am, I don't see any reason for rushing things.' "'Oh, would you call it rushing?' He threw off carelessly. "'I hear you go a good deal to the darlings.' "'Not any oftener than they ask me.' "'Well, then, they ask you pretty often, don't they?' "'I suppose they do when they feel inclined. "'I haven't counted the number of occasions.' "'No, but I dare say Rosie has.' "'I'm not a fool, Thor. "'I don't talk to Rosie about the darlings.' "'Nor to the darlings about her. "'That's the point. "'At least it's one of the two points, "'and both are important. "'It's no more unjust for Rosie Fay to know nothing of Elsie Darling "'than it is for Elsie Darling to know nothing of Rosie Fay. "'Oh, rot, Thor!' Claude sprang to his feet, knocking off the ash of his cigar into the fireplace. "'What do you think I'm up to?' "'I don't know. And what I'm afraid of is that you don't know. "'If you think I mean to leave Rosie in the lurch—' "'I don't think you mean it, no. "'Then if you think I'd do it, "'the surest way not to do it is to do the other thing. "'I'll do the other thing when I'm ready, not before. Ha! Oh, that's just what I thought would happen.' "'And this is just what I thought would happen, "'that because you've put up that confounded money "'you tried to make me feel I was bored. "'Well, I'm not bored, see? "'Rather than be bribed to doing what I mean to do anyhow, "'I'll not do it at all.' "'Oh, if you mean to do it anyhow,' "'Claude grounded on his brother indignantly. "'Say, Thor, do you think I'm going to be a damn scoundrel?' "'Do you think you'd be a damn scoundrel "'if you didn't put it through?' "'I should be worse. "'Even a damn scoundrel could be called a man, "'and I should have forfeited the name.' "'There. Does that satisfy you?' "'Up to a point, yes.' Claude sniffed. "'You're such a queer chap, Thor. 
that if I've satisfied you up to a point, I ought to be content. Oh, I'm all right, Claude. I only hope that you'll be able to go on with it for some better reason than just, just not to be a scoundrel. Good Lord, old chap, I'm crazy about it. If Rosie wouldn't hum and haw, I'd be the happiest man alive. Oh, so Rosie hums and haws, does she? What about? About that confounded family of hers. Must do this for the father and that for the mother and something else for the beastly cub that's in jail. You can see the position that puts me in. But if you're really in love with her, I'm really in love with her, but not with them. I never pretended to be. But I have to marry the bunch, the cub and all. Thor couldn't help thinking of the opening he would have had here for his own favourite kinds of activity. Then that'll give you a chance to help them. Not so stuck on helping people as you, old chap. I want help myself. But you've got help, whereas they've got no one. You'll be a godsend to them. That's just what I'm afraid of. Who wants to be a godsend to people? I should think anyone would. If I'm a godsend to them, it shows what they must be. Mustn't undervalue yourself. Besides, you know what they were when you began. Oh, hang it all, Thor. I didn't begin it. It, it happened. Thor's eyes followed his brother as the latter began moving restlessly about the room. Well, you're glad it happened, aren't you? Claude stopped abruptly. Of course I am. But what stumps me is why you should be. See here. Would you be as keen on it if I was going to marry someone else? Before so leading a question, Thor had to choose his words. I'd be just as keen on it. Only, if you were going to marry someone else, someone in circumstances more like your own, you wouldn't require so much of my... of my sympathy. Well, it beats me, Claude admitted, starting for the door. I know you're a good chap at heart. Top hole, of course. But I shouldn't have supposed you were as good as all that. I'll be darned if I should. Thor thought it best not to inquire too precisely into the suggestions implied by all that, contenting himself with asking, "'When may I tell Lois?' Claude answered over his shoulder as he passed into the hall, "'Tell her myself, perhaps now.' He joined his sister-in-law in the drawing-room, though he didn't tell her. He was on the point of doing so once or twice, but sheered off to something else. "'Awful queer fellow, Thor. Can you make him out?' Lois was doing something with white silk or thread, which she hooked in and out with a crocheting implement. The action, as she held the work up, showed the beauty of her hands. On her lips there was a dim, happy smile. Making Thor out is a good deal like reading in a language you're just beginning to learn. You only see some of the beauties yet, but you know you'll find plenty more when you get on a bit. In the meanwhile, the idioms may bother you. Claude, who was leaning forward limply, his elbows on his knees, made a circular protesting movement of his neck and head, as though his collar fitted him uncomfortably. Well, he's all Greek to me. But they say Greek richly repays those who study it. Ha! <laughs> Afraid I'm not built that way. Do you know why he's got such a bee in his bonnet about... He was going to say, in order to lead up to his announcement, about Fay the gardener. But he couldn't. The words wouldn't come out. The prospect of telling anyone that he was going to marry little Rosy Fay terrified him. He hardly understood now how he could have told his father and mother. He would never have done it if Thor hadn't been behind him. As it was, both his parents were so discreet concerning his confidence that neither had mentioned it since that night, which made his situation endurable. So he changed the form of his question to be in his bonnet about helping people. Oh, it isn't a bee in his bonnet, it's just himself. He can't do anything else. He said moodily, Perhaps he doesn't help them as much as he thinks. He doesn't as much as he wants to, I know that. Well, why not? She dropped her work to her lap and looked vaguely toward the dying fire. Her air was that of a person who had already considered the question, though to little purpose. I don't know. Sometimes I think he doesn't go the right way to work. And yet it can hardly be that. Certainly no one could go to work with a better heart. Claude was referring inwardly to Rosie's five thousand a year, and perceiving that it created as many difficulties as it did away with, when he said, Thinks everything a matter of dollars and cents. She received this pensively. Perhaps. And yet Thor's warning sent Claude to see Rosie on the following afternoon. It was not his regular day for coming, 
so that his appearance was a matter of happy terror, tempered only by the fact that he caught her in her working dress. His regular days were those on which Jasper Fay took his garden truck to town. Fay rarely returned then before six or seven, so that with the early twilights there was time for an enchanted hour in the gloaming. The gloaming and the blossoms and the languorous heat and the heavy scents continued to act on Claude's senses as a love-filter might in his veins. It was the kind of meeting to be clandestine. Secrecy was a necessary ingredient in its deliciousness. The charm of the whole relation was at its being kept sub-rosa. Sub-rosa was the term. It should remain under the rose where it had had its origin. It should be a stolen bliss in a man's life, and not a daily staple. That was something which Thor would never understand, that a man's life needed a stolen bliss to give it piquancy. There was a kind of bliss which, when it ceased to be hidden, ceased to be exquisite. Mysteries were seductive because they were mysteries, not because they were proclaimed and expounded in the marketplace. Rosie, in her working dress among the fern trees and the great white Easter lilies, was rosy as a mystery, as a bliss. It was the pity of pities that she couldn't be left so where she belonged, in the state in which she met so beautifully all the requirements of taste. To drag her out and put her into spheres she wasn't meant for, and endow her with five thousand dollars a year, was like exposing a mermaid, the glory of her own element, by pulling her from the water. He grew conscious of this, as he always did the minute they touched on the practical. In general he avoided the practical in order to keep within the range of topics of which his love was not afraid. But at times it was necessary to speak of the future, and when they did, the poor mermaid showed her fins and tail. She could neither walk, nor dance, nor fly. She could only flounder. There was no denying the fact that poor little Rosie floundered. She floundered because she was obliged to deal with life on a scale of which she had no experience, but as to which Claude had keenly developed social sensibilities. Not that she was pretentious. She was only what he called pathetic, with a pathos that would have made him grieve for her if he hadn't been grieving for himself. He had asked her idea of their married life, since she had again expressed her inability to fall in with his. "'Oh, Rosie, let us go and live in Paris!' he had exclaimed, to which she had replied, as she had replied so many times already, "'Claude, darling, how can I? How can I leave them when they've no one else?' "'Then if we get married, what do you propose that we should do?' He had never come to anything so bluntly definite before. With that common sense of hers, which was always looking for openings that would lead to common sense results, Rosie took it as an opportunity. She showed that she had given some attention to the matter, though she expressed herself with hesitation. They were sitting in the most embowered recess the hothouse could afford, and a little shrine she kept free, yet secret, for the purpose of their meetings. She let him hold both her hands though her face and most of her person were averted from him as she spoke. She spoke with an anxiety to let him see that in marrying her he wouldn't be letting himself down too low. "'There's that little house in Schoolhouse Lane,' she faltered. "'The Lippets used to live in it.' "'Well?' "'If we lived there I could manage with a girl.' She brought out the subordinate clause with some confusion for the keeping of a girl— was an ambition to which it was not quite easy to aspire. She thought it best, however, to be bold, and stammered on, "'We could get one for about four a week.' He let her go on. "'And if we lived in the Lippet House, I could slip across our own yard, and across Mrs. Willett's yard, she wouldn't mind, and keep an eye on things here. Mother's ever so much better. She's taking hold again.' "'Then why couldn't we go and settle in Paris?' "'Because, don't you see, Claude, that's not the only thing.' "'There's father and Matt and the business. "'I must be on hand to, to prop them up. "'If I were to go, everything would come down with a crash, "'even if your father didn't make any more trouble about the lease. "'I suppose if we were married he wouldn't do that.' "'Though he kept silence, "'his nervous, fastidious, superfine soul was screaming. "'Why couldn't he have been allowed to keep the poignant joy of touching her, "'of breathing her acrid, earthy atmosphere,' of kissing her lips and her eyelids, to himself. It was an intoxication, but no one wanted intoxication all the time. It was curious that a life in this delirious state should be forced on him by the brother who wished him well, 
it was still more curious that he should feel obliged to force it on himself in order not to be a cad. He didn't despise Rosie for the poverty of her ideals. On the contrary, her ideals were exactly suited to the little rustic thing she was. If he could have been Strephon to her Chloe, it would have been perfect. But he couldn't be Strephon. He could be nothing but a neurotic twentieth-century youth, sensitive to such amenities and refinements as he had, and eager to get more. He was the type to go sporting with Amaryllis in the shade, but the shade was what made the exercise enchanting. His obscure rebellion against the power that forced him to drag his love out into the light impelled him to say, without knowing quite why, "'Did Thor ever speak of you and me being married?' Because he was pressing her to him so closely, he felt the shudder that ran through her frame. It seemed to run through his own as he waited for her reply. "'No.' Rosie never told a lie unless she thought she was obliged to. She thought it now because of Claude's jealousy. She'd seen flashes of it more than once, and always at some mention of his brother. She was terror-stricken as she felt his arm relax its embrace, terror-stricken lest Thor should have already given the information that would prove she was lying. She asked, trembling, "'Did he ever say he had?' "'Do you think he'd say it if he hadn't?' "'No, no I don't suppose so.' "'Then why should you ask me that?' "'She surprised him by bursting into tears. "'Oh, Claude, don't be cross with me. "'Don't say what you've said the last time you were cross, "'that you go away and never come back again. "'If you did that, I should die. I, "'I couldn't live. I should kill myself.' "'There followed one of the scenes of soothing "'in which Claude was specially adept, "'and which he specially enjoyed. "'The pleasure was so exquisite that he prolonged it, "'so that by the time he emerged from the hothouse, Jasper Fay was standing in the yard. As the old man's back was turned, Claude endeavoured to slip by, unobserved and silent. He succeeded in the silence, but not in being unobserved. Glancing over his shoulder, he saw the dim figure dogging him, as it had dogged him on a former occasion, with the bizarre, sinister suggestion of a beast about to spring. Claude could afford to smile at so absurd an idea in connection with poor old Fay but his nerves were shaken by certain passionate, desperate utterances he had just heard from Rosie. She was in general so prudent, so self-controlled, that he had hardly expected to see her give way either in weeping or in words. She had broken down in both respects, while his nature was so responsive that he felt as if he had broken down himself. In the way of emotions it had been delicious, wonderful. It was a revelation of the degree to which the little creature loved him, it was a sensation in itself to be loved like that. It struck him as a strange new discovery that in such a love there was a value not to be reckoned by money or measured by social refinements. New, strange harmonies swept through the aeolian harp of his being, harmonies both tragic and exultant by which he felt himself subdued. It came to him conclusively that if, in marrying Rosie, there would be many things to forego, there would at least be compensation and yet he shivered at the stealthy creeping behind him of the shadowy old man, by whom he felt instinctively that he was hated. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 20 Claude found it a vivid and curious contrast to dine that evening with the darlings and their sophisticated friends. The friends were even more sophisticated than Claude himself, since they had more money, had travelled more, and in general lived in a broader world. But Claude knew that it was in him to reach their standards and to go beyond them. All he needed was the opportunity, and opportunity to a handsome young American of good antecedents like himself is rarely wanting. He never took in that fact so clearly as on this night. He was glad that he had not been placed next to Elsie at table, for the reason that he felt some treachery to Rosie in his being there at all. Conversely, in the light of false judgment, he felt some treachery to Elsie that he should come to her with Rosie's kisses on his lips. Not that he owed her any explanations, from one point of view. Considering the broad latitude of approach and withdrawal allowed to American young people, 
and the possibility of playing fast and loose with some amount of mutual comprehension, he owed her no explanations whatever. But the fact remained that she was expressing a measure of willingness to be Juliet to his Romeo in braving the mute antagonism that existed between their respective families. As far as that went, he knew he was unwelcome to the darlings. But he knew, too, that Elsie's favour carried over her parents' heads the point of his coming and going. It was conceivable that she might carry over their heads a point more important still, if he were to urge her. To the Claude who was, it seemed lamentable that he couldn't urge her, but to the Claude who might be were higher things than the gratification of fastidious social tastes, and for the moment that Claude had some hope of the ascendant. It was that Claude who spoke when, after dinner, the men had rejoined the ladies. "'Your mother doesn't like my coming here.' Elsie threw him one of her frank, flying glances. "'Well, she's asked you, hasn't she?' He smiled. "'She only asked me at the last minute. I can see some other fellow must have dropped out.' "'You can see it because it's a dinner-party of elderly people to which you naturally wouldn't be invited unless there had been the place to fill. That constantly happens when people entertain as much as we do.' "'But it isn't a slight to be asked to come to the rescue. "'It's a compliment. "'You never ask people to do that "'unless you count them as real friends.' "'He insisted on his point. "'I don't suppose it was her idea.' "'You mean it was mine? "'But even if it was, it comes to the same thing. "'She asked you. "'She needn't have done it.' "'He still insisted. "'She did, but she didn't want to.' "'He added, lowering his voice significantly. "'And she was right.' He forced himself to return her gaze, which rested on him with unabashed inquiry. Everything about her was unabashed. She was free from the conventional manners of maidendom, not as one who has been emancipated from them, but as one who has never had them. She might have belonged to a generation that had outgrown the need for them, as perhaps she did. Shyness, coyness, and emphasised reserve formed no part of her equipment. But on the other hand, she was clear— clear with a kind of crystalline clearness, in eyes, in complexion, and in the staccato quality of her voice. "'She's right. How?' "'Right, because I oughtn't to come. I'm, I'm not free to come.' "'Do you mean?' She paused, not because she was embarrassed, but only to find the right words. She kept her eyes on his with a candour he could do nothing but reciprocate. "'Do you mean that you're bound elsewhere?' He nodded. Matt said, Oh! She withdrew her eyes at last, letting her gaze wander vaguely over the music room, about which the other guests were seated. They were lined on gilded settees against the white French panelled walls, while a young man played Chopin's ballade in A flat on a grand piano in the far corner. Not being in the music room itself, but in the large square hall outside, the two young people could talk in low tones without disturbing the company. If she betrayed emotion, it was only in the nervousness with which she tapped her closed fan against the palm of her left hand. Her eyes came back to his face. "'I'm glad you've told me,' he took a virtuous tone. "'I think those things ought to be uh, to be open and above board.' "'Oh, of course. The wonder is that I shouldn't have heard it. One generally does.' "'Oh, well, you wouldn't in this case. "'Isn't it anybody about here?' "'It's someone about here, but not any one you would have heard of. "'She lives in our village. "'She's the daughter of a—well, of a market gardener. "'How interesting! "'And you're in love with her?' "'But because of what she saw in his face, she went on quickly. "'No, I won't ask you that. "'Don't answer. "'Of course you're in love with her. "'I think it's splendid, a man with your—' "'Chances was the word that suggested itself, "'but she made it future. "'A man with your future to fall in love with a girl like that?' There was a bright glow in her face to which he tried to respond. He said that which, owing to its implications, he could not have said to any other girl in the world, but could say to her because of her twentieth-century freedom from the artificial. "'Now you see why I shouldn't come.' She gave a little assenting nod. "'Yes, perhaps you'd better not, for a while. Not quite so often, at any rate. By and by, I dare say, we shall get everything on another, another basis, and then—' She rose, so that he followed her example, but he shook his head. "'No, we shan't. There won't be any more other bases.' She took this with her usual sincerity. "'Well, perhaps not. I don't suppose we can really tell yet. We must just see.' 
"'When he stops,' she added, with scarcely a change of tone, as she moved away from him, "'do go over and talk to Mrs. Boyce. She likes attentions from young men.' What Claude chiefly retained of his brief conversation was the approval in the words, "'I think it's splendid.' He thought it splendid himself. He felt positive now that if he had pressed his suit, if he had been free to press it, he might one day have been treading this polished floor not as guest, but as master. There were no difficulties in the way that couldn't easily be overcome if he and Elsie had been of a mind to do it, and she would have a good fifty thousand a year. Yes, it was splendid. There was no other word for it. He was giving up this brilliant future for the sake of little Rosie Fay, and counting the world well lost. The sense of self-approval was so strong in him that as he travelled homeward he felt the great moment to have come. He must keep his word. He must be a gentleman. He was flattered by the glimpse he had got of Elsie Darling's heart, and yet the fact that she might have come to love him acted on him as an incentive, rather than the contrary, to carrying out his plans. She would see him in a finer, nobler light. As long as she lived, and even when she had married someone else, she would keep her dream of him as the magnificently romantic chap who could love a village maid and be true to her. And he did love a village maid. He knew that now by certain infallible signs. He knew it by the very meagreness of his regret in giving up Elsie Darling and all that the winning of her would have implied. He knew it by the way he thrilled when he thought of Rosie's body trembling against his as it had trembled that afternoon. He knew it by the wild tingle of his nerves when she shuddered at the name of Thor. That is, he thought she had shuddered, but of course she hadn't. What had she to shudder at? He was brought up against that question every time the unreasoning fear of Thor possessed him. He knew the fear to be unreasoning. However possible it might be to suspect Rosie, and a man was always ready to suspect the woman he loved, to suspect Thor was absurd. Even the matter of Rosie's diary, Thor was acting queerly. There was an explanation of that queerness which would do him credit. Of that, no one who knew Thor could have any question, and at the same time keep his common sense. Claude couldn't deny that he was jealous, but when he came to analyse his passion in that respect, he found it nothing but a dread lest his own supineness might allow Rosie to be snatched away from him. He'd been dilly-dallying over what he should have clinched, he had been afraid of the sacrifice he would be compelled to make without realising, as he realised tonight, that Rosie would be worth it. No later than tomorrow he would buy a licence and a wedding ring, and, if possible, marry her in the evening. Before the fact accomplished, difficulties, and God knew there were a lot of them, would smooth themselves away. As he left the tram-car at the village terminus, he was too excited to go home at once, so he passed his own gate and went on towards Thor's. It was not yet late. He could hear Thor's voice reading aloud as the maid admitted him, and could follow the words while he took off his overcoat and silk hat and laid them carefully on one of the tapestried chairs. He still followed them as he straightened his cravat before the glass, pulled down his white waistcoat and smoothed his hair. Christ's mission, therefore, Thor read on, was not to relieve poverty, but to do away with it. It was to do away with it not by abolition, but by evolution. It is clear that to Christ poverty was not a disease, but a symptom, a symptom of a sick body politic. To suppress the symptom without undertaking the cure of the whole body would have been false to the thoroughness of his methods. Claude appeared on the threshold. Lois smiled. Thor looked up. Hello, Claude. Come in. Just wait a minute. Reading Weibart's Christ and Poverty. Only a few more lines to the end of the chapter. To the teaching of Christ, Thor continued, belongs the discovery that the causes of poverty are economic only in the second place, and moral in the first. Economic conditions are shifting, changing vitally within the space of a generation. Nothing is permanent but the moral, as nothing is effectual. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments hangs also the solution of the problems of poverty, seeing that a race that obeys them finds no such problems confronting it. In proportion to the spread of moral obedience, these problems tend to disappear. They were never so near to disappearing as now, when the moral sense has become alive to them. Claude smoked a cigar while they sat and talked. 
It was talk in which she personally took little share, but from which she sought to learn whether or not Thor was satisfied with what he had done. If there was any arrière pensée, he thought he might detect it by looking on. It was a pleasant scene, Lois with her sewing, Thor with his book. The library had that characteristic of American libraries in general, of being the most cheerful room in the house. "'What I complain of in all this,' Thor said, tossing the book on the table, "'is the intermediary suffering. "'It does no good to the starving of today "'to know that in another thousand years "'men will have so have grasped the principles of Christ "'that want will be abolished.' "'Lay smiled over her, saying, "'You might as well say that it does no good "'to the people who have to walk today "'or travel by trains and motors "'to know that in a hundred years "'the common method of getting about "'will probably be by flying. "'This writer lays it down as a principle "'that there's a rate for human progress.' "'and it's no use expecting man to get on faster than he has the power to go.' "'I don't expect him to get on faster than he has the power to go. "'I only want him to go faster than he's going.' "'Haven't you seen others who wanted the same thing, "'dragging people off their feet, "'with the result that legs or necks were broken? Oh, "'That's absurd, of course, "'but between that and quickening the stride there's a difference.' "'Exactly, which is what Viabot says.' His whole argument is that if you want to do away with poverty, you must begin at the beginning, and neither in the middle nor at the end. People used to begin at the end when they imagined the difficulty be met by temporarily supplying wants. Now they're beginning in the middle by looking for social and economic readjustments, which won't be effective for more than a few years at a time. To begin at the beginning, as I understand him to say, they must get at themselves with a new point of view and a new line of action toward one another. They must try the Christian method, which they never have tried, or put up with poverty and other inequalities. It's futile to expect to do away with them by the means they are using now. And that, she added in defence of the author she was endeavouring to sum up, seems to me perfectly true. Without following the line of argument in which he took no interest, Claude spoke out of his knowledge of his brother. Trouble with Thor is that he's in too much of a hurry. Won't let anything take its own pace. That was so like a paraphrase in Claude's language of Uncle Sim's poetistic ditty that Thor winced. "'Take its own pace and stop still,' he said scornfully. "'And then,' Lois resumed tranquilly, "'you've got to remember that Weibart has a spiritual as well as a historical line of argument. The evolution of the human race isn't merely a matter of following out certain principles. It depends on the degree of its conscious association with divine energy. Isn't that what he says?' The closer the association, the faster the progress. Where there's no such association, progress is clogged or stopped. You remember thoughts in the chapter, Fellow Workers with God. I couldn't make it out, Thor said with some impatience. Fellow Workers with God, I, I don't see what that means. Then until you do see... Apparently she thought better of what she was about to say and suppressed it. The conversation drifted to cognate subjects, while Thor became merely an observer. He wanted to be perfectly convinced that Thor was happy, that Lois was happy he could see. Happiness was apparent in every look and line of her features and every movement of her person. She was like another woman. All that used to seem wistful in her and unfulfilled had resolved itself into radiant contentment. According to Claude, you could see it with half an eye. She had gained in authority and looks, while she had developed a power of holding her own against her husband that would probably do him good. As to Thor, he was less sure. He looked older than one might have expected him to look. There was an expression in his face that was hardly to be explained by marriage and a two-month's visit to Europe. Thor was not analytical, but he found himself saying, "'Looks like I'm a chap who's been through something. What?' "'Being through something?' meant more than the experience incidental to a wedding and a honeymoon. With that thought, torture began to gnaw at Claude's soul again, so that when his brother was called to the telephone to answer a lady who was asking what her little boy should take for a certain pain, he sprang the question on Lois. "'What do you really think of Thor? You don't suppose he has anything on his mind, do you?' Lois was startled. "'Do you?' "'I asked first. "'Well, what made you?' Oh, I don't know, two or three things. I just wondered if you'd noticed it. Her face clouded. I haven't noticed that he had anything on his mind. 
I knew already, he told me before we were married, that there was something about which he wasn't, wasn't quite happy. I dare say you know what it is. He shook his head. Don't you? Well, neither do I. He may tell me some day, until then, but I thought he was better lately, more cheerful. Hasn't he been cheerful? Oh, yes, quite, as a rule. But, of course, I've seen... They were interrupted by Thor's return, after which Claude took his departure. He woke in the morning with a frenzy that astonished himself to put into execution what he had resolved. With his nervous volatility he had half expected to feel less intensely on the subject after having slept on it, but everything that could be called a desire in his nature had focused itself now into the passion to make Rosie his own. That first, and all else afterward. That first, but he could neither see beyond it, nor did he want to see. The excitement he had been tempted to ascribe on the previous evening to his talk with Elsie Darling, and perhaps in some degree to a glass or two of champagne, having become intensified, it was a proof of its being the real thing. He was sure now that it was not only the real thing, but that it would be lasting. There was no spasmodic breeze through his aeolian harp, but the breath and life of his being. He came to this conclusion as he packed a bag that he could send for toward evening, and made a few other preparations for a temporary absence from his father's house. Putting one thing with another, he had reason to feel sure that he and Rosie would be back there together before long, forgiven and received, so that he was relieved of the necessity of taking a farewell. "'I think it's splendid,' rang in his heart like a cheer. "'Anyone would think it splendid who knew what he was going to do and what he was renouncing.' It was annoying that on reaching the spot where he took the electric car to go to town, old Jasper Fay should be waiting there. It was still more annoying that among the other intending passengers there should be no one whom Claude knew. To drop into conversation with a friend would have kept Fay at a distance. Just now his appearance, neat, shabby, pathetic, the superior working man in his long-preserved, threadbare Sunday clothes, introduced disturbing notes into the swelling hymenial chant to which Claude felt himself to be marching. There were practical reasons, too, why he should have preferred to hold no intercourse with Fay till after he had crossed his Rubicon. He nodded absently, therefore, and, passing to the far end of the little straggling line, prayed that the car would quicken its speed in coming. Through the turn of his eye he could see Fay detach himself from the patient group of watchers and shamble in his direction. "'What's it to be now?' Claude said to himself, but he stood his ground. He stood his ground without turning or recognising Fay's approach. He leaned nonchalantly on his stick, looking wearily up the line for rescue, till he heard a nervous cough. The nervous cough was followed by the words, huskily spoken, "'Mr. Claude!' He was obliged to look around. There was something about Fay that was at once mild and hostile, truculent and apologetic. He spoke respectfully, and yet with a kind of anger in the gleam of his starry eyes. "'Mr. Claude, I wish you wouldn't hang round my place any more. It don't do anyone any good.' Claude was weighing the advantages of avowing himself plainly on the spot, when Fay went on. "'One experience of that kind has been about enough in one year.' Claude's heart seemed to stop beating. "'One experience of what kind?' "'You're all mastermans together.' Fay declared bitterly. "'I don't trust any of you. You're both your father's sons,' Claude cried to himself. Aloud, he said with no display of emotion, "'I don't understand you. I don't know what you mean.' Fay merely repeated hoarsely, "'I don't want either of you coming any more.' Claude took a tone he considered crafty. "'Oh, come now, Mr. Fay, even if you don't want me, I shouldn't think you'd object to my brother Thor.' "'Your brother Thor. You've a nice brother Thor. "'Why, what's he done?' "'Ask my little girl. No, you needn't ask her. She wouldn't tell you. She won't tell me. "'All I know is what I've seen.' "'If it hadn't been for the decencies and the people standing by, "'Claw could have sprung on the old man and clutched his throat. "'All he could do, however, was to say peacefully, "'And what have you seen?' Fay looked around to assure himself that no one was within earshot. The car was bearing down on them with a crashing buzz, so that he was obliged to speak rapidly. "'I've seen him creep into my hot house where my little girl was at work, under cover of the night, and I've seen him steal away. And when I've looked in after he was gone, she was crying fit to kill herself.' 
"'What made you wait till he went away?' Claude asked fiercely. "'Why didn't you go in after him and see what they were up to?' The old man's face expressed the helplessness of the average American parent in conflict with a child. "'Oh, she wouldn't let me. She wouldn't have none of my interference. She says she knows what she's about. But I don't know what you're about, Mr. Claude, and so I'm begging you to keep away. No good'll come of your actions. I don't trust any masterman that lives.' The car had stopped and emptied itself. The people were getting in. Fay climbed the high steps laboriously, dropping a five-cent piece into a slot as he rounded a little barrier. Claude sprang up after him, dropping in a similar piece of money. It tinkled as it fell, shivered through his nerves, with the excruciating sharpness of a knife thrust. End of chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twenty One. Claude went on to the office as a matter of routine, but when his father appeared, he begged to be allowed to go home again. I am not well, father, he complained, his pallor bearing out his statement. Masterman's expression was compassionate. He was very gentle with his son, since the latter had been going so often to the Darlings. "'All right, my boy. Do go home. Better drop in on Thor. Give you something to put you to rights.' But Claude didn't drop in on Thor. He climbed to the hill north of the pond, taking the direction with which he was more familiar in the gloaming. In the morning sunlight he hardly recognised his surroundings, nor did he know where to look for Rosie at this unusual time of day. He was about to turn into the conservatory in which he was accustomed to find her, when an Italian with beady eyes and a knowing grin, who was raking a bed that had been prepared for early planting, pointed to the last hothouse in the row. Claude loathed the man for divining what he wanted, but obeyed him. It was a cucumber house, that is, where two or three months earlier there had been lettuce, there were now cucumber vines running on lines of twine, and already six feet high. It was like going into a vineyard, but a vineyard closer, denser, and more regular than any that ever grew in France. Except for one long straight aisle, no wider than the shoulders of a man, it was like a solid mass of greenery, thicker than a jungle, and oppressive from the evenness of its altitude. Claude felt smothered, not only by the heat, but by this compact luxuriance that dwarfed him, and which was climbing, climbing still. It was prodigious. In its way it was grotesque. It was like something grown by magic. But a few weeks previous there had been nothing here but the smooth green pavement of cheerful little plants that at a distance looked like jade or malachite. Now, all of a sudden, as it were, there was this forest of rank verdure sprung with a kind of hideous rapidity, stifling, overpowering, productive with a teeming incredible fecundity. Low down near the earth, the full-grown fruit, green with the faintest tip of gold, hung heavy, indolent, luscious, derisively cool to touch and taste in this semi-tropical heat. The gherkin a few inches above it defied the eye to detect the swelling and lengthening that were taking place as a man looked on. Tendrils crept and curled and twisted and interlocked from vine to vine like queer, blind, living things feeling after one another. Pale blossoms of the very colour of the sunlight made the sunlight sunnier, while bees boomed from flower to flower, bearing the pollen from the males, shallow, cup-like, richly stamened, to the females, growing daintily from the end of the embryo cucumber, as from a pinched, wizened stem. Advancing a few paces into this gigantic vinery, Claude found the one main aisle intersected by numerous cross-aisles, in any of which Rosie might be working. He pushed his way slowly, partly because the warm air heavy with pollen made him faint, and partly because this close pressure of facile, triumphant nature had on his nerves a suggestion of the menacing. On the pathway of soft, dark loam, his steps fell noiselessly. When he came upon Rosie, she was buried in the depths of an almost imperceptible cross-aisle, and at the end remote from the centre. As her back was toward him, and she had not heard his approach, he watched her for a minute in silence. His quick eye noticed that she wore a blue-green cotton stuff, with leaf-green belt and collar, that made the living element of her background, and that her movements and attitudes were of the kind to display the exquisite lines of her body. 
she was picking delicately the pale little blossoms and letting them flutter to the ground. Her way was strewn with the frail yellow things already beginning to wither and shrivel, adding their portion of earth unto earth, to be transmuted to life unto life with the next rotation in planting. "'Rosie, what are you doing?' He expected her to be startled, but he was not prepared for the look of terror with which she turned. He couldn't know the degree to which all her thoughts were concentrated on him, nor the fears by which each of her waking minutes was accompanied. She would have been startled if he had come at one of his customary hours toward night, but it was as death in her heart to see him like this in the middle of the forenoon. The emotion was the greater on both sides, because the long, narrow perspective focused the eyes of each on the face of the other, with no possibility of misreading. Claude remained where he was. Rosie clung for support to the feeble aid of the nearest vine. She began to speak rapidly, not because she thought he wanted his question answered, but because it gave her something to say. It was like the effort to keep up by splashing about before going down. She was picking off the superfluous female flowers, she said, in order that the strength of the plant might go into the remaining ones. One had to do that, otherwise... He broke in abruptly. Rosie, why did you tell me Thor never said anything about you and me being married? Oh, what's he been saying? She clasped her hands on her breast with a sudden beseeching alarm. It's not a matter of what he's been saying, it's only a matter of what you say, and I want you to tell me why he's paying me for marrying you. He spoke brutally, not only because his suffering nerves made him brutally inclined, but in the hope of wringing from her some cry of indignation. But she only said, I didn't know he was doing that. But you knew he was going to do something. It seemed useless to poor Rosie to keep anything back now. She could only injure her cause by hedging. I knew he was going to do something, but he didn't tell me what it would be. Or why should he do anything at all? What has it to do with him? She wrung her hands. Oh, Claude, I don't know. He came to me. He took me. He, he took me by surprise. I, I never thought of anything like that. I, I never dreamt it. Claude drew a bow at a venture. You mean that you never thought of anything like that when he said... He was obliged to wet his lips with his tongue before he could get the words out when he said he was in love with you. She nodded. I know, Claude, I didn't mean it. I swear to you, I didn't mean it. I knew he'd tell you. I was always afraid of him, but I just thought it then, just for a minute. I couldn't have done it. He had but the dimmest suspicion of what she meant, but he felt it well to say, You could have done it, Rosie, and you would. You're that kind. She took one timid step toward him, clasping her hands more passionately. "'Oh, Claude, have mercy on me, if you knew what it is to be me. "'Even if I had done it, it wouldn't have been because I loved you any the less. "'It would have been for father and mother and Matt and, and, and everything.' "'The way in which the words rent her made him the more cruel. "'They made him the more cruel because they rent him too. "'That doesn't make any difference, Rosie. "'You would have done it just the same. "'As it is, you were false to me. "'Only that once, Claude.' "'And if you want me to have mercy on you, "'you'll have to tell me everything that happened, the very worst.' "'The worst that happened was then.' "'Then? When? There were so many times.' "'But the other times he didn't say anything at all. "'He just came. I, I never dreamt.' "'But if you had dreamt, you would have played another sort of hand, "'now wouldn't you?' "'Claude, if you only knew, "'if you could only imagine what it is to have nothing at all, "'to, to have to live and fight and scrimp and save and no one to help you.' and your brother in jail, and coming out, coming out at Claude, and no one to help him, and everything on you. That's got nothing to do with it, Rosie. It has got something to do with it. It's got everything to do with it. If it hadn't, do you think that I'd have said that I'd marry him? Claude felt like a man who knows he's been shot, but as yet is unconscious of the wound. He spoke quietly. I think I wouldn't have said that I'd marry two men at the same time and play one off against the other. There was exasperation in her voice as she cried. But how could I help it, Claude? Can't you see it wasn't him? I can see that well enough. But do you think it makes it any better? It makes it better if I never would have done it unless I'd been obliged to. But you'd have done it. No, Claude, I wouldn't. Not when it came to the point. "'But why didn't it come to the point, since you told him you were willing to marry him? "'Why?' she implored him. "'Oh, what's the use of asking me that, if he's told you already?' 
It's this use, Rosie, that I wanted to hear it from yourself. You've told me one lie. Oh, Claude, and I want to see if you'll tell me any more. I didn't mean it to be a lie, Claude, but what could I say? When we don't mean a thing to be a lie, Rosie, we tell the truth. But how could I? Well, perhaps you couldn't, but you can now. You can tell me just what happened, and why more didn't happen, since you were willing that it should. She began with difficulty, wringing her hands. It was last January. I think it was January. Yes, it was. One evening I was in the other hothouse making out bills, and he came all of a sudden, and he asked me... He asked me... Yes, yes, go on. He asked me if I loved you, and I, I said I did. And he asked me how much I loved you, and I said... I said I'd die for you. And so I would, Claude. I'd do it gladly. You can believe me or not. That's all right. What I want to know is what happened after that. And then he said he'd help us. I didn't understand how he meant to help us, and I, I didn't quite believe him. You see, Claude, even if he is your brother, I never really liked him or trusted him. Not really. There was always something about him I couldn't make out, and now I see what it is. I knew he'd tell, and he made me promise I wouldn't. He made you promise you wouldn't tell what? What he said to me. He said he might go and marry someone else, and then he wouldn't want what he said to me to be known, because it would make trouble. But what did he say? Don't you know what he said? It doesn't matter whether I know or not, Rosie. It's for you to tell me. She wrestled with herself. Oh, Claude, I, I don't want to. I, I wish you wouldn't make me. Go on, Rosie, go on. He said he was in love with me himself, and that if I hadn't been in love with you... He's able to help her out. That he'd have married you. She nodded piteously. And you said? Oh, Claude, what's the use? She gathered her forces together. I didn't say anything. Not then. But you told him afterward that you were willing to marry him, whether you were in love with me or not. No, not like that. I, I really didn't say anything at all. You just let him see it. Again she nodded. He said it himself. He could see. He, he could see how I felt that it was like a temptation to me, that it was like bread and water held out to a starving man. That is, that the money was. She beat one hand against the other as she pressed them against her breast. Don't you see? It had to be that way. I couldn't see all that money come right, come right into sight, and, and not wish just for that minute that I could have it. Could I now? No, I don't suppose you could, Rosie, being what you are. But you see, I thought you were something else. Oh, no, Claude, you didn't. You've known all along. You mean I thought I knew all along? But I find I didn't. I find that you're only willing to marry me because Thor wouldn't take you. He couldn't take me after I said I'd die for you. How could he? And how can I, after you said you were willing? He threw out his arms with a gesture. Oh, Rosie, what do you think I feel? She crept a little nearer. I should think you'd feel pity, Claude. So I do, for myself. One's always sorry for a fool. But you haven't told me everything yet. You, you haven't told me what he said about me. She tried to recollect herself. About you, Claude? Oh, yes, he asked me what our relation was to each other, and I said I didn't know. And then he asked me if you were going to marry me, and I said I didn't know that either. And then he said not to be afraid, because... because... Because he'd make... No, he didn't say that. I, I asked him if he'd make you, and he said he wouldn't have to, because you'd do it whether or not, or something like that. I, I don't just remember what. He didn't say I'd do it because he'd give me five thousand dollars a year for the job, did he? She shook her head. She began to look dazed. No, Claude, he didn't say anything like that at all. But he said it to me, and he was going to do it. He thinks he's going to do it still. And isn't he? No, Rosie, I've got better fish to fry than that. If I'm for sale, I shall go high. Oh, Claude, what do you mean? What are you going to do? I'll tell you, Rosie. I'll give you an idea of the chap I am, of what I am willing to renounce for you. I was talking to a girl last night who let me see that she was all ready to marry me. She didn't say it in so many words, of course, but that's what it amounted to. She lives in a big house with ten or twelve servants, and is the only child of one of the richest men in the city. She's what you call an heiress, and she's a pretty girl, too. And 
What did you say to her, Lord? I told her I couldn't. I told her about you. About me? Oh, Claude, and what did she say? She said it was splendid for a chap with my future to fall in love with a girl like you and be true to her. But you see, Rosie, I thought you were true to me. Oh, but I am, Claude. He laughed. True? Why, Rosie, you don't know the meaning of the word. When Thor whistles for you, as he will, you'll go after him like that. He snapped his fingers. He'll only have to name your price. She paid no attention to these words, nor to the insult they contained. Her arms were crossed on her breast. Her face was turned to him earnestly. Yes, but what about this other girl, Claude? He spoke with apparent carelessness. Oh, about her? He nodded in the direction of the door at the end of the halt house, and of the world that lay beyond it. I'm going to marry her. She looked puzzled. Her air was that of a person who had never heard similar words before. You're going to... what? I'm going to marry her, Rosie. For a few seconds there was no change in her attitude. She seemed to be taking his statement in. When the meaning came to her, she withdrew her eyes from his face and dropped her arms heavily. More seconds passed while she stood like that, meek, crushed, sentenced, her head partially averted, her eyes downcast. Presently she moved, but it was only to begin again, absently, mechanically, to pick the superfluous female blossoms from the nearest vine, letting the delicate, pale gold things flutter to the ground. It was long before she spoke in a childish, unresentful voice. "'Are you, Claude?' he answered firmly. "'Yes, Rosie, I am,' she sighed. "'Oh, very well.' He could see that for the moment she had no spirit to say more. Her very movements betrayed lassitude, dejection. Though his heart smote him, he felt constrained to speak on his own behalf. "'You'll remember that it wasn't my fault.' She went on with her picking silently, but with a weary motion of the hands. The resumption of the task compelled her to turn her back to him, in the position in which he had found her when he arrived. "'I'm simply doing what you would have done yourself.' and he thought wouldn't let you. She made no response. The picking of the blossoms took her away from him, step by step. He made another effort to let her see things from his point of view. It wouldn't be honourable for me now, Rosie, to be paid for doing a thing like that. It would be payment to me, though he was going to settle the money on you. Even this last piece of information had no effect on her. She probably didn't understand its terms. Her fingers picked and dropped the blossoms slowly, till she reached the end of her row. He thought that now she would have to turn. If she turned, he could probably wring from her the word of dismissal or absolution that alone would satisfy his conscience. He didn't know that she could slip around the dense mass of foliage and be out of sight. When she did so, amazement came to him slowly. Expecting her to reappear, he stood irresolute. He could go after her and clasp her in his arms again, or he could steal down the narrow aisle of greenery and pass out of her life for ever. Out of her life. She would be out of his life, and there was much to be said in favour of achieving that condition. There was outraged love in Claude's heart, and also some calculation. It was not all calculation, neither was it all outraged love. If Rosie had flung him one piteous backward look, or held out her hands, or sobbed, he might have melted. But she did nothing. She only disappeared. She was lying like a stricken animal behind the thick screen of leaves, but he didn't know it. In any case, he gave her the option of coming back. He gave her the option and waited. He waited in the overpowering heat amid the low humming of bees. The minutes passed. There was neither sound among the vines nor footstep beside him. And so with head bent and eyes streaming and head aching and nerves unstrung and conscience clamouring reproachfully, he turned and went his way. He surprised his father by going back to the bank. Oh, look here, father, I'm, he confessed. I'm not ill. I'm only terribly upset about, about something. Can't you send me to New York? Isn't there any business? Masterman looked at him gravely and kindly. He divined what was happening. 
There's nothing in New York, he said after a minute's thinking. But there's the Routh matter in Chicago. Why shouldn't you go there? Mr. Wright was taking it up himself, as leaving by the four o'clock train this afternoon. Go and tell him I want you to take his place. He'll explain a thing to you and supply you with funds. And, he added after another minute's thought, since you've gone that far, why shouldn't you run on to the Pacific coast? Do you good, for for some time past that you need a little change. Take your own time and all the money you want. Forbes was trying to articulate his thanks when his father cut him short. All right, my boy, I know how you feel. If you're going to take the four o'clock, you've got no time to lose. Goodbye, he continued, holding out his hand heartily. Good luck. God bless you. The young man got himself out of his father's room in order to keep him bursting into tears. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 22 As Thor and Lois breakfasted on the following Sunday, the former was too busy with the paper to notice that his wife seemed preoccupied. He was made to understand it by her manner of saying, Thor? Dropping the paper, he gave her his attention. Yes? Her head was inclined to one side as she trifled with her toast. You know, Thor, that it's an old custom for newly married people to go to church together on the first Sunday they're at home. Oh, Lord! She had expected the exclamation. She also expected the half-humorous, half-repentant compliance which ensured. All right, I'll go. It was the sort of yielding that followed on all his bits of resistance to her wishes. A yielding on second thought a yielding through compunction, as though he were trying to make up to her for something he wasn't giving her. She laughed to herself at that, seeing that he gave her everything, but she meant that if she were not so favoured, she might have harboured the suspicion that on account of something lacking in their lives, he fell back on a form of reparation. As it was, she could only ascribe his peculiarity in this respect to the kindness of a nature that never seemed to think it could be kind enough. It was her turn to feel compunction. Don't go if you'd rather not. It's only a country custom, almost gone out of fashion nowadays. But he persisted. Oh, I'll go. Must put on another suit. Top hat, of course. With a good woman's satisfaction in getting her husband to church, if only for once, she said no more in the way of dissuasion. Besides, she hoped that, should he go, he might hear something that would comfort his hidden grief, of which she no longer had a doubt, since Claude, too, was aware of it. It was curious how it betrayed itself, neither by act, nor word, nor manner, nor so much as a sigh, and yet by something indefinable beyond all his watchfulness to conceal from her. She couldn't guess at his trouble even when she tried, but she tried only from inadvertence. When she caught herself doing so, she refrained, respecting his secret till she thought it well to tell her. She said no more till he again dropped the paper to give his attention to his coffee. "'Have you been to see the Fays yet?' "'He put the cup down without tasting it. "'He sat quite upright and looked at her strangely. "'He even flushed. "'Why, no.' "'The tone appealed to her ear and remained in her memory, "'though for the moment she had no reason to consider it significant. "'She merely answered, "'I thought I might walk up the hill and see Rosie this afternoon.' "'Leaving the subject to there.' Thor found the service novel, and impressive from its novelty. Except for the few weddings and funerals he had attended, and the service on the day he married Lois, he could hardly remember when he had been present as a formal participant at a religious ceremony. He had, therefore, no preconceived ideas concerning Christian worship, and not much in the way of prejudice. He had dropped in occasionally on the services of foreign cathedrals, but purely as a tourist who made no attempt to understand what was taking place. On this particular morning, however, the pressure of needs and emotions within his soul induced an inquiring frame of mind. On reaching the pew to which Lois led him, he sat down awkwardly, looking for a place in which to bestow his top hat without ruffling its gloss. Lois herself fell on her knees in prayer. The act took him by surprise. It was new to him. He was aware that she said prayers in private, and had a vague idea of the import of the rite, 
but this public, unabashed devotion gave him a little shock, till he saw that others came in and engaged in it. They entered and knelt, not in obedience to any preconcerted ceremony, but to each on his own impulse, and rose, looking, so it seemed to Thor, reassured and stilled. That was his next impression, reassurance and stillness. There was a serenity here that he had never before had occasion to recognise as part of life. People whom he knew in a commonplace way, as this or that, in the village, sat hushed, tranquil, dignified, above their ordinary state, raised to a level higher than any that could be reached by their own attainments or personalities. It seemed to him that he had come into a world of new standards, new values. Lois herself, as she rose from her knees and sat beside him, gained in a quality which he had no capacity to gauge. He belonged to the new scientific school, which studies and correlates, but is chary of affirmations, and chairier still of denials. Never deny anything, ne nier jamais rien, had been one of the standing bits of advice on the part of old Hervieu, under whom he had worked at the Institut Pasteur. He kept himself, therefore, in a non-hostile attitude toward all theories and systems. He had but a hazy idea as to Christian beliefs, but he knew in a general way that they were preposterous. Preposterous as they might be, it was his place, however, to observe phenomena, and now that he had an opportunity to do so, he observed them. "'How did you like it?' Lois ventured, timidly, as after service they walked along County Street. "'I liked it. Why?' The answer astonished her. "'It was big.' "'Big? How? The sweep, the ideas, so high, so universal, makes a tremendous appeal to the imagination.' She smiled toward him shyly. "'It's something, isn't it, to appeal to the imagination?' "'Oh, lots, since imagination rules the world.' They were on their way to lunch with Thor's father and stepmother. Now that there were two households in the family— the father insisted on a domestic reunion once a week. It was his way of expressing paternal forbearance under the blow Thor had dealt him in marrying Louis Willoughby. "'Where's Claude?' Thor asked the question on sitting down to table. His father looked at his mother, who replied with some self-consciousness, "'He's... Uh, he's gone west.' "'West? Where?' Uh, "'To Chicago first, isn't it, Archie?' Marsalman admitted that it was to Chicago first, and to the Pacific coast afterwards. Thor's dismay was such that Lois looked at him in surprise. "'Why, Thor, what difference can it make to you? Claude's able to travel alone, isn't he?' The efforts made by both his parents to carry off the matter lightly convinced Thor that there was more in Claude's departure than either business or pleasure would explain. Before Lois, who was not yet in the family secret, he could ask no questions, but it seemed to him that both his father and his mother had uneasiness written on their faces. He could hardly eat. He bolted his food only to put Lois off the scent. The old tumult in his soul, which he was seeking every means to still, was beginning to break out again. If it should prove that he had given up Rosie Fay to Claude, and that, with his parents' connivance, Claude was trying to abandon her, then by God! But he caught Lois's eye. She was watching him, not so much in disquietude as with faint amusement. It seemed odd to her that Claude's going away for a holiday should vex him so. Poor Lois. He was already afraid on her account, afraid that if Rosie Fay were left deserted, free, and a temptation he couldn't resist were to come to him, Lois would be the one to suffer most. By the middle of the afternoon, when his father had gone off in one direction and Lois in another, he found an opportunity for the word with his stepmother which he'd hung about the house to get. "'There's nothing behind this, is there?' She averted her head. "'How do I know, Thor? I have nothing to do with it. All I know is just what happened. Claude came rushing home last Wednesday and said he had to go right off to Chicago on business. I helped him pack, and he went.' "'Why didn't anyone tell me?' "'Well, you haven't been at the house, and it didn't seem important enough.' "'But it is important, isn't it? Doesn't father think so?' She tried to look at him frankly. "'Your father doesn't know any more about it than I know, and that's nothing at all.' Claude came to him and said, "'But I really oughtn't to tell you, Thor. Your father would be annoyed with me.' 
"'Then it's something that's got to be kept from me.' "'No, not exactly. It's only poor Claude's secret. "'We didn't try to wring it from him, because, "'Oh, for I wish you would let things take their course. "'I'm sure it would be best.' "'Best to let Claude be a scoundrel?' Oh, he, "'He couldn't be that. "'I want to be just to that girl, "'but we both know that there are queer things about her. "'There's that man who's giving her money, "'and dear knows what there may be besides. "'And so if they have quarrelled, but Thor rushed away. Having learned all he needed to know on that side, he must hear what was to be said on the other. He had hoped never again to be brought face to face with Rosie till she was his brother's wife. That condition would have dug such a gulf between them that even nature would be changed. But if she was not to be Claude's wife, if Claude was becoming a brute to her, then he must see at least that she had a friend. His heart was so hot within him as he climbed. His heart was so hot within him as he climbed the hill that he forgot that Lois would probably be there before him. As a matter of fact, she was talking to Fay in a corner of the yard, standing in the shade of a great magnolia that was a pyramid of bloom. All around it the ground was strewn in a circle with its dead white petals, each with its flush of red. Near the house there were yellow clumps of forsythia, while the hedge of bridal veil to the south of the grass plot seemed to have just received a fall of snow. Fay confronted him, as, slackening his pace, he went toward them. But Lois turned only at his approach. Her expression was troubled. "'For I wish you'd explain to me what Mr. Fay is saying. He doesn't want me to see Rosie.' "'Why, what's up?' Fay's expression told him that something serious was up, for it was ashen. It had grown old and sunken, and the eyes had changed their starry vagueness to a dulled animosity. "'There's this much up, Dr. Thor.' they said, in that tone of his which was at once mild and hostile. But I don't want any mastermind to have anything to do with me or mine. Thor tried to control the sharpness of his cry. Why not? You ought to know why not, Dr. Thor. And if you don't, you've only to look at my little girl. Oh, why couldn't you leave her alone? Lois spoke anxiously. Is anything the matter with her? Only that you've killed her between you. Thor allowed Lois to question him. "'Why, what can you mean?' "'Just what I say, ma'am, that she's done for.' Lois grew impatient. "'But I don't understand. Done for? How?' She turned to her husband. "'Oh, Thor, do see her and find out what's the matter.' "'No, ma'am,' said Fay firmly. "'He's seen her once too often as it is.' Lois repeated the words. "'Once too often as it is? What does that mean?' "'Better ask him, ma'am.' "'It's no use asking me,' Thor declared, "'for I've not the slightest idea of what you're driving at.' "'Oh, I know you can play the innocent Dr. Thor, "'but it's no use keeping up the game. "'You took me in at first. "'You took me in right along. "'You were going to be a friend to me "'and buy the place and keep me in it to work it "'and every sort of palaver like that "'when you was only after my little girl.' "'Thor was dumb. "'It was Lois who protested.' "'Oh, Mr. Fay, how can you say such things? It's wicked.' "'It may be wicked, all right, ma'am, but ask him how I can say them. "'All I know is what I've seen. "'If you was going to marry this lady,' he went on, turning again to Thor, "'why couldn't you have kept away from my little girl? "'You didn't do yourself any good, and you did her a lot of harm.' "'It was to come to Thor's aid, as he stood speechless, that Lois said soothingly, "'But I had nothing to do with that, Mr. Fay.' I never wanted anything of Rosie but to be her friend. You, ma'am, you're all of a piece. You're all masterments together. What had you to do with being a friend to her, getting her to call and have tea and putting notions into her head? The rich and the poor can't be friends any longer. If the poor think they can, the more fool they. We've been fools in my family, thinking because we were Americans we had rights. There's no rights any more, except the right of the strong to trample on the weak, "'till someone tramples on them. "'And someone always does. "'There's that. "'We're down today, but you'll be down tomorrow. "'Don't forget it, ma'am. "'America has that kind of justice when it hasn't any other, "'that it makes everybody take their turn. "'It's ours now, but you'll get yours as sure as life is life.' "'Lois looked at Thor. "'Can you make out what he means?' "'I can make out that he's very much mistaken.' "'Mistaken, Dr. Thor? I don't see how you can say that. 
I wasn't mistaken the night I saw you creeping into that hot house over there where you knew my little girl was at work. I wasn't mistaken when I saw you creep away. Still less was I mistaken when I stole in after you and gone and found her with her arms on the desk and her head bowed down on them and she crying fit to kill herself. That was just a few days before you heard you was going to marry this lady and she's never been the same child since. Always trouble, always something on her mind. Not once since that night have you darkened these doors so you'd had a patient here. Have you now? I, I, I didn't come, Forstammer, stammered, because Dr. Hillary had done all that was necessary for Mrs. Fay, and uh, I've been away. But if you didn't come, Fay went on, with a mildness that was more forcible than wrath, someone else did. You'd left a good substitute. He's finished the work that you began. He was here with her an hour last Wednesday morning, just after I'd warned him off for good and all. Thor started. Let me go to her. But Fay stood in his way. No, sir. To see you would be the finishing touch. She can't hear your name without a shiver going through her from head to foot. We've tried it on her. Between the two of you, your brother and you, it's you she's most afraid of. There was silence for a second while he turned his grey face first to the one and then to the other of his two listeners. "'Why couldn't you all have let her be? What were you after? What have you got out of it? I can't see.' "'Fay, I swear to you that we never wanted anything but her good,' Thor cried, with a passion that made Lois turn her troubled eyes on him searchingly. "'If my brother hasn't told you what he meant, I'll do it now. He wanted to marry Rosie. He was to have married her.' If there's trouble between them, it's all a mistake. Just let me see her. But Fay dismissed this as idle talk. No, Dr. Thor, stories of that kind don't do any good. Your brother never wanted to marry her, or meant to either, nor any more than you. What you did want, and what you did mean, God only knows. It's mystery to me. But what isn't mystery to me is that we're all done for. Now that she's gone, we've all gone, the lot of us. I've kept up till now. "'If money will do any good, Fay,' Thor began with a catch in his voice. "'No, Dr. Thor, not now. Money might have helped us once, "'but I ain't going to take a price for my little girl's unhappiness.' "'But what would do good, Mr. Fay?' Lois asked. "'If you'd only tell us.' "'Then, ma'am, I will. It's to let us be. "'Don't come near me nor mine any more, none of you.' She turned to Thor. Thor, is it true that Claude wanted to marry Rosie? I've never heard of it. Oh, yes, ma'am, you have, Thay broke in with irony. We've all heard of that kind of marriage. It's as old as men and women on the earth. But it don't go down with me. And if I find that my little girl has been taken in by it, then I shan't be to blame if... if someone gets what he deserves. The words were uttered in tones so mild that, as he shuffled away, leaving them staring at each other, they scarcely knew that there had been a threat in them. End of chapter 22。Chapter 23 of The Side of the Angels by Basil King。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Simon Evers。Chapter 23 It was an incoherent tale that Thor stammered out to Lois as he and she walked homeward. By trying to tell Claude's story without including his own, he was, for the first time since the days of schoolboy escapades, making a deliberate attempt at prevarication. He suppressed certain facts and over-emphasised others. He did it with a sense of humiliation which became acute when he began to suspect that he was not deceiving her. She walked on, saying nothing at all. Now and then, when he ventured to glance at her in profile, she turned to give him a sick, sad smile that seemed to draw its sweetness from the futility of his efforts. "'My God, she knows,' were the words actually in his mind, when he went floundering on with the explanation of why he couldn't allow Claude to be a cad. And yet, except for those smiles of an elusiveness beyond him, she betrayed no hint of being stricken in the way he was afraid of. On the contrary, she seemed, when she spoke, to be giving her mind entirely to the course of Claude's romance. "'He won't marry her. He'll marry Elsie Darling.' An hour ago the assertion would have angered him. Now he was relieved that she had the spirit to make it at all. He endeavoured to imitate her tone. 
"'What makes you think so?' "'I know, Claude. "'She's the sort of girl for him to marry. "'There's good in him, and she'll bring it out.' "'Unfortunately, it's too late to think of Claude's good "'when he's pledged to someone else. "'Would you make him marry her?' "'I'd make him do his duty.' She gave him another of those faint smiles of which the real meaning baffled him. "'I wouldn't lay too much stress on that, if I were you. To marry for the sake of doing one's duty is—' She faltered an instant, but recovered herself. "'Is as likely as not to defeat its own ends.' He was afraid to pursue the topic, lest she speak more plainly. On arriving home he was glad to see her go to her room and shut the door. It grieved him to think that she might be brooding in silence but even that was better than speech. As Uncle Sim and Cousin Amy Dawes were coming to Sunday night supper, the evening would be safe, and to avoid being face to face with her in the meanwhile, he went out again. Having passed an hour in his office, he strolled up into the wood above the village, his refuge from boyhood onward in any hour of trouble. There was space here, and air, and solitude. It was a diversion that was almost a form of consolation to be in touch with the wood's teeming life. Moreover, the trees, with their stately aloofness from mortal cares, their strifelessness and strength, shed on him a kind of benediction. From long association, from days of birds nesting in spring, and camping in summer, and nutting in autumn, and snowshoeing in winter, he knew them as almost individual personalities. The great white oaks, the paper birches, the white pines with knots that were masses of dry resin, the Canada balsams with odorous boughs, the sugar maples, the silver maples, the beeches, the junipers, the hemlocks, the hackmatacks, with the low-growing hickories, witch hazels, and slippery elms. Their green was the green of early May, yellow green, red green, bronze green, brown green, but nowhere as yet the full rich hue of summer. Here and there a choke cherry in full bloom swayed and shivered like a wraith. In shady places the ferns were unfolding in company with Solomon Seal wake-robin, the lady slipper, and the painted trillium. There was an abundance of yellow, sinkfoil, crowfoot, ragwort, bellwort, and shy patches of gold-coloured violets. In the sloping outskirts of the wood he stood still and breathed deeply, a portion of his cares and difficulties slipping from his shoulders. Somewhere within him was the sense of kinship with the wilderness that had become atavistic in Americans of six or eight generations on the soil. It was like skipping two centuries and getting back where life was primitive from necessity. There were few, if any, complications here, nor were there subtleties to consider. As far back as he knew anything of his Thorley ancestors, they had hewed and hacked and delved and tilled on and about this hillside, getting their changes from its seasons, their food from its products, their science from its bird life and beast life, their arts and their simples, their dyes and their drinks from its roots and juices. To the extent that men and the primeval could be one, they had been one with the forest of which nothing but this upland sweep remained, treating it as both friend and enemy. As enemy they had felt it, as friend they had lived its life and loved it, transmitting their love to this son, who was now bringing his heartaches, as he was accustomed also to bring his joys, where they had brought their own. The advantage of the wood to Thor was that once within its shadows he could, to some degree, stop thinking of the life outside. He could give his first attention to the sounds and phenomena about him. As he stood now, listening to the resonant tapping of a hairy woodpecker on a dead tree trunk, he could forget that the world held a Lois, a Rosie, and a Claude, each a storm centre of emotions. It was a respite from emotions, in a measure a respite from himself. He stepped craftily, following the sound of the woodpecker's tap, till he had the satisfaction of seeing a black-and-white back with a red band across the busily bobbing head. He stopped again to watch a chipmunk who was more sharply watching him. The little fellow, red-brown and striped, sat cocked on a stone, his forepaws crossed on his white breast like the hands of a meek saint at prayer. Strolling on again, he paused from time to time to listen to a robin singing right overhead, or to catch the liquid spiritual chant of a hermit-thrush in some stiller thicket of the wood, or to watch a bluebird fly directly into its nest, probably an abandoned woodpecker's hole, in a decaying Norway pine. 
these small happenings soothed him. Sauntering and pausing, he came up to the high treeless ridge he had last visited on the day he asked Lois to marry him. The ridge broke sharply downward to a stretch of undulating farms. Patches of green meadowland were interspersed with the broad red fields in which as yet nothing had begun to grow. Had it not been Sunday, the farmers would have been at work, ploughing, sowing, harrowing. As it was, the landscape enjoyed a rich Sabbath peace, broken only by the swooping of birds, out of the invisible, across the line of sight, and on into the invisible again. It was all beauty and promise of beauty, wealth and promise of wealth. The cherry trees were in bloom, the pear and the apple and the quince would follow soon. Above the farmer-houses tall elms rose, fan-shaped and garlanded. The very charm of the prospect called up those questions he'd been trying for a minute to shelve. How was it that in a land of milk and honey men were finding it so hard to live? How was it that with conditions in which every man might have enough and to spare, making it his aim to see that his fellow had the same, there could be greed and ingenious oppression and social crime, with a menace of things graver still? "'What's the matter with us?' he asked helplessly. Was it something wrong with the American people, or was it something wrong with the whole human race, or was it a condition of permanent strife that the human race could never escape from? Was man a being capable of high spiritual attainment, as he had heard in the church that morning? Or was he no better than the ruthless creatures of the woodland, where the weasel preyed on the chipmunk, and the owl on the mouse, and the fox on the rabbit, and the shrike on the phoebe, and the phoebe on the insect, in an endless round of ferocity? Had man emerged above this estate? Or was it as foolish to expect him to spare his brother man as to ask a hawk to spare a hen? These questions bore on Thor's immediate thoughts and conduct. They bore on his relations with his father, and Claude, and Lois. Through the social web in which he found himself involved, they bore on Rosie Fay. And from the social web they worked out to the great national ideals in which he longed to see his native land a sanctuary for mankind. But could man build a sanctuary? Would he know how to make use of one? Or was he, Thor Masterman, but repeating the error of that great-grandfather who had turned to America for the salvation of the race and died broken-hearted because its people were only looking out for number one? Because he couldn't find answers to these questions for himself, he tried, during supper, to sound Uncle Sim, leading up to the subject by an adroit indirectness. "'Been to church?' he said, after serving Cousin Amy Dawes with lobster a la Newberg. "'Oh, you?' came from Uncle Sim. "'Did you? What were you doing there? Thought you were a disciple of old Hillary.' "'Oh, that was the reason. Hillary's idea. Can't get round to the different churches himself, so he sends me. Look in on them all.' "'There's too much sherry in this lobster a la Newberg,' Cousin Amy Dawes said sternly. "'I bet she's put in two tablespoonfuls instead of one.' Being stone-deaf, Cousin Amy Dawes took no part in conversation except what she herself could contribute. She was a dignified woman who had the air of being hewn in granite. There was nothing soft about her but three detachable corkscrew curls on each side of an immobile face, and a heart that everyone knew to be as maternal as milk. Dressed in stiff black silk, a heavy gold chain around her neck, and a huge gold brooch at her throat, and wearing fingerless black silk mittens, she might have walked out of an old daguerreotype. "'I should think,' Thor observed dryly, "'that you'd find your religion growing rather composite.' "'There, yeah, tell the way round. Grow simpler. Get their coordinating principle, a common denominator that goes into them all.' "'That is,' Lois said, in the endeavour to be free to think her own thoughts by keeping me on a hobby, "'you look for their points of contact rather than their differences.' Ah, uh, you get beyond the differences. Beyond these voices there is peace. Doesn't someone say that? Well, you get there. If you can stand the clamour of the voices for a while, you emerge into a kind of still place where they blend into one. Then you find they're all trying to say the same thing, which is also the thing you're trying to say yourself. As he sat back in his chair, twisting his wiry moustache with a handsome, sunburnt hand, Thor felt that he had him where he had been hoping to get him. But what? "'Do we want to say, Uncle Sim? 
"'What do you want to say? And what do I?' The old man held his sharp-pointed beard by the tip, eyeing his nephew obliquely. "'That's the great secret, Thor. All like little babies, from the time they begin to hear language, are bursting with the desire to say something. And if they don't know what it is till they learn to speak, then it comes to them.' "'Yes, but what comes to them?' Is it what comes to all babies, the instinct to say, Abba, father? Say, Lois, cousin Amy Dawes requested in her loud, commanding voice, just save me a mite of this cold duck for old Sally Gibbs. It'll be tasty for the poor soul. I'll take it to her as we go up the hill. What do you pay your cook? Without waiting for an answer, she continued like an oracle. I don't believe she's worth it. Thor leaned across the table. What I want to know is this. Suppose the instinct to say, Abba, Father, does come to us. Is there anything there to respond that will show us a better way, personally and nationally, I mean, than the rather poor one we are finding for ourselves? Can't give you any guarantees, Thor, if that's what you're after. Just got to say, Abba, Father, and see for yourself. Nothing but seeing for oneself is any good when it comes to the personal. Oh, and as for the national, well, there was a man once who went stalking up the land, crying, O Israel, turn thee to the Lord thy God. And I guess he knew what he was about. It was, turn ye, turn ye, why will ye die? They didn't turn, and so they died. Inevitable consequence. Same with this people or any other people. In proportion as it turns to the Lord, its God, it'll live. And in proportion as it doesn't, it'll go to pot. He veered around to Lois as to one who would agree with him. Ain't that it? She responded with a sweet, absent smile, which showed to Thor, at least, that her thoughts were elsewhere. As a matter of fact, Thor's questions and Uncle Sim's replies, which continued in more or less the same strain, lay in a realm with regard to which she had few misgivings or anxieties. Her heart-searchings being of another nature, she was doing in thought what she had done when in the afternoon she had gone to her room and shut the door. She was standing before her mirror, contrasting the image reflected there with rosy Fay's worn, touching prettiness. How awesome, how incredible, that Thor, her great noble Thor, should have let his heart go, perhaps the very best of his heart, to anything so insignificant, so unformed, so unequal to himself. It was this awesomeness, this incredibility, that overwhelmed her. Her mind fixed itself on it for the time being, to the exclusion of other considerations. Thor was like meaner men. He could be caught by a pretty face. He was so big in body and soul that she had thought him free from petty failing. And yet here it was. For there was a kind of shame in it. It weakened him. It lowered him. She had seen it from the minute when he began to tell his halting tale about Claude. It was pitiful the way in which he had betrayed himself. From Fay she got no more than a hint, a hint she'd been quick to collate with her knowledge of some secret grief on Thor's part. But she hadn't been really sure of the truth till she saw he was trying to hide it. That Thor should be trying to hide anything made her burn inwardly with something more poignant than humiliation. She had smiled when he looked so imploringly toward her, but she hardly knew why. Perhaps it was to encourage him, to give him heart. For the first time in her life she felt the stronger, the superior. She was sorry for him, even though there was something about this new and unexpected phase in him that she despised. She got no further than that when the guests came and she had to give them her attention. When they left, and Thor was seeing them to the door, she took the opportunity to slip up to her room again. She locked the door behind her, and locked the door that communicated with his dressing-room. Once more she took her stand before the pier-glass. Something had come to her. She was sure of it. It had come almost since the afternoon. If it was not beauty, it rendered beauty of no importance. It was a spirit, a fire, that made her a woman who could be proud, a woman a man might be proud of. She had come to her own at last. She could see for herself that there was a subdued splendour about her which raised her in the scale of personality. She had little vanity. Hitherto she had had little pride. But she knew now, with an assurance which it would have been hypocritical to disguise, 
that she was the true mate of the man she had taken Thor to be. She had known it before, diffidently and apologetically. She knew it now calmly and as a matter of course, in a manner that did away with any necessity for shrinking or self-deprecation. She moved away from the mirror, taking off the string of small pearls she wore and throwing them on the dressing-table. In the middle of the room she stood with a feeling of helplessness. It was so difficult to see what she ought to do. What was one's duty toward a husband who had practically told her that he had married her only because he couldn't marry a woman he loved better? Other questions began to rise within her, questions and protests and flashes of indignation. But she beat them back, standing in an attitude of reflection and trying to discern the first steps of her way. She knew that the emotions she was keeping under would assert themselves in time, but just now she wanted only to see what she ought to do during the next half hour. There came into her mind what Uncle Sim had said at supper. "'Just got to say, Abba, Father, and see.' She shook her head. She couldn't say, Abba, Father, at present. She didn't know why, but she couldn't. Whatever the passion within her, it was nothing she could bring before a throne of grace. It crossed her mind that if she prayed at all that night, she would pass this whole matter over. And in that case, why pray at all? And yet the thought of omitting her prayers disturbed her. If she did it to-night, why not to-morrow night? And if to-morrow night, where would it end? It was not a convincing argument, but it drew her toward her bedside. Even then she didn't kneel down, but clung to one of the tall, fluted posts that supported a canopy. She couldn't pray. She didn't know what to pray for. Conventional petitions would have had no meaning, and for the moment she had no others to offer up. It was but half-consciously that she found herself stammering, "'Abba, father! Abba, father!' her lips moving dumbly to the syllables. It brought her no relief. It gave her neither immediate light on her way, nor any new sense of power. She was as dazed as ever, and as an indignant. And yet, when she raised herself from the weary clinging to the fluted posts, she went to both the doors she had locked, and unlocked them. End of chapter 23「twenty four of the Side of the Angels by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter twenty four. The consciousness of something to be suppressed was with Lois when she woke. Not yet, not yet, was the warning of her subliminal self whenever resentments and indignations endeavoured to escape control. With Thor she kept to subjects that had no personal bearing clearly to his relief. At breakfast they talked of the Mexican rising under Madero, which was discussed in the papers of that morning. She knew that the question in his mind was, does she really know? But she betrayed nothing that would help him to an answer. When, after having kissed her with a timid, apologetic affection which partly touched and partly angered her, he left for the office, she put on a hat and, taking a parasol, went to see Dr. Hillary. The first parish church, the oldest in the village, stands in a grass delta where two of the rambling village lanes enter the square. The white, barn-like nave, with its upper and lower rows of small oblong windows, retires discreetly within a grove of elms, while a tall, slim spire grows slimmer through diminishing tiers of arches, balconies and lancet lights till it dwindles away into a high, graceful pinnacle. Behind the church, in the widest section of the delta, the parsonage, a white wooden box dating from the fifties, supporting a smaller box by way of cupola, looks across garden, shrubbery and lawn to schoolhouse lane, from which nothing but the simplest form of wooden rail protects the enclosure. It was the time for bulbs to be in flower, and of the spring perennials. Tulips, in a wide, dense mass, bordered the brick pavement that led from the gate to the front door. Elsewhere could be seen daffodils, irises, peonies just bursting into bloom, and long, drooping curves of bleeding heart hung with rose and white pendants. By a corner of the house the ground was indigo-dark with a thick little patch of squills. 
it was a relief to Lois to find the old man himself, bareheaded and in an alpaca house jacket, rooting out weeds on the lawn, his thin grey locks tossed in the breeze. On seeing her pause and look over the clump of Wigilia, which at this point smothered the rail, he raised himself, dusted the earth from his hands, and went forward. They talked at first just as they stood, with the budding shrubs between them. "'Oh, Dr. Hilary, I'm so anxious about Rosie Fay.' "'Are you now?' As neither age nor gravity could subdue the twinkle in his eyes, so sympathy couldn't quench it. "'Well, I am myself.' "'I think if I could see her I might be able to help her. "'Or rather,' she went on nervously, "'I think I ought to see her, whether I can help her or not. "'Have you seen her?' "'I have not,' he declared with Irish emphasis. "'The puss takes very good care that I shan't, so she does. "'She's only got to, to see me coming in the gates to fly off to Duck Rock, "'and that, so her mother tells me, is all they see of her till nightfall. "'It's three days now that she's been struck with a fit of melancholy, or maybe four. "'Do you know what the trouble is?' he evaded the question. "'Do you?' Um, I do, partly. Then you'll be the one to tackle her. As yet I haven't asked. I prefer to know no more about people than what they tell me themselves. She found it possible to secure his aid on the unexplained ground that there had been a misunderstanding between her husband and herself on the one side, and Jasper Fay on the other. I don't know that I can help her. I dare say I can't. But if I could only see her... Well, then, you shall see her. "'Just wait a minute while I change my coat, and I'll go along with you.' "'On the way up the hill, Lois questioned him about the Fays. "'Did you know much of the boy?' "'Enough to see that he wasn't a thief. Not by nature, that is. "'He's what might have been expected from his parents, "'the start of out of which they make revolutionists and anarchists. "'He came into the world with desires thwarted, as you might say, "'and a determination to get even. "'He didn't steal. He took money.' He took money because they needed it at home, and other people had it. He took it more in protest than in greed, if that's any excuse for him. The mother is better, isn't she? She's clothed and in her right mind, if she'll only stay that way. She gets into one of her old tantrums every now and then, but I'm in hopes that the daughter's trouble will end them. This hope seemed to be partially fulfilled in the welcoming way in which the door was opened to their knock. "'I brought you my friend, a Mrs. Thor Masterman,' was the old gentleman's form of introduction. "'She wants to see Rosie. If Fay makes any trouble, tell him it's my wish.' "'I'm really only come to see Rosie, Mrs. Fay,' Lois explained, not without nervousness, when the two women were alone on the doorstep. "'No, I won't go in, thank you. Not if she's anywhere about the place. I'm really very anxious to have a talk with her.' Having feared a hostile reception, she was relieved to be answered with a certain fierce cordiality. "'I'm sure I hope you get it. It's more than her father and I can do.' "'Perhaps she'd talk to me. Girls often will talk to a, to a stranger when they won't to one of their own. "'Well, you can try.' In spite of the coldness of the handsome features, something in the nature of a new life, a new softening humanity, was struggling to assert itself. "'We can't get a word out of her.' She'll either speak, nor sleep, nor eat, nor do a hand's turn. It's the work that bothers me most. Not so much that it needs to be done, as it because it would be a relief to her. She added, with a shy wistfulness that contrasted oddly with the hard glint in her eyes. I find that out myself. Have you any idea where she is? She pointed toward Duck Rock. Oh, I suppose she's over there. She was to have picked the cucumber this morning, but I see she hasn't done it. "'Has Mr. Fay told you what the trouble is?' "'Well, he has, but then he's so romantic. Always was. Land's sake. I don't pay any attention to young people's goings-on. Seen too much of it in my own day. I don't say that the young fellow hasn't been foolish, and I don't say, you'll excuse me, that Rosie ain't just as good as he is, even if he is Archie Masterman's son. Oh, 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 no, nor I,' Lois hastened to interpose. "'But there's nothing wrong. I've asked her, and I know, I'm sure of it.' Lois spoke eagerly. "'Oh, yes, so am I. "'So that there's that,' she went on with a touch of her old haughtiness of spirit. "'And she's every mite as good as he is. "'It's all nonsense face talking as if it was some young lord who's jilted a girl beneath him. "'Young lord, indeed. I'll young lord him if he ever comes my way. 
I tell Rosie not to demean herself to grieve for them that are no better than herself. It's nothing but romantics, she explained further. I've no patience with Fay talking as if someone ought to shoot someone or commit murder. That's the way Matt began. Fay ought to know better at his time of life. I declare he has no more sense than Rosie. Lois had not expected to be called upon to defend Fay, but he said, I suppose he naturally feels indignant when he sees... There's a desperate streak in Fay, the woman broke in uneasily, and Rosie takes after him. For the matter of that, she takes after us both, for I'm sure I've been gloomy enough. There's been something lacking in us all, like cooking without salt. I see that now as plain as plain, though I can't get Fay to believe me. You might as well talk to a stone wall as talk to Fay when he's got his nose stuck into a book. I hate the very name of that Carlyle, and that Darwin, he's another. They're his Bible, I tell him, and he don't half understand what they mean. It's duck rock, she went on, with a quiver of her fine lips, while her hands worked nervously at the corner of her apron. It's duck rock that I'm most afraid of. It's kind of haunted me all the time I was sick, and it kind of haunts Rosie. Then I'll go and see if she's there, Lois said, as she turned away, leaving the austere figure to stare after her, with eyes that might have been those of the woman delivered from the seven devils. It was an easy matter for Lois to find her way among the old apple trees, of which one was showing an early blossom or two on the sunny side, to the boulevard below, and thence to the wood running up the bluff. Though she had not been here since the berry-picking days of childhood, she knew the spot in which Rosie was likely to be found. As a matter of fact, having climbed the path that ran beneath oaks and through patches of brakes, spleenwort and lady ferns, she was astonished to hear a faint plaintive singing, and stopped to listen. The voice was poignantly thin and sweet, with a frail, melancholy sound she had heard from distant shepherd's pipes in Switzerland. Had she not, after a few seconds, recognised the air, she would have been unable to detect the words. Ah, dinner ye mine, Lord Gregory, by bonny Irvinside, where first I owned the virgin love I long, long had denied. Though the singer was invisible, Lois knew she could not be far away, since the voice was too weak to carry. She was about to go forward when the faint melody began again. An exile from my father's heir, an hour for loving thee, at least be pity to me shown, if love it may nay be. Placing the voice now as near the great oak tree circled by a seat, just below the point where the ascending bluff broke fifty feet to the pond beneath, Lois went rapidly up the last few yards of the ascent. Rosie was seated with her back to the gnarled trunk, while she looked out over the half-mile of dancing blue wavelets to where, on the other side, the brown wooden houses of the Thorley estate swept down to the shore. She rose on seeing the visitor approach, showing a startled disposition to run away. This she might have done had not Lois caught her by the hand and detained her. "'I know all about everything, Rosie, about everything.' She meant that she understood the situation, not only as regard one brother, but as regarding both. Rose's response was without interest or curiosity. Do you? Yes, Rosie, and I want to talk to you about it. Let us sit down. Still holding the girl's hands in a manner that compelled her to reseat herself, she examined the little face for the charm that had thrown such a spell on Thor. With a pang, she owned to herself that she found it. No one could look at Thor with that expression of entreaty, without reaching all that was most tender in his soul. For the moment, however, that point must be allowed to pass. Not yet, not yet, something cried to the passion that was trying to get control of her. She went on earnestly, almost beseechingly. I know just what happened, Rosie dear, and how hard it's been for you, and I want you to let me help you. There was no light in Rosie's chrysoprase coloured eyes. Her voice was listless. "'What can you do?' Put to her in that point-blank way, Lois found the question difficult. She could only answer, "'I can be with you, Rosie. We can be side by side.' "'There wouldn't be any good in that. I'd rather be left alone.' "'Oh, but there would be good. We should strengthen each other. I, I need help, too. I, I should find it partly if I could do anything for you.' Rosie surveyed her friend, not coldly, but with dull detachment. Do you think Claude will come back to me? What do you think yourself? 
I don't think he will. She added with a catch in her breath like that produced by a sudden darting pain. I know he won't. Would you be happy with him if he did? I shouldn't care whether I was happy or not, if he'd come. Lois thought it the part of wisdom to hold out no hope. Then, since we believe he won't come, isn't it better to face it with... I don't see any use in facing it. You might as well ask a plant to face it when it's pulled up by the roots and thrown out into the sun. There's nothing left to face. But you're not pulled up by the roots, Rosie. Your roots are still in the soil. You've people who need you. Rosie made a little gesture with palms outward. I've given them all I had. I'm, I'm empty. Yes, you feel so now. That's natural. We do feel empty of anything more to give when there's been a great drain on us. But somehow it's the people who've given most who always have the power to go on giving, after a little while. With time, the girl interrupted, not impatiently but with vacant indifference. What's the good of time when it's going to be always the same? The good of time is that it brings comfort. I don't want comfort. I'd rather be as I am. That's perfectly natural, for now. But time passes, whether we will or no. And whether we will or no, it softens. Time can't pass if you won't let it. Why, why, what do you mean? I mean just that. Lois clasped the girl's hands desperately. But, Rosie, you must live. Life has a great deal in store for you still, perhaps a great deal of happiness. They say that life never takes anything from us for which it isn't prepared to give us compensation, if we'll only accept it in the right way. Rosie shook her head. I don't want it. Lois tried to reach the dulled spirit by another channel. But we all have disappointments and sorrows, Rosie. I have mine, I've great ones. The aloofness in Rosie's gaze seemed to put miles between them. That doesn't make any difference to me. If you want to be sorry for them, I'm not. I can't be sorry for anyone. In her desire to touch the frozen springs of the girl's emotions, Lois said what she would have supposed herself incapable of saying. Not when you know what they are, when you know what one of them is, at any rate, when you know what one of them must be. You're the only person in the world except myself who can know. Rosie's voice was as lifeless as before. I can't be sorry. I don't know why, but I can't be. Do you mean that you're glad I have to suffer? No, no, I'm not glad, especially. I just don't care. Lois was baffled. The impenetrable iciness was more difficult to deal with than active grief. She made her supreme appeal. And then, Rosie, then there's... there's God. Rosie looked vaguely over the lake and said nothing. If she fixed her eyes on anything, it was on the quivering balance of a kingfisher in the air. When, with a flash of silver and blue, he swooped, and, without seeming to have touched the water went skimming away with a fish in his bill. Her eyes wandered slowly back in her companion's direction. Lois made another attempt. You believe in God, don't you? There was a second's hesitation. I don't know as I do. The older woman spoke with the pleading of distress. But there is a God, Rosie. There was the same brief hesitation. I don't care whether there is or not. Though Lewis could get no further, it hurt her to see the look of relief in the little creature's face when she rose and said, "'You'd rather I go away, wouldn't you? "'Then I will go, but it won't be for long. "'I'm not going to leave you to yourself. "'I'm coming back soon. "'I shall come back again today. "'If you're not at home, I'll follow you up here.' She waited for some sign of protest, but Rosie sat silent and impassive. Though courtesy kept her dumb, it couldn't conceal the air of resigned impatience with which she awaited her visitor's departure. Lois looked down at her helplessly. In sheer incapacity to affect the larger issues, she took refuge in the smaller. Isn't it near your dinner time? I'm going your way. We could go along together. I don't want any dinner. I'll go home by and by. Lois felt herself dismissed. Very well, Rosie. 
I'll say good-bye for now, but it will only be for a little while. You understand that, don't you? I'm not going to let you throw me off. I'm going to cling to you. I've got the right to do it, because, because the very thing that makes you unhappy makes me. In the eyes that Rosie lifted obliquely, Lois read such unutterable things that she turned away. She carried that look with her as she went down the hill, beneath the oaks, and between the sunlit patches of brakes, spleenwort and lady ferns. What scenes, what memories had called it up? What part in those scenes and memories had been played by Thor? What had been the actual experience between this girl and him? Would she ever know? Had she better know? What should she do if she were to know? Once more, the questions she had been trying to repress urged themselves for answer. But once more she controlled herself through the counsel of the inner voice. Not yet. Not yet. End of chapter 24